It is a good morning. It is a good morning. Hope you're all doing well. Well, we finally made it here. It's November 11th, 2023. The scheduled departure of the Inner Circle Trader from social media. If you could be so kind as to let me know. I'm checking Twitter right now. If you guys can hear me, just give me a five by five. I'm using my Bose headset so that way I can talk with my hands today. <laughs> Thank you, Lawrence. Just looking for a few more just to make sure everything has to be good on this one because this is my last one. Under 2K. No, I'm th uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Hank. El Gordo, thank you. All right, so. So you want to be a Forex trader. So you want to be a futures trader. What every new and aspiring Forex trader wants to know. In 2010, that's how I started this. For some of you, that's the genesis of Inner Circle Trader, but it actually was in the mid-90s. I had a presence on America Online, and many of you heard that story. And I, I thought many times over the coming months how I might reflect on how I would have done this last Twitter space and how I would have done it differently, or if I would have just said this, or maybe said less of that. And I, I guess it's really one of those things where it needs to just come full circle. So while many of you know me as a Forex guru, or if you have a lot of glass awards, you call me a furu, <laughs> so, <laughs> the, uh, the idea of sharing and the, the enjoyment I've had doing all this has, has been, for lack of better terms, just a wonderful experience. Initially, it started with a social experiment to see if I could create another one of me. And while I have wonderfully profitable students, um, none of them actually had the same thing happen that I was trying to, you know, kind of like recreate. So, At this chapter of Inner Circle Trader, on social media that is, um, I, I just wanted to sit down with you for a little while, and I'm going to be doing this up till 10 o'clock, and then I'm going to close it. So there is no long one today. I, I pretty much said everything anyway, but I wanted to sit down and encourage you. I want to kind of like reflect on what it is that you have in your hands now, and how you should Respect it, how you should trust it and lean on it. Even in my absence, you have everything that you need. You don't need to subscribe to anything. You don't need to pay for anything. It's all in your hands right now. The problem with it is some of you are going to be extremely depressed because maybe this Twitter account has been a source of inspiration for you or a motivation for you. And... For the ones that have been with me longer or have developed faster, not that that's always a good thing, but some of you absolutely have done very well in terms of growing in leaps and bounds you know, faster than some of my other students. That doesn't mean that if you haven't arrived yet at your understanding that you won't ever get there. It just means that they did something more than you did and your life circumstances probably dictated that you couldn't do as much as they did. And that's not a knock against your aptitude. It's not a knock against your will or passion to do it. It just means that life sometimes gets in the way. So if, if I can leave you today with you know, a measure of encouragement, it's this, that everything that you would have been looking for as a trader, no matter how much time you spent seeking things, indicators, systems, courses, 
you know, gurus, teachers, mentors, whatnot. I have given you everything that cuts through all of the fat and takes you right down to the bone. What holds it all together? You, know, you, you can have a lot of muscle. You, know, you can have a lot of strength in something. But if you don't have a good skeletal system, a framework, you can't do anything. You know, imagine that icon, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger. He was huge, right? It, what happens if he didn't have a skeleton, right? It would be useless to him. It's a big pile of muscle, right? Useless. So what I've done is, over the years, I've placed in your hands a, a language. So that way you can see the marketplace from a framework stance. And then I've given you pieces, little cogs, that work very, very well in the grand scheme of things. And by placing these small cogs, like specific PD arrays and very specific, straightforward, easy models, optimal trade entry, 2022 model, silver bullet, um, those things are very generic principles that can be treated just as they were taught to you. And you don't need to inflate them with other things. You don't have to add additional filters. You don't have to do anything to make it complicated. But for some of you, you want to go really deep. You want to go as deep as the rabbit hole will take you. And I appreciate that. That's how I am. I'm, I'm the, of the same mindset. I'm not satisfied with just knowing. And I have to be careful speaking like this because for th some of you that don't have this perspective or have this incentive behind your study, I'm trying not to inspire that because if it's really not in your makeup as a person, then it's really not there and it's not necessary. Like you don't have to know everything. You don't have to know the daily high and the low. You don't have to know what the weekly high and low is going to be. You can trade in the middle and get a lot out of that. So there's going to be a lot of fever and rush to try to be the next big thing. And my hope is that for the folks that have found progress, don't quickly abandon what you have put work into. If I can go back in time and talk to myself as a younger man at 20, the first thing I would tell myself is you're going to try to do too many things. They're going to waste your time. You're going to try to work on things and figure out things that aren't essential. They're not required to be consistently profitable. They're not going to help you, actually. They're going to actually become a hindrance and a distraction. And they're going to be puzzles for you to try to figure out versus trying to figure out the problems that you have as the man. The person that is the trader, that is largely the issue. And I've mentioned this many times over the course of Twitter spaces and even in the, the dry parts of my videos that people generally complain about. But they're the brass tacks. They're the things that really make you or break you. And it's hard to communicate that to someone that's brand new because it doesn't feel like those things are pertinent to you when they are paramount to your proper development. If you look at the number of years I spent with you, it's about equivalent to what it took for me to get it all figured out and get myself out of my own way. Everything was scheduled. Everything was planned. Nothing was random. I've taken you through the exact process. Do you remember how fever pitched I was to always be tweeting, 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 tweeting? That was me in a characteristic form of how it was as a 20-year-old, trying to do everything, buy every book that I could get my hands on, deliver pizzas in addition to my job on the one day that I had off, just to get more money to go down to Trader's Library down in Columbia, Maryland, to waste more money. Because those books, the only thing they did was kept me hooked on the potential of figuring out the right guy or gal out there that's going to teach me the secrets to how these markets work. And I can promise you this, over 2,000 plus books, not one of them were able to do it. 
Not one of them were able to do that for me. Now, for some of you, you probably have heroes in your back pocket that you like to champion, and that's wonderful. You know, I hold Larry Williams in high regard because he was the first person that had a great impact on me and helped me focus on things, whereas I didn't have a structure. Like, I was just coming from Ken Roberts' garbage, right? And it helped me think about things in a more structured manner, how to work from determining whether a market's really in a position to be traded or not. And you think about it for a second. How often have you looked at a marketplace, and it might be your very favorite market, if you're a Forex trader, it might be your favorite Forex pair, or your futures market, or your commodity, or your cryptocurrency. And it's moved into a consolidation for a prolonged period of time. And you just don't have the patience to hold on to it. To sit on the sidelines, that is, and have patience, holding on to patience, waiting for a viable setup. So you go in and you start doing things recklessly because, you know, you're looking at this stuff. So therefore, you you don't want to be wasting your time. You might get something out of it. Even if you made 100 bucks, it's, it's worth your time being in front of the charts, right? And I did a lot of those things when I was younger. And Larry Williams was the first one to help inspire me to focus on a market that was more prone to trade in a manner that would be advantageous. Okay, you don't want to be in a range bound market. Now, I have since learned, obviously, and you've learned as well from me, the, the ideas of trading inside of a small ranging market. It's possible. You don't need a lot. I taught you how you can take five handles out of the index futures and carve out an entire career on that and never need to move beyond that. You don't need to be a 20 R trader, a 50 R trader, a 200 R trader that never really does it. <laughs> Instagram. <laughs> So being content with enough is important. And I guess in a lot of ways you can look at you know, what I've shared on my YouTube channel is probably in by many definitions overkill. And because it's a lot of videos and it's, it's basically a daunting task for someone that's highly critical, they're going, oh, he's overcomplicating it. There's no overcomplication. It's me teaching in great detail why something's going to repeat. Now, I don't have the faith in something because I see it work a few times and not really understand the mechanics behind it. I have to I have to understand what it is that makes this thing work. Now, I, I'm not a mechanic. Okay, I'm not very handy with my hands, but I understand how cars work. I understand a combustion engine. I know the technological, uh, technological advances that we've had and the things that we used to have, like carburetors and things like that. They've evolved. Now, because I understand how they work, doesn't mean I can repair them or fix them. But I had to satisfy that internal desire to know what it is. And as a child, everything that I ever had, I took apart. Now, sometimes I couldn't put them back together, but I had to know what was inside. Like, what's inside of this thing? What makes it move and what makes it tick? And I've always been inquisitive. And I think that the Lord gave me that and coupled with what everybody else would say is a mental illness and a, uh, an impediment. But obsessively compulsiveness you know, allowed me to fuel that insatiable desire to keep digging in to understanding what makes these candlesticks. And back then it was open, high, low and closed bars perform a specific manner in a manner that repeats in a manner that can be exploited and also to reveal Something that's always been there underneath your nose and everyone else's nose, but we've been hearing for decades and as long as the market's been around that price is random, price is unknowable. No one can be consistently accurate in predicting or timing the marketplace. And obviously, the you know, majority of you now are part of the you know, League of Extraordinary Gentlemen and Gentle Ladies. Because you can do the same thing now. You're able to time the market in lower time frames that defy all logic, even from the Goldman Sachs boys. Doesn't it feel good? Doesn't it feel good to be a part of this? To have learned something that even the big shots that go on CNBC, they, t they try to tell you this stuff, but you can't time the market. You can't outperform the S&P. Are you 
freaking crazy. Seriously? What's the average return on the S&P annually? It's trash. <laughs> I'm making trades with 20% per trade. So how long do I have to prove that any one of us, or anyone that's willing to sit down and learn this, pyramid with proper risk management, using a real stop loss, I don't need to sit there and work all year long to make a industry standard high mark, high watermark return. Dude, that's just like that's a that's a morning scalp. Like that's not something that you know we're sweating that. We're not sweating that. Now, <laughs> in their defense, obviously, you know they're they're speaking from a position where they're many times you know, controlling millions of dollars, maybe even a billion dollars, and you just can't move a lot of that type of size on very small little fluctuations. And I grant I, I, I grant them that, okay. But when they themselves like to spit in our direction and say that there really isn't any edge there. When there is no sharper edge in this industry than the one that we're wielding, every day, it's there. The precision is there, it's undeniable. You've seen copious examples of beginning to end executions, both in demo for the longest of time, and this year you saw it with real money. You cannot deny that. Now. For some of you, that still isn't enough because you can't do it right now. And I want to encourage you, even though I'm stepping away from social media, don't abandon your progress. What do I mean by that? Well, what's going to happen, and this is exactly what's going to happen, there's going to be people that have studied what I've taught, and they themselves are going to be the ones that rebrand it, like we've watched many times over the course of the last 12 years or so. 13 years now since I came out on Baby Pips and started teaching things that nobody else was teaching. And that $5 million bounty is still there. Not one person came forward with proof or evidence that any of the things that I've presented to the community is rebranded of anything. Because if it was, somebody else would be out there doing that stuff just like you see me executing. And what do you see as a common denominator when anybody sees my examples? This has to be delayed data. That's, that's their only excuse. It has to be delayed data. Or it's demo. And then when it's a live account, well, it's an AMP demo account. But when they look at how AMP goes on to TradingView with a demo, which I didn't even know they had, you can see it clearly is nothing says AMP live there. It's some kind of series of letters and numbers and you know, gobbledygook. So... We've canceled every argument. We've literally laid to waste every reason why you shouldn't at least do your own investigation on the concepts. I've always openly challenged all of you, and I'm so proud of you that have done it because you've you pushed through all the noise and the chaff and the distractions because many of them are, are marketers, and I get it, man. I get it. You can't trade well. You're... you're, you're Profitability as a trader is not there yet, but you have something that you're marketing, and you want to make money. You have an entrepreneurial spirit. I get, I get that. I understand that. But at some point, folks like you are going to have to prove that you can do what you're claiming and not talk about someone else to try to rise to the occasion. And I don't want any of you to become – so good at this that you become toxic and arrogant. For most part, that's what you think I am. And I want to tip my hand to you in time to kind of show you really what this is all about. Because I was never going to do any kind of marketing, I didn't want to do any kind of uh, investment into Facebook because I think Facebook is a joke. Um, I didn't want to invest in advertising on any other platforms, and they'll go without being named. I needed to create a stir. Pardon me if you hear me drinking my cocoa, but it's, we had our first frost, and this is like a, an annual thing for me. So if you hear me slightly slurp it, just pardon me, okay? 
But I wanted to create a measure of interest. And when you go to a rodeo, okay, when you go to a rodeo or you go to a circus, what do you remember most? The clowns. As much as you probably don't like clowns, because that's a real thing. I came out on Baby Pips and presented myself just as that. I completely disarmed everybody. What are they going to say about me? I'm going to teach you through a demo. There's nothing they can argue about. But I wanted to show that I could do something wearing a mask that nobody else would be able to replicate. And I would over-deliver an education that would lead to something that was useful and profitable. Imagine that as a marketing strategy. No one else would have done it. But look how sticky I was. Highest numbered views on threads over there on Baby Pip still today. And I don't have any content in there. What I think you don't realize is, is when I was a young boy, uh, I was fascinated with magic. You know, sleight of hand, card tricks, you know, coin tricks and things like that. And David Copperfield was a huge inspiration to me, and I can't wait until February because he's supposed to be making the moon disappear, which is going to be equivalent to what he did with the Statue of Liberty, I'm sure. <laughs> it's just perception. But that first moment of watching his annual magic pre uh, presentation on uh, CBS was like a, a, a huge milestone each year for me because I wanted to be like him. Like I wanted to be up there and dazzle the people that would watch him. Because when he would do something, that line between reality and, wow, what is going on here? Like this is something that shouldn't be possible. I loved that moment, that moment of astonishment. And over the years, I you know, invested money in, in learning and, and time in studying you know, that craft of, of magic. And I got really good at it. And then one of the guys I learned from, his name is Paul Harris. Now, if you looked at this guy, you would not be impressed with him at all. He doesn't have any kind of uh, you know, features that would say, wow, he's charming, or that he is really just an average-looking guy, okay? slightly balding, a poorly maintained mustache, and just nothing to really look at, but sharp as a tack. And his style, I kind of took that as a guru online. And what do I mean by that? His strategy was many times to entertain himself, really. And if you, you could probably find his interview, maybe, maybe not. I'm, I, if I can find it, I'll, I'll share a link on Twitter before I go. But um, for some of you, this is probably means nothing to you. But I want you to understand who I am, where all this stuff came from, what created this personality that I presented to all of you, and the building block that created it, because it's not me copying somebody else's trading style. It's me as a young boy growing up and having all of my influences become a part of what you're seeing. Like, you remember the uh, 80s cartoon Voltron? Loved it. I, I loved it. Before school, I'd watch it. And you had these, these tigers that would come together, and it would you know, make this Megazord, right? And there he is. Boom. Well, all of these people, like Paul Harris, Jeff McBride, Larry Williams... Um, martial arts instructors, you know, all these influences over the course of my life all had little parts and roles to play to be who I am. And the, the arrogance aspect that many of you don't like about me, uh, that's really not me. And I've, I've told you very candidly when I was younger that was a genuine thing about me because I was new money, and new money just acts like new money. <laughs> And it's an ugly thing. But I got humbled. And it might not sound like I'm humbled, but I use this as a means of engaging the audience. And what did Paul Harris do as a magician? He would win the crowd over with his talent and his cordialness, his, his politeness. And then he would flip it up and become this jerk, this, this person that 
really nobody would want to listen to. And then he would try to win them back over. As much as that may sound like, what, why would you want to do that? It made sense to me. That made sense to me. Because who do you really want to be paying attention to? You want to see the guy that was taunting everybody to get knocked out. You ever see that, that MMA video? The fighter, he's out there, he's, you know, he's doing all these you know, breakdancing moves, and all of a sudden, boom, Sleepville. Well, that, that's what everybody wants to see. So if I'm not going to market myself and pay for advertising, and I already hook the people that already see value in what I'm teaching, how do I get the rest of the people? i got to create some kind of stickiness. So I'm going to be that arrogant clown that represents himself with a demo because everybody wants to see that guy get wrecked. So they'll talk, and they'll talk, and they'll talk to their friends, and they say, go look at this guy here, look at this. Yeah, wonderful. And they all advertised for me for free. You all worked for me for, me, for free doing all those things. You allowed all these well-rounded students that I have now to find me, and I never had to put a dime behind any of it. Everything was scheduled. The real me, the real me, that's who's talking to you right now. I have gone through the ringer through these markets and life with a woman that was really not wanting to be with me but wanted the money I had. And I had to do a lot of things to hide from her and her ex-husband now. And it's unfortunate, but you know I own that. It's, it's something I, I made the mistake of doing something as a young man. And I own it. But some of you want to have this, this position of notoriety. And you want it to fill a void. You want it to fill some kind of vacuum space that your own life can't fill. And you're thinking that if you become popular in trading or if you start teaching, or if you're giving out signals and such. And I hope all of you are successful at it. I genuinely, absolutely, wholeheartedly want all of you, even the people that take shots at me, you know, trolls and whatnot, I want all of you to succeed. I've had a lot of fun being an inner circle trader. I've had so much fun. And some of you have taken it personal, but I've never meant anything personal. It's always been shop talk. That's all it is. I can take a good ribbing. Look at how I go back and forth with Patrick Whelan. I don't see him as a threat, and I know he doesn't see me as a threat. But it's all online banter. It's fun. But I hope that the skill set that you acquired from me and learning how to do this doesn't turn you into what I was as a 20-year-old, which was an arrogant so-and-so. And there was days where I didn't even have the ability to tolerate myself. I would say or think certain things and think to myself, wow, <laughs> that's horrible. You know, where'd that come from? Well, I, I know now where it came from, but you know, I, I try to keep myself from that kind of stuff as much as I can. And I, in, admittedly, when I'm on social media, especially Twitter, um, I have a tendency to want to revert back to how I was as a 20-year-old, which is, in my opinion, going backwards. You know, it's devolving. You know, I don't, I don't, I don't want to go backwards. And while I can have fun in a, you know, a playful manner with certain individuals, it, sometimes context is lost. Sometimes uh, sarcasm is lost in the in the delivery of a of a tweet or something I may have said in a tongue in cheek remark. And sometimes language is an issue. Because some of you may not understand a obvious glaring sarcasm that would be understood from the United States perspective. And then for someone of foreign persuasion may hear me say something and there's a disconnect or it may come across as arrogance when really arrogance wasn't even the, the delivery at the time. But th that whole side of me was instrumented and originated from Paul Harris, who was a magician that really didn't become a big thing, but a lot of his effects and, and, and slights and stuff that I learned, uh, his style made sense to me because what was I? You know, I was a young man and I wanted to be able to fool the guys that were acting like they were the ones that should be paid the most attention to in the room. 
So you remember the discussion I had uh, a couple years ago? I said that uh, you want to see who in the room is the loudest, and you want to be the one they don't see coming. I always sit in the room with the corner behind me because I want to have the lay of the land. I want to see who's out there. Who are the, who's the one that's going to probably be a problem for me tonight if there's going to be alcohol in the room? I want to size them up, find their weaknesses, see what they think their strengths are, and it, who's their friends in the room. I've lived my life that way. I, mean, I grew up in a neighborhood that, you know, I couldn't run. I didn't have the stamina to run, so I had to learn how to fight. So my mindset has always been I have to be prepared for anything that's adversarial. And that's why my perspective on the marketplace is always that of like war or an action movie, something to that effect. And it also serves a very good purpose for the young men because that's how they think too. Rambo, Chuck Norris, you know, um, you name it, you know, whoever you want to put in that, that action film role. So it, it kind of allows that human mind to be blurring the line of, okay, yeah, I'm learning something very, very dry, very, very technical, very, very boring in the beginning. But if it can be laced with, hey, you, you do this, you're going to be a Chuck Norris. You're going to be you know, a Bruce Lee. You know, gonna, you're going to be some kind of commando G.I. Joe that can pull off something nobody else can do. And young men, like I was, you know, we let our minds drift to those things. And women, it's always been a hard sell for them. And that's why in the beginning, I didn't have a whole lot of women that were students. The one that comes to mind is Oki Dame. I'm not even sure if she's still around or not. But uh, she was on Baby Pips. You know, it's one of my core students in the beginning. But I don't, I'm not sure what she's even doing anymore today, if she's even trading. If you're listening, I hope you're well. But um, yeah, I'm talking about online, online students, because I obviously had women as students prior to being on Baby Pips. But all these, you know, these stepping stones of becoming a, a, a human being that has been influenced by other people, not necessarily traders, not necessarily, you know, good role models. I used all of that to create this online persona as of inner circle trader, just like wrestling. You know, um, when you hear me, when you hear me rant, what you're hearing is how I used to practice when I was working out and was a larger guy, 18 years old, I wanted to be a wrestler. I mean, I have yearbooks that you can see all my friends were like, you know, don't wrestle this one. Or, you know, they all knew I, that was my aspiration. I wanted to be a wrestler. And I would practice doing shoots and promos. Like I could do, I could do verbatim just about every Macho Man Randy Savage, Hulk Hogan promo that you can pretty much get almost everything that they're saying. I'll, I'll say it just the verbatim. Just like that, down to the flicking of his sunglasses and flicking it away, <laughs> all of that. Even the one where he did the, the promo with Mean Gene Oakland where he had the, the, the creamers, the coffee creamers, the cream of the crop. I practiced that so many times when I was in high school because I knew what? Nobody cares about the wrestling. Nobody cares about that. Nobody cares about that stuff. If you've ever been to a live wrestling event, it's actually boring. But when you watch on TV, they add additional sound of the audience cheering. That's fake. And you're hearing the commentary. What's the commentary? It's to make you like. It's to influence your in interest. Oh, look at this. Because they know you, you have a team mentality. So as an influencer, I already knew that there's a lot of people out here in this industry that are getting credit for things that don't really deserve it. Because they're not doing anything. They don't even prove they can trade. They can't even show you an execution from beginning to end. Not just once. But they are the most opinionated people. So I wanted to come out and have a very polarizing, very polarizing perspective placed on me. And Tom Hugard is, uh, <laughs> he, he's been public about how, you know, you ever hear this guy, uh, Inner Circle? <laughs> he never puts the traitor at the end of it. I think it's a, it's a subliminal knock against me because he thinks I'm just a demo trader. <laughs> I, I don't think that. <laughs> I'm just being funny now. But he, he said that, uh, you know, this guy, he's, he's, very, he's very polarizing. He's like Moses. 
And I didn't take that as I'm trying to be Moses or that I'm equivalent to Moses, but he nailed it because that's exactly what I have tried to do. So that way it creates discussion. There's going to be people that have learned from me that have real tangible experience that they can say, this works in my hands. I know it works. I have proof of it. I don't need to see ICT do it, but yet ICT does it every single week. So what is that doing? It's canceling the people that's going to say, but you never see him do what? Trade with a live count? You saw that. Call the high and low of the week? You saw that. Trade the high of the day, low of the day? Uh, trade low, short, and then go long the same day? Trade without a bias, up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down, on every single turning point? Yeah. You all saw that. But that won't matter because just like when you go to watch a wrestling match, without all the fanfare around it, without the influencing and the commentary, the team aspect of being in the crowd, you're a John Cena fan. Oh, you're an Undertaker fan, you know, that type of thing. It doesn't make it fun unless you have that interaction. So I had to create this polarizing personality that many times I was shocked. At where, like, I don't, I don't have a script. Okay, unless I'm waving the paper, like when I'm talking about something that is an itinerary that I have to get through, and it was usually the very long, long, long Twitter space. But right now I have nothing. I'm talking with my hands right now if you're watching me. I was shocked at where, where this stuff comes from. And it, that wit comes from practicing being like all of the wrestlers that I looked up to as a child, even the ones that I didn't like, like Ric Flair. I couldn't stand him. I couldn't stand. He used to make me cry as a kid because he would he would pin all of my favorites by pulling their trunks and putting their leg putting his legs up on the ropes. It would make me angry, and I would leave the house with the chip on my shoulder and go talk to my friends about something. And because I'm angry about that, I would start an argument with them just because I wanted to vent. So I was thinking to myself, I'm not the only one that thinks like this. This is human nature. Like this is human nature. So if I can create this opportunity for people to talk about me and what I'm doing and how I'm basically trying to ridicule everything else in the industry, what's that going to do? It's going to create waves. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to be out there and people are going to hear about it. And somebody's going to want to come over here and say, hey, let's, let's, let's just square this up right now. This is what I can do. This is what you said you can do. And Largely, it's been just exactly what I said. They'll talk, and you're going to hear all these new people talk, but I want you to remember, let them prove. It matters not to me, and I'm the guy that done more than anybody else out there here. It doesn't matter if they show it to you with a demo account, because if they have conceptual ideas that they believe are viable in price delivery, because that's what I focused on, price delivery. If they can do what they claim, they will gladly show you from beginning to end with a stop loss and walk it just like that. And not just one time. Every single week, consistently, show you what they teach, what they claim to know. Can they do it in their own hands? Because there's going to be a lot of people with my logo, with my name, saying they trained with me, saying they're a charter member. That's been the biggest scam. So many people have claimed to be charter members. And honestly, folks, the easiest litmus test is simply ask them to prove that they can do what they say they know how to do. And as soon as they say no or give you excuses why they don't want to do it, there's your answer. That's it. You don't have to troll them. You don't have to go on and on about them. Just, okay, I save myself a lot of time. Don't even wish them well. Just wipe your feet off at the doormat and just leave them right where they stand. There's going to be a lot of fraud and scam and all this other stuff. Once I stop producing content, because there's going to be a lot of you that just want to be around it still. You don't need to be around it anymore. You have everything in your hands right now. I don't care if you go watch any more of my videos. I don't care. If I cared, I have the biggest audience right now, making over thirty-some thousand dollars a month in ad revenue, and I don't even put new videos up. I'm telling you, I'm not putting new videos up. So how does that even fit? the criteria that people were going to try to say that I want you to watch videos for ad revenue because I could just easily put something up every day. I could talk about a review that's already happened and make lots of money doing that. 
I want to go back to my personal life. I want to have the latter chapters in my life with my wife. And I just want to tell you something real quick. Before I came downstairs here, while I was using my, my wife's little, I got to find out what this thing's called. You know, I bought her this uh, cappuccino machine thing. And she has this like a little, I don't know what it is. It's got like a little ring, but it's like a coil. And she puts it in her coffee to kind of like froth it up or whatnot. I guess, it's, I guess it would be like a frother. If it's not a frother, then you, you, for those who understand what I'm talking about, you probably know what that name is. You just, I guess tweet it to me because it's driving me nuts right now. But I used it to stir up my, my cocoa. And as I was doing it, she leaned over my shoulder and she kissed me on the cheek. She goes, finish it today so that way I can have my husband. And for the folks that honestly think that I'm going to be on Twitter after today, I'm telling you, we're done. We're done. I want this woman to be happy with me. And tomorrow is not promised to me or her. And I want to be able to say that you're worth it to me to put all this down. Like, I've done everything I wanted to do in life. I've done everything. I've accomplished everything and more. And I'm very, very happy with the woman I'm with. And I want her to look back and say, you know what? I have no distractions. And two times this past week, we were together. And she goes, this feels really good to have your undivided attention. And it cuts, man. I mean, it cuts deep. As good as it feels to hear her say it, it just, it's a resounding, thunderous reminder that that has not been there. You know what I'm saying? So we've been together since 1997. Got married in 2001. I believe she's been patient enough. And you probably think, well, you know, ICT, come on, man. Even if you did do these long-winded droning Twitter spaces, you know, that's not the entire day. You don't know what I'm doing. I have a private community with multiple user groups that I have to talk to. I have questions that are being sent to me. I have people with my phone number <laughs> that I'm constantly blocking, which my number gets changed tomorrow. Oh, not tomorrow, Monday. And I have my phone on, do not disturb. So for folks that have been sending me you know, thank yous and all that stuff, use Twitter for that, please. I'm not going to reply to you. And it's not to be rude, but it's just, I'm not going to do that. I talk too long. My cocoa's cold. Now it's chocolate milk. The, uh, the time I've had with all of you, though, it's been fun. I've had so much fun. It's been fun being Inner Circle Trader. It's been fun being, you know, an online clown guru. But, you know, in the last two years, you know, I pulled back the veil, showed you what's available to you if you really just knuckle down and say, okay, it's fun. We get all the online drama, funny stuff. But let's see what you really have. And, like, last night I was laying in bed just scrolling through all the people on YouTube all the people on Twitter that either make mention of what they learned from me, have my logo saying, this is what I did to pass this challenge. This is how I earned my withdrawal over here. This is where I placed in the leaderboard for this or that. You know, that's, it's amazing to see how many people just said, you know what? I'm not going to listen to the naysayers. I'm not going to listen to people, my friends that may have said that I'm going to never be anything other than what they are themselves. I, I live that same thing too. And now look at what you're able to do. You're making more money than your job. You're making more money than some people earn in a year in your one singular withdrawal or payout. How does that feel? It feels amazing, doesn't it? Contrast that feeling right now for the folks that are able to do it with how you felt right before when you first started listening to me. Oh, this guy. <laughs> This guy, there's something, there's something wrong with this guy. If it was so good, if it was so good, he would have profitable students. Well, look around. I have the most.
I have the most. Look around. It's undeniable. And I love it. I absolutely love it. And I know because of what I'm leaving up on YouTube, I'm not deleting one singular singular. <laughs> I'm not deleting one single tweet. I'm not deleting any videos at all. Not one thing. It's all left up there for your edification, for your learning. Also, to cancel those people out there that want to try to sell something. You don't need to buy anything. If my name's attached to it, don't buy it. Don't buy it. You can find it on that YouTube channel. It's there. It's in a lot of videos. And there's going to be people out there trying to sell you, here's a study guide to make learning ICT faster. I promise you that's going to waste your money and waste your time thinking you're going to learn it quicker because of somebody else's curated list of videos. Again, you're listening to people that are not showing that they have learned how to do it. So how are they going to give you a study guide? ICT private mentorship. <laughs> if you can't do it, why would anybody pay you? when it's already up on my YouTube channel for free. Come on. And you're a fool if you're paying for that stuff. Don't buy these scammers renditions of it. It's already happened. You walked this with me for the last two years. That was mentorship, where I had to sit down and tell you what I think the market was going to do on a daily chart, on an hourly chart, on a 15-minute chart. So we weren't just always on a one-minute chart. I was giving you macro perspectives the people that can't necessarily sit down with a, an intraday chart and trade that because you know life gets in the way, right? Or it maybe doesn't fit their, their style of trading. So I want to encourage you to just stay on course. Okay? Stay on course and I'm confident that I already have very, very strong students that want to see other people succeed. And they don't necessarily want to try to sell mentorships. But if you make yourself available to the ones that aren't doing very well, you know what? You'd be doing me a great respect because I've given it to you for free. And if you learn how to do it well and somebody out there struggling with wanting to learn how to do this themselves, by bending over and helping them get up to where you're at, that to me is one of the greatest lessons you learned from me. Because I want you to be able to see, by looking around, the world's changing. It's getting real dark, and winter's coming. And not everybody's going to do very well in that situation. And if I can inspire that charitable sense for your brother or your sister, I'm going to try to do it here. Because everybody else is going to be out there with a price tag attached to it. Just look, you, can, you know who they are. They're already showing you in the last four months, some of them even before that. They have something for sale. If they're really, really successful, they will be doing things for free. If their motivation is to help, they will be doing it for free. Now, I'm not knocking anybody that wants to make money. I've even taught my students how to run signal services. I've taught them that. I did not teach them, even though they just basically copied what I did in mentorship. Now they're running mentorships, and they've made, they've made millions of dollars, you know, either taking what I've already said or just blindly just you know, share the actual videos. And I've had people that have bought those videos from other people from 2016, 2017, 2018, 2019, 20, and the last group was 2021. The last group of 2021, you know what they were predominantly? They were people that bought the bootleg versions of the videos. You know what their common denominator response has been? Having the videos were, wasn't enough. I had to be with you where you were telling us what the market was going to do day by day and watching it happen 90 plus percent always delivering. That's mentorship. And I told this to my group all the time. I said, you know, the videos aren't the mentorship. The core content is just a language, and I told them when I was done, I said, I could take those videos and put them up on YouTube, and it isn't going to change anything. It won't change anything. Listen to Kit over at ICT Concepts. You know, he was 
scouring the earth, you know, going in back corners and stuff, doing, uh, you know, drug deals to get the uh, I, I ICT mentorship videos. He was doing whatever he could to get a hold of them. I wasn't letting anybody else in. By itself doesn't help. Those videos that other people are going to sell you are not going to help you. What has to happen is you sit down doing the things that I walked you through. Now, I've already said this in the core content. I've said those things in core content. Do you have to do these things, practice like this? But even my paid members didn't want to listen to that because they were waiting for the easy one, two, three. Here it is. I don't have to spend so much time and energy because I got things to do. And they're the ones that still, even from 2016 group, can't trade. They can't. Not for a, a lack of sound logic that's being taught to them, because I have students from 2016 that are murdering it right now. And I also have students that have done better than any other group, even the 2016 group, that were in the 2021. And I have students that never joined my private mentorship that discovered me in 2020 on YouTube that have now are earning multiple six figures a year trading just from what I taught for free. That should encourage you. That should encourage you because every one of those groups are a different walk of life. And the ones that are succeeding are doing what? They're not putting a time limit on they have to learn it by this time. I have to know everything. I have to take everything the ICT says and place it into my trading approach or my model. That's a, that's a fool's errand. You can't do those things. And when I teach all these new concepts, it was never with the intent to try to confuse you. I've always told you this is just another perspective, one more thing to use if you don't see the optimal trade engine. Okay? If, you, if you can't really dial in on a fair value gap, which I think to me, I, I don't understand how anybody can't see a fair value gap because it's, it's, it, it just basically jumps off the chart. But uh, that whole business of trying to place everything like a kitchen sink approach doesn't work in any model of trading, not just my stuff, but anything. I mean, look at all of the available indicators for overbought and oversold. I did that same stuff when I had Metastock as a young man. I used that trading platform, or not trading platform, but it was a uh, trading software, and I had end-of-day data. I didn't have real time, and we had to get all of our ASCII data downloaded at the end of the day, and then you would it would populate your chart. So having that as my only means of looking at price chart price charts um, I saw all these indicators I'm like wow look at this I mean I could put like 12 indicators on this chart and eventually got to the point where I couldn't see the chart and I had more faith in what the indicators were telling me and I wasted years doing all that nonsense and you see these guys out here that are just trying to do the same thing by placing all their faith in the mathematically tortured data of open high low and close you shouldn't have any faith in that stuff because price doesn't even refer to it. And how is anyone going to be able – if we were in a courtroom, okay, and you were the one on the side of defending, you're defending the usage of indicators in price action, okay? How are you going to demonstrate – how are you going to demonstrate that price is going to do whatever it's going to do based on CCI? RSI, MACD, Stochastic, Williams Percent R. Which one is it going to respect today and why? And why not the others? You would fall on your face, but now roll in ICT. <laughs> All right, here's price. We're in a discount. It's taking sell side. It's already had a shift in uh, structure. There's buy side, relative equal highs here. The time of day. This is when the market will start spooling. It's going to run. It's already cleared sell side, and now we're waiting for a fair value gap to form, the low price. And then when it goes into there, we're going to be buying that with a stop loss that goes right below the low that creates the fair value gap. And we're going to take a partial halfway between where we're entering and the draw on liquidity. That's easy. It's simple. And then the final terminus is the buy side liquidity. That's the double tap. Remember that on baby pips? Oh, my goodness. That's a flashback, right? <laughs> So that's simple. I could stand in front of the CFTC 
in front of any judge and do this every single day. I don't care how long. Make the court last long. I don't care because I can do this every single week, every single day. It's going to be there. Period. I've been proving it for years. <laughs> and I'm telling you, when you understand that, when you're able to do that yourself, that's not arrogance. That's confidence. That's confidence that you don't have to struggle and scrape around trying to dig in the back corners for something new. You have everything that every trader wants to know. I told you from the beginning. I know what every trader wants to know. I know it. And I taught it. I demonstrate it over and over and over again. And for some of you, it was enough for me just to teach it to you. Well done. Well done that you took the initiative to find your own proof. That you took the challenge. I told you, go in and see if it isn't in your charts. Because if it's you know, BS, you're going to see it right away because it won't repeat. There won't be any consistency behind it. There won't be any quote-unquote edge. Dude, it's a razor's edge. Sharpened to a fine edge. And it's there all the time. Look at the evidence all around us now. So many people coming forward. I have so many guys that are in jail right now. <laughs> they're listening to this with a phone they're not supposed to have. Shout out to you, bro. <laughs> but they're learning how to trade. And then they come out into the world. They come out into the world, and you know what it's like. You know what it's like. I was a manager, okay? I was a manager, and Keith White, I know you can't hear me, but this man used to hold up drug dealers. I can respect that. First of all, that person that's selling the drugs, he's not in the community's, you know, he's not, he doesn't have the community's best interest in mind, okay? He's an opportunist. Keith, Said, well, you know what? If anybody deserves to be held up, it's them, and I know they're going to have the money. So he and his buddy would roll up. Boom. Give me your stuff. And the guy that said no and tried to run away, he shot him in the, you know, the right butt cheek. Well, that put him in jail for attempted murder. So he did a number of years and then got out and couldn't get a job. Nobody would hire him. He was on probation, whole, you know, whole business. And then he crossed paths with me, and he said, listen, I ain't going to lie to you. This is, this is where I'm at. This is what I did. But uh, if you give me a chance, you know, I'll work hard for you. All right. Really? That easy? Yep. Why? I said my father's a contract murderer, and I know if he ever gets out of jail, I'm going to be the one that has to employ him because nobody will. So I know. So why did I have a dad that was a contract murderer? to give me the heart of someone to give the opportunity for people that would otherwise not have an opportunity. See, I can look back on all this stuff now and see how God placed all these things in front of me to become who I am as a person. But this guy, Keith, turned out to be the best employee I ever had. My son, Caleb, I would literally trust him as a child around this man knowing full well that he had respect for me because I gave him respect first. I wished many times that he wouldn't have got himself wrapped up with somebody that got him in trouble and he reverted back to something that he couldn't do because when I was no longer able to you know, guide him, he got himself in trouble and now he's doing time for home invasion. So he's going to be up there probably you know, for a long time. I wish he would have learned, like some of the men that have come out. And recently we just seen one. The gentleman came forward and said, look, you know, this is it. You know, I came out of jail. You know, I did things you know, I'm not proud of. But I'm turning things around. And you know what? You know what? Slinging rock, doing all the things on the street corners and stuff like that. I trained people that used to do that stuff, and they make more money, and they feel better about themselves doing it this way than doing it that way. And I'm sure that gentleman, and like everybody else that would do it this way, makes them feel good. Makes them feel like 
you know, a sense of accomplishment that they're doing it themselves. No one's giving them anything. They're working for it. So that way their credit can't be shared with nobody else. And I got respect for that. I got all kinds of respect for that because this world's hard. It's not easy. It's not owing you any freebies. Even though that I didn't charge money, those lessons take time and energy, effort, and faith. Not in me, not in those concepts. It takes faith in yourself. Are you going to be able to stick to what it's requiring you to do? Because most people don't. You tap out too soon. You have no idea how far you're going to be able to go. But you take a little bit of adversity, a little bit of discomfort. You think these guys that were in jail, you think they don't know what discomfort is? They know exactly what discomfort is. So when they come out, they're highly motivated. They're highly motivated because their channel of opportunities have been reduced greatly versus what you and I would have. If, we, if I wanted to go out there right now, there's a, there's a number of different jobs that I could be qualified for, but I would never want to do. But as a convict recently you know, on parole, that's hard. That's really hard because there's a lot of managers – they would say, you know what, I'm going to look for a better qualified candidate. What you're saying is, is you're probably going to be a problem for me, and I'm not going to risk it. Where I looked at it and said, you know what, they're honest. They told me right off, the, right off on Jump Street, this is what I am. This is what I did. I did my time. I'm out now. I'm looking for an opportunity. And if you give me a chance, I'll work hard for you. Done. You came to me honestly. You told me what you did wrong. You told me what you're doing differently, and you want to work. And you challenged me to see if you're a good worker. I'm going to know right away, just like I teach you. You're going to know right away if those concepts are BS, you will see nothing in the charts doing those things. You would not see these fair value gaps form a silver bullet between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock every single day. But it's there every single day, reaching for an obvious relative equal high or relative equal low or a singular high or singular low. Which one's better, ICT? Relative equal high. Relative equal love. Why? Because they're going to see that as support and resistance. It's going to be very, very influential to the sentiment aspects of how retail traders see what price is doing and how they would trust it. A singular high and low, that's enough for me. And for some of you, you know, you've, you've traded that way for a long time now. But if you're going to ask me which one has more significance, if you can see relative equal highs, it's going to run there. If it's relative equal lows, it's going to run there versus a singular high or low. OK, but that stuff works every single day. Nobody's come out there and said, look, it doesn't work. The only thing that's coming out is people saying, wow, it's really there. And look, I, I just made money. <laughs> What's going on? I've been trying to do all this other stuff and it's it's nothing easier than this. Exactly. That's exactly the perspective I want all of you to have. And it's mine. I'm already five minutes over. <laughs> Give me 10 more minutes. My hope is for you to be inspired by everybody else that's coming forward, showing real proof. OK, you can say what you want to say about different brokerage firms because there's no broker out there that's good. OK, they're all doing the same thing. They're trying to get you to trade because they want your commission. And if they run B booking, they want you to trade because they want to take your money. OK, that, that, that's this business. You should know that coming in. And you can say what you want to say about the funded companies, which I have no affiliation with, but they all have their goods and their bads. OK, you can see people that are doing really well. Sometimes they're not getting paid out. I don't know the details behind it. Some of them are being banned. I don't know the details behind that. I don't know any of that stuff. I'm not interested to know any of that stuff. I don't need to trade with a funded account. But for some of you, you're seeing these very companies interviewing your brothers and sisters in this community. And they're coming out and saying the very same thing that I told you. If you put the time and effort into this, you will be able to do what most people can't. And you're going to stand apart. They're going to recognize you. You're not doing 2% gains. Okay? You're not making $1,000 and calling it a victory. You're taking down annual salaries, the average annual salary. Look at, look at what the folks are doing in this community. How can you not be razzed by that? Like, How can you not be inspired say, you know what? 
I'm at home. I'm, a, I'm around people that can see something that I've been inquisitive of, curious about, but never really felt the inspiration to really take a step forward and do it. But now look at all this evidence of people that are being interviewed by companies. You think these companies are just going to give this money to people randomly? Think about it. I don't have any kickback from any of these companies. They've asked me for affiliations, and I've said no. Not all of them, but most of them have. Because if I do that, guess what that does? It mars my opinion. It makes it biased. So I can talk unbiased about all of them because I have no affiliation with them. If I say something good about them, it's what I feel is genuinely my opinion about it. It doesn't mean it's right. It just means that's my, that's my unadulterated opinion that has no influence at all by, because somebody paying me for an opinion. That's what you want. You don't want to be listening to advice from people that are highly affiliated because are they really telling you what they would tell you if they weren't affiliated? I don't know. You don't know because it's – well, it's hard to differentiate, and I want to be in a position where if you're going to listen to me, if I have any influence over you, I want you to know that there's nothing in it for me. I've already put my core content mentorship. It's on the YouTube channel. I'm not doing a future mentorship. I told you I'm not putting any more YouTube videos up. How am I going to make more ad revenue? It's going to diminish over time. So what's, what am I here for? I'm here because I've already done the work. I've shared it with you. It won't cost you anything but the time and energy to go in and look at it. And if you don't find any value in it, then you don't find any value in it. It doesn't change the effectiveness of it. It just means that you didn't put the effort in long enough doing the things that you should have been doing and found the results that you're looking for. But they're not going to come on a time-based schedule. You can't time your success. Okay? You can't say, I'm going to be successful by this time. Because the only thing you did is you placed so much mounting pressure on you that everybody that would try to do that would probably cave. Do, do every athlete in the world that uh, – does an event that would be equivalent to an Olympic event? Do they all make it to the Olympics? No. No. Do the boxers that work really hard to qualify to get to be the, in, the, in the Olympics, do they all get to the, be in the Olympic? No. Would you want to box any of them, the ones that didn't? I know I wouldn't. <laughs> I wouldn't want to do that because they're trained. They trained very, very hard. They just fell short of that mark. But they're still way better than the average person in, in terms of fighting. No, I'm not saying street fighting. I'm saying like if you're just going to only just be a pugilist and punch only and you have no grappling skills, no ground and pound, no that stuff, you know, you, you're not going to want to exchange hands with somebody like that, even if they're lighter than you. You, you take an MMA guy. I'm probably going to ruffle some feathers over here. <laughs> i got to bring some kind of controversy. It's my last one. I don't care how, how good your MMA is, okay? I don't care how good that is. If we're standing up, okay, if we're standing up, you are not headlocking nobody. You're not, you know, you're not ground and pounding anybody. You're not slamming anybody. You're not choking people, which I wish they would take that out of MMA because, honestly, th that's not skill, okay? And I get so much flack from other martial arts about that. Oh, come on. I got, like, 50 different ways to do a shimewaza. A shimewaza choking technique. And to me, a, a, a child... If they get a person in quick enough, an adult will fall to that. So to me, I don't think that's skill. Um, submissions, yes. I think that's a means of tapping out. You cause that other person to tap out and submit to you. But a, a choke, I don't think that should be allowed in MMA. But uh, a boxer, if a boxer and an MMA guy, I don't care who it is, I don't care what striker in MMA there is, you place them in front of a well-versed boxer – that boxer's beating that ass. It's happening, okay? Because they're training to do what? To find your chin and put you to sleep. Now, MMA artists, they're trying to do everything. 90% of what they're trying to learn is on the ground. But what is a boxer trying to do? Never go on the ground. So the first 30 seconds of a fight is a boxing match. That's, that's what it is. So I say all this to say that you, you don't want to try 
to be a master of everything as a trader. Don't, don't try to do that. See, MMA, mixed martial arts, they, look at the name. They're mixing what they think is the best of everything out there. No. It still doesn't take away the fact that there are some guys that walked into that octagon and literally laid waste. I mean, it's really fun if you look at the first two or three Ultimate Fighting Championships. If you ever watched them, I mean, that, that to me was crazy. Like, it was 15 bucks to watch <laughs> some really mismatched fellas get out there and, and, and go to town. Uh, but that's exactly what it's going to be like in the street. See, in the street, you're not going to find somebody that's your same weight, comparable in every aspect, you know, within the same weight class. You're going to end up in the bar, and the biggest guy is going to come over to you when you're in a drunken stupor, not able to stand up, okay, and he's going to throw you around. That's exactly what the UFC was doing. That's the real world. That's how it is, okay? And they don't have weight classes out in the street. Well, in trading – you don't know what weight class the market's going to operate in that day, just like you don't know what indicator it's going to respect, which, which is why it's nonsense to even believe in that. So you have to take it back down to, okay, what is it likely to do? Okay, it's going to move a lot of momentum, one directional, at very specific times, between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock in the morning. Why? Why does it do that? Because at the 930 opening, a lot of orders come rushing in. Big trading firms and clearing houses, they, they funnel a lot of orders in there because why? There's liquidity. Everybody's chomping at the bit to get in or get out based on that opening price. And that, be, that brings in a lot of liquidity that allows for order flow to come in real quick. But it will evaporate quick. So what does it do? It uses that initial surge of inflow of orders to run to the obvious liquidity that's above or below the marketplace. What is it reaching for? Many times, it's the opposing direction of where the daily range will reach for. So you know, an example would be you're looking at a marketplace, and your, your ideal scenario is, is you, you think the market's going to go higher. So you're, you're not trying to go short. You really want to wait and see what it does at the opening price. That initial opening, 9.30, opening bell, everybody's in there clamoring to get in there and do something. All kinds of order flows coming into the marketplace. Boom, 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 boom. That will evaporate. So what is it going to do after that initial surge of interest and in all the clearing firms that come through with their orders hitting the marketplace in the first 15 to 30 minutes? What is it going to do? It's going to reach for the resting pending orders above the marketplace, above a singular high or above relative equal highs. So what is that initial move dropping down at 9.30 to 10 o'clock? Judas, it's fake move. So you're waiting for all that stuff. But then at 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock, you have that distribution phase of the morning price swing, where whatever it's going to do in the morning going into New York lunch, it's going to be directional, and it's going to run real quick into that buy side up to but not limited to 11 to noon New York local time now that is a very generic perspective to hold in the marketplace but if you look for that when the market's predisposed to go up you got it locked the only thing you're waiting for is a fair value gap to wait for a price to drop down into on a five four three two one minute or if you're inclined less than one minute 15 seconds Five second time frame. It's not complicated, folks. It's really, really simple stuff. But the complication comes with you're trying to find where COT fits in all that. Where is the commitment traders fit in all this ICT? I'm really struggling with the break of market structure. Where's that in the turtle soup? I'm sorry, not the turtle soup. Where's that in the silver bullet? Where's that? It's not there. You're looking for liquidity. You're looking for liquidity. You literally can wait between 10 o'clock and 11 o'clock and say, okay, what has already happened? Sell side's been taken. All right, am I bullish? Weekly expansion is likely to – I'm wanting to see that weekly candle go up. Okay. Then I have a, a, a selection that I want to be a bull. I want to be buying only. 
So you filtered out every shorting opportunity. I don't care how good it looks. You're not taking it. And that's going to be hard for you to see a lot of these really dynamic sell-offs. You just watched me short the S&P the other day. And the NASDAQ was saying, no, no, S&P. You're crazy. I'm not going down there like that. I'm not going down like that, okay? I'm not going out like a fool. I'm not going down like a, like a chump. I got somewhere to be today. And I'm very proud of you that I sent out that uh, Mount St. Helens picture. <laughs> that was a subliminal little mar uh, marker for my students. Um, it's getting ready to blow up. And NASDAQ was doing what, relatively? It was saying, no, I'm not interested in going down. So it was what? The relative strength leader to the upside. So I shorted the weak one. Didn't get, it went right down to my uh, price, but the spread didn't let me get out. That's the price of precision sometimes. The difference between the spread, the bid and ask. But that's okay. To me, I think that it's fun to be that precise, to have my order sitting right there. And I've already taken a profit, so it doesn't matter if it takes the, the terminus out. I don't care. But if it turns around here, guess what that proves? It proves visibility. It proves conceptual idea that it can be timed. There is sound logic behind it. And I was so precise, the only difference between me getting that fill was the bid and the ask. How much better can you be but not get the, uh, the mark? You can't get any closer to it than that, right? So that's the right perspective. So when you have that, and, and you see me now, I guess that's the second time you see me do it this year, where I had a resting order in and just the, the spread denied me the actual exit on the, on the limit order resting. But some of you get mad about that. And you're like, oh, you know, what's the perspective? To hold with this you know i'm angry about this don't get angry you should be thankful that you have the laser guided precision to even in, to include a limit order there where nobody else in the retail universe would ever have that they're looking for you know wedges and bull flags and inverted head and shoulders and you know, i gotta stop <laughs> but you have really the easiest thing in the world if you're trading a silver bullet in Robbins, that's all I'm doing. I'm not doing anything. I'm not bringing out Enigma. I'm not doing Model 2022. I'm not doing Artemis patterns. I'm not doing you know, Reapers. Um, nothing. But just simply Silver Bullet. Because in my mind, when I created that, like I wanted it to be so easy for my child to be able to see it Know what time it's going to be there. So that way, they're not anxious. They're not anxious to worry about, am I going to miss the move? Because think about how much you're, you're fearing all the time. Your, your, your FOMO is off the charts. Any given day. Man, I hope ICT tweets about what the uh, – if ICT could just tell me in a tweet to note this level, I'm going in. <laughs> I'm going in. I'm not going to have any reservations. I'm going to take that trade because I he's pointing to that liquidity. He's basically telling me, sign, seal, delivered, it's going to happen. And for some of you, that's what you're afraid of with me not being around doing anymore. And you shouldn't be afraid about that. This is that next logical step in your development where you as that eaglet is getting pushed out of the nest. And it's scary. The eaglet doesn't know what's on the outside of that nest. And it fights its parents when it's being pushed towards the edge of the nest. It's never, it's never been outside to know that it's dangerous. It's never known it. But it knows enough to know, I don't want to be out there. I want to be close to you. This is home. I want to be close to you, mom and dad. But nonetheless... That eagle is not meant to be in a nest forever. God gave it wings to fly. And it can't use those wings until it's pushed into a situation where it has to use them. You have the tools. You have been given the instructions. You've been given the mindset, how to look at things, how to avoid certain things, how not to think about th these things that create pitfalls in trading. That's what I've talked most about because that's the very thing that's going to be your undoing. It's not going to be your winning. It's going to be how you think about what you didn't do right or that you did right but wasn't good enough. And what is that going to do? FOMO. Fear. 
greed, over trading, over leveraging. And all of those things are going to be your downfall if you allow them. If you've taken everything I've ever said, either in text or in audio format, whether from a video or like this on Twitter spaces, you know, I probably wrote dozens of books already by now. But none of you would have been willing to pay any amount of money if I said trade psychology according to ICT. There probably been a handful of you who probably would have bought it, but mostly you wouldn't have. But the real secrets to precision order block entries. Oh, man, that's the one that's on the top sellers list. I'm the number one bestsellers list on you know, <laughs> everything, right? But that won't help you. See, if you stay in the game long enough, you're going to find what you excel at. And you're also going to learn the things that you do incorrectly, that you're prone to repeating over and over again, like trading without stop loss or trying to be better than the, ex the next person because they have more attention given to them. And you do reckless things. And those reckless things are the very barriers to your success. You're the one that's in the driver's seat with it. I mean, think about it like this. When I, when I teach my students to look at a weekly chart, you're looking at what is to be the next weekly candle. Are we among weekly candles that have been recently enlarged? Have, have they been increasing in size or have they been reducing in size or have they reduced from big ranges down to smaller ranges and it's still in small ranges? Having a period of time studying your chart with that perspective on a weekly chart is hugely advantageous because we just saw a lot of movement this week in the indices. So naturally, you know, over the weekend, people are going to be making up their mind about what they want to do next week. What do they want to do? They want to buy. They want to chase price going up. Now, what you don't realize is November 7th, I told my private students that the high on the NASDAQ at 15468 that buy side was in the crosshairs. It was going to reach for that. And then the fair value gap just to the left of that will be filled. Now, I say that only because there is more than what you see. But what you don't see is not required because I've always publicly proven these things to you. I've given you ample evidence to understand that this stuff repeats over and over and over again. It's not enough to call a move. It's not enough. That's not impressive. It would have never impressed me to only hear somebody that would be calling, my, calling me or calling themselves a mentor of me or anyone else to say, I called that move. I was looking for this thing to happen. But in the same sentence, 30 seconds before, you know, it, it might do this. But then when it does the other, say, I called that move. And that was another driving force behind me returning back to Twitter, because there's a lot of people with a lot of following that scribble over a chart and they give you two scenarios and they don't even tell you which one they favor. And then at the end, Many times, they don't even do either one of those scenarios, and yet people still clamor and worship them. That's not jealousy. I'm not jealous of anyone because nobody else is out there doing what I'm doing and what I've done. And I'm trying very hard to inspire those of you that want to be in the position of influence. The way you get there is walk the talk. Don't say something and not be able to do it and show it. Don't claim something in terms of precision and not be able to demonstrate it, not just a, a singular event, but week after week after week after week after week after week for a year, for a year and a half, for two years, for six years behind a paywall where everybody would have came forward and said, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. Because that never happened. And I gave you two years of what it was like to be under my tutelage. Where, where I had to show it to you before it happened. You should be inspired by that. I know I would have been. 
I know I would have been I would have found my home and I probably would have saved myself a lot of money with buying books and chasing other people because I would have seen the evidence that this stuff is in the price action. It repeats. Because only a fool can look at the level of testimonials with people coming forward, making real money, not demo dollars. And they learned how to make that real money from a demo baller. Everything they learned, they learned from a demo chart, a demo trade, a demo account in the hands of a guy that was honest and came forward and said, I'm teaching you this through the guise of a demo for compliance reasons because I'm not a licensed financial advisor. That's why you never saw me call my live trades when I was trading with the AMP account because guess what I'm acting as that way, a financial advisor. And no one can claim I'm doing what? Front running my orders. Everything is scheduled. Everything was planned. I already know what questions you're going to have. And I already know what the trolls are going to say. And that's why I'm going to beat the shit out of that Robbins competition next year. I'm not even going to come back and say, I told you so. I don't need to do it. <laughs> it's going to be obvious. So my question to you is, is, has your time been with me? Has it been fruitful? Did you have as much fun as I have had? You know, this is actually pretty good, even cold. I guess it's kind of like what those people do when they drink that cold. Like, I've never been a coffee drinker. I love the way it smells, don't get me wrong, but it, it tastes horrible. And this is kind of like what I think cold coffee would taste like. It's better than like a chocolate milk, but uh, I don't know. I'm, I'm digressing here. <laughs> but I've had so I've had so much fun. Uh, I've I've been up all night long thinking about you know what did I want to talk about, who did I want to talk about, and what did I want to re revisit and whatnot. And honestly, I've I've said it all. Like I've I've already said it all. And. I want to save this part here, and then at least I have a clear conscience now. Um, I know there's a lot of you that really – you're listening to me right now, but you hate me, which I don't get that. But <laughs> if we've ever exchanged words, just know that it was all for the sake of drawing a crowd. That's all it was. I don't know any of you from Adam. You know, I don't know what you do in life, you know, if you're successful or if you're profitable or not, but – I've always provoked everybody on Twitter. I've always done that. That was my style. That was my, my MO. I would go right up to the people and say, hey, you can't do this, and here it is. And the only, the only thing they can say is you're a demo trader. But I'm doing something with a level of precision that you watched me do with a real account this year. It's undeniable. And they wouldn't bring forward any evidence that they could do it either. Like you would never watch them take a trade. Like I pioneered a new wave of other people that are openly sharing. Because it used to be, show me your MyFX book. You know, fuck your MyFX book because that's fake. Show me a blank canvas chart with live data. I don't give a shit if it's a demo or not. You go in with a laser precise entry with a real hard stop loss. Manage that stop loss throughout the entirety of the trade to a target that you had predetermined. You do that dozens of times. Over the course of several months in a row, using the same logic that you claim is behind your Mickey Mouse bullshit, you do that, then you have a reason to have an audience. People have no excuse not to listen to you now because you've done something that 90% won't do. But look, you can tell who's been here. You can tell who your brothers and sisters are because they're out there showing you what? Executions from beginning to end, trade management with a stop loss. Guess who inspired that? Good old ICT. Oh, here he is. He's claiming he's the only person. He's the only person that ever did a trade. <clears throat> Look, I'm not saying the guys out there trading with MACD and RSI and moving average crossovers aren't trying to do something, but they're wrecking themselves on their live streams. They're wrecking themselves publicly, publicly dismantling themselves. I'm saying look at the logic that's been taught to you for free. And how many people have it in their repertoire now? And they are not afraid 
They are absolutely not afraid, and they have confidence that they know what they are able to do is going to repeat for them, and that's why they're barking the loudest. When people talk shit to them, they're like, let's go right now, and all of a sudden, their Velcro balls drop off. I love that. I love that because that means, number one, they know where they're at in their trading. And for the people that don't respond, get real quiet, and they clam up, that tells you volumes. That tells you volumes about them. They don't have confidence. If they have any success, it's hit and miss. Do you want to listen to somebody that has that? Do you want to learn from somebody that has an anemic level of confidence? That many times, I guess in a lot of ways, it would borderline on arrogance. But, you know, if you really can do something, if you really, really can do something, and you choose not to do it because, well, you got better things to do, <laughs> that's just too much of a cop-out. If you really love what you do and you have the time and effort to say that you can do these types of things, right, and you go on and on and on about how you're, you, know, you can do this and you make this, and, but you're not even willing to just show a trade, just show us. I mean, if you're going so far as to claim in comments to other people, my students, me, other, other teachers, other traders, other mentors, clamoring in their comment section, talking about, you know, you know I do this and I do that, but there's nothing in terms of evidence showing that you even know how to enter a trade. It, 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 listen, we have raised the bar so fucking high now that these people that have been frauding and scamming people for so long, they're mad as shit. I'm getting threats all the time now. I told my private students earlier in the week, I'm getting death threats all the time. <laughs> it's happening all the time because I've crushed their whole business model. I don't give a shit. I don't care. Learn. Go to my YouTube channel. Learn how to do it, and that way you can help your students be profitable. Don't even have to, don't even have to mention me. I don't care. Stop hurting people. You don't have to worry about it then. You actually feel better about yourself. Because I'm not losing any fucking sleep. So anyway, I tried to get out of here before that kicked in. That's why I wanted to go about an hour. I usually could go about an hour before I swing. But uh, I guess uh, it wouldn't, wouldn't be a Twitter space without the uh, other end of the spectrum. I didn't want to have any sentence enhancers in here. I'm interested in seeing what your goals are. Uh, before I close this Twitter tonight, not close it by deleting anything, but my last post will be uh, a little vignette directing you on how to go forward. It won't be long because obviously Twitter has a capped at two minutes and 20 seconds, which I always usually come around up two minutes and 15 seconds. The, the tweet I sent right before that, it's, I'm going to title it you know, Inner Circle Traders Yearbook. And I'm asking you, because I, I see a lot of tweets that I've missed. Like, I don't, there's also some tweets that pop up at the bottom on my Twitter that I should have seen, but I don't see them sometimes. I don't know why they don't up here in my, my feed. People will respond to me or they'll send stuff to me. They'll reply to a tweet and I don't always see them. And then there's all, obviously there's, you know, sometimes where it looks like there's like 15 different replies, but when I click on it, there's nothing I can see because the, you know, I guess it's some kind of scammer trying to promote to whoever would read my tweets. But the yearbook post or tweet that I make tonight will be the Third tweet in my feed that will always be there. The first one is the pinned one where it says, I, I'm not selling anything. So that way anybody that has my name associated with something or if they're trying to say, here's my Telegram channel. I, I gave you signals. Join Inner Circle Trader over on, on, on Telegram. It's all bullshit. Uh, that, that, you're, you're not getting into a Telegram channel with me. You're not going to get signals from me. I'm not going to be teaching you mentorship. You're not going to get a, a PayPal link. You're not going to get a, um, a, a crypto payment link to me, you know, none of that stuff. 
I'm not asking for any fucking money. I'm not making any more YouTube videos for, to make more ad revenue. I'm not teaching anything else. Okay, so all that stuff is going to be bullshit. So the first and only tweet that you're going to see on my feed that will be there forever as long as Twitter's around is the one where it says, I don't charge any money. Okay. Um, the second tweet will be this short little vignette video I add tonight that will post at 11.59. It'll be produced and timed. I'll probably be asleep, and it'll post, and that'll be the last ever post in this, in this stream as Inner Circle Trader. But the post right before that, which will probably be around 9 o'clock tonight, um, the tweet will be posted with the title saying, I, Inner Circle Trader's yearbook. I'm asking you, if you would be so kind to – I've done this before, but a lot of you were like sending it already. <laughs> I, I wanted it to be it, at the beginning of my feed so that way I can go back and, and scroll through it. And in the future, you know, into 2024 and, and, and beyond, if the Lord lets me you know, stay around long enough, I want to be able to come back to that tweet and see your successes. So if you have ever – if you have ever – past the trading combine, if you've ever had a payout, if you ever had a profitable withdrawal, you know, any success at all, that's the, that's the place where I want you to put it because I want to be able to look at that on the weekend when I'm going to be missing all of you. I'm going to be missing being here because as much as I love my wife, I love being Inner Circle Trader. I've been a lot of different personas online. But I've, not, I've loved this one more than any of them. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to want to be here, but I won't be. And it will satisfy me to be able to see your ongoing successes and also to remind myself that it wasn't wasted time. I already know it wasn't wasted time, but I want to be able to relive it. I want to be able to relive it at a fingertip, push a button, and I can scroll back and see the many lives that I've touched. I've been so blessed to be in a position to be an influence, maybe not always the best influence, but the influence to try to kick you in the ass, to do more. And don't complain. Don't expect shit for free. Work for it. Work for it, and you'll, uh, you'll appreciate it more. When you earn it, nobody can take it from you. Just because I gave it to you for free doesn't mean that when you get success that you didn't earn it. You worked your ass off to get it. It wasn't going to be easy. I promise that, but you still stuck with it. And there's going to be times where I'm going to be wanting to tweet. There's going to be times where I want to open up to other space. There's going to be times where I want to be on YouTube. But I have to de deny myself that. And you'll help me by sharing those things. You'll help me feel like that the investment I made in you was worth it. I know it'll be worth it if you just put the effort behind it. You have to test me and see if that's true or not. But you have no excuse now. You see so many people attributing their success to sticking to what they were taught. And it works. Do they lose money sometimes? Sure they do. Just like I said they would. Do they make money? Well, like I said before, do you honestly believe that these brokerage firms, these funded account companies that are paying out not a little bit of money, I mean, they're pretty respectable amounts of money. You think they're just going to just give this out to people? There's no incentive for them to do something like that. Well, I, I, have no, I have no affiliation with them. Zero. They're not paying me, and I've never opened up a dialogue where we could have a partnership, but they have reached out to me. And it's no. Respectfully, it's no. And I've been that way with everything. Some of the offers I've been receiving for other things, too, I know that there's going to be a lot of you who are going to end up in a situation if you get a large enough following. I'll know when you start mentioning certain businesses <laughs> that offered up some really big, big incentives. And still it's no. Because I want you all to know that this whole delivery was heartfelt. 
I mean that I want to see your success, and I believe you can have it. And I know I have more faith in you than you have in yourself right now, but that will change if you take the challenge of going through the content and trying to apply it to the charts, knowing that it's going to take you a little bit more time than you probably expect it to, but still sticking with it, but not trying to push everything into it. For a new listener or for a new student, my opinion is if you go through the 2022 mentorship, there's like 40 videos there. It doesn't take you long. You can go through that in about a week comfortably. I probably would counsel you to go through over the course of like three weeks to spend an appropriate amount of time with each video and think about what questions come up after you watch the video and see if they don't get answered in the next or subsequent lessons that's in that series. And then as soon as you're done that, go right into looking at the silver bullet because they'll complement one another. And if you look at that and you have a well-rounded approach to, to risk management, not over-leveraging, using the smallest leverage that's available, you have it. You do that until you get more experience. And your experience, where you're not hopped up on goofballs to trade with more leverage because you've been successful, when you get to the point when you're successful and you're consistently able to do it, but you don't feel the inclination to go out there and try to over-leverage because – you know that if you do that, it's going to cause you to be anxious in a trade. That even though you know you can do very well, you've historically done it with either paper trading or, or tape reading before the paper trading, demo trading, rather. Um, I'm, I'm talking my age, I know. <laughs> the, uh, that moment that uh, the word escapes me right now, that's it. That very moment where you know that you're unfazed by the consistency, and it's a very hard thing to describe because until you feel it, until you in, in experience it and endure it yourself, you really won't really appreciate what I'm saying here until you get to that point. But when you know that you know, that you know that this is going to repeat, but you also know and are comfortable with the idea that you as the operator in the model, you're probably going to mess it up sometimes. You might get it wrong. It's okay. It won't, it won't undo you as a trader. It won't undermine the, the efficacy of the, the trading model or the concept. But you know that tomorrow, if it was a trading day, next week, you know, next February, next you know, September, you know the things that you're looking for in terms of a trade, they're going to materialize in the time frames that given day. It's going to happen. That's power. Ask anybody out there, what time and day is their harmonic fucking horseshit going to appear in the chart place? It ain't going to happen. They, they can't tell you that. They cannot tell you that. Why do you think these high-frequency trading algorithms have billions of dollars behind it? You think they're just going to risk it on some willy-nilly bullshit? Some Rudy Pooh candy-ass, fruity fish and tooty bullshit that has no idea why the market's going to go up and down. They're going to risk billions of dollars with multiple – Entries in the span of 15 minutes because they're doing things on a statistical probability that you're unaware of. I gave you a stripped down to the brass tax of what time a simple little strategy that's visual. There are things that I know that you can't see in price, but I gave you something that's very, very specific, and it's visual, and you can set a clock to it. It's going to occur at the times I told you it's going to occur. You can't tell me as an RSI trader. You can't tell me it, this is tra this trade's going to form within this 10-minute window every fucking day. You can't do that. If you can, prove it. Prove it. Not with one Mickey Mouse example. Come out here, walk it for a year. No, that's, that's asking too much. Admit it. That's way too much. Do it for a month. Man, you get a lot of clout if you do that. You can't tell in advance what time your shit's going to present. But I've been making a mockery of everything else because I know what time it is. It's ICT fucking time, okay? It's ICT time. 
I can time the market. <laughs> Y'all think it says I can't trade. Shit, I'm about to show you, motherfuckers. <sighs> you have so many things that I wished I had. I'm envious of you. <laughs> I'm so envious of all of you. I wish, I wish I could have had this coming up. I would have had so much more fun. I could have saved myself so much pain and anguish, loss, physical ailments, relationships, good grief, everything. And despite having all these advantages, some of you don't even recognize what you have. It's astonishing to me. For, for the folks that are making money now, they're, they're convinced. You're never going to convince those people that what they've invested in terms of time and learning how to do, you're never convincing them. You're never going to convince them that there's something else that they can do that's easier, that's more precise, that is highly effective to this degree. You're never going to do it, folks. It's never going to happen. And see, that's why everybody else out there that has some kind of Mickey Mouse service, some kind of retail logic with all kinds of indicator horse shit on it, all these things that's taking your attention away from price action, that's why they're scared shitless right now because the marketplace is diminishing. And so you think all these people are going to learn how to trade ICT and they're going to change the algorithm for the last time. Okay, Pull up a chair. Pull up a chair. Sit down. Okay, I want you to listen to me. When the market's going to go down, it doesn't matter whether you know it's going to go down or not, but if the market is going to go down, someone is going to be in that move making money. Someone is going to be in that move losing their ass. People that are in the marketplace that have lots of money at risk, they put stop losses in. Okay, Large traders have large positions, they have to have some measure of protecting that equity. They're not just letting it just rip and roll. Smart money does not use stop losses because they already know what they're participating in is going to happen. They're a tier of trader at a central bank level. You're never seeing them. They're not teaching things. They're not commenting on CNBC. They're not writing fucking books. They're not doing teaching circuits. They're out there cannibalizing every one of us. When I talk about smart money, that's who that is. It's not fucking Goldman Sachs because they're not smart. They're highly profitable, but they have no idea what the fuck they're doing. If you compare and contrast what it is I'm taught you, what I'm ed educating and executing with. You ever seen Anton Creel do a trade? You ever watch him put a trade on, put a stop loss on? He's probably going to block me now. <laughs> he blocked me before. Uh, but I'm, I'm being sincere. Has anyone ever seen him do that once? I've never seen him do it. I'd like to watch it. I'd like to see what, what, what's going through your mind when you see the price action. What do you anticipate happening? Where do you see future trades forming an entry where you can pyramid it? Because I'm doing that. I'm highlighting the chart right where I know it's going to do something that you haven't even seen in your chart yet. Guess what that is? That's fucking time travel. There's nothing like this, folks. There's nothing like this. And you are a part of history because you were all here when it was made public. You were part of it. Whether you liked me or you didn't like me, you were here when it happened. And I'm telling you, there's dozens of books that have my name and logo on it right now, but there's going to be thousands of fucking people that's going to know about us from future books that's going to be written about. Everything that you had firsthand knowledge of, you watched it. You were here in history when this stuff was made known. That's cool. That has nothing to do with me. It's the fact that the community element of it is just really neat. You know, I was learning about GAN and I was learning about, you know, everything that would constitute, you know, my early stages of what I would view technical analysis and what concepts and whatnot. I always thought, like, what would it have been like to be directly taught by GAN? 
what would it be like to be taught right side by side hearing the words live over a chart? This is what's going to happen. You know, that would be amazing, wouldn't it? I mean, I, I don't have that same affinity now, but when I was younger, that's how I thought about it. And I tried to think about how all the things that I wanted to see as a dream, if I had a dream encounter of, of having a mentor that really knew what was going on and had an understanding about price action that was unrivaled, you know, what would it be like? You know, how, how amazing would it be to be able to see them outline something and it come to pass all the time? Just literally just at the fingertips, just go out there and say, okay, here's what's going to happen and watch it happen. Because I was frustrated as a, as a young man expecting simply because the market was oversold based on a you know, 10 period stochastic you know, on an hourly chart. I figured that, that's enough for me to call it oversold. I had no idea what I was doing. And because it was oversold and it started crossing up and the, the K and D lines were crossed and they were starting to go up, which we call stacking now, um, that means it should go up tomorrow. That means it should start, start going up. And I could be a buyer because I only, I only wanted to be a buyer. And then I would watch the things that I tried to do then not work. And it would, be, it would create anger in me. Like I was resentful that, that the stochastic didn't lift price up. You know, I had a 50-day moving average. It was slanted up. It was, it was pointing up. So therefore, I didn't need to know about a trend line, which I still have no uh, belief in. I think it's bullshit. But, you know, the 50-day moving average, simple moving average, but eventually became an exponential moving average. If it was sloping up, you know, and, and if you were looking at like a, a trend line, if it had an angle that was inclining, that told me that I want to be a buyer. And all I needed was to see an oversold condition on an hourly chart with the 10 period stochastics. And once it was oversold, I waited for the K and D lines to cross. And then once it came up out of the oversold, the next day, I wanted to be a buyer. What was I trying to do? I was waiting for the opening price to go down first. Why? Because Larry Williams was teaching me to be a buyer of strength. And every time I tried that, Larry, no disrespect, but I had my ass handed to me. I was, I was buying many times as an institutional order flow on a fucking short sell in a fair value gap. And then it would rip lower and then tear my face off. Now, I didn't know that back then. Nobody else was talking about that shit then. But I learned these lessons from losing money. <laughs> I lost a lot of fucking money doing shit that I thought was working or should have worked, and it didn't. And I would get angry, resentful. I would be mad. These fucking indicators. And I would try to mess around, see if I can get the, the settings to be calibrated. We're going to calibrate the indi indicators tonight, Uncle Stan. Uncle Stan, I got it now. We're, we're, we're going to go to a nine period because that's going to make a fucking world of difference, right? <laughs> it, it didn't do shit. It just gave me another excuse to go out there the next day and lose more money. That's all it did. I was not looking at price. I was not looking at price. And as soon as I discovered where I was going wrong by looking at indicators, then I said, okay, let me go back to the logic. Okay. And this is for the crowd that's listening that love stochastic. Okay. I'm going to tell you how to use it and make money. Okay. You ready? What did he just say? Oh, shit. Now you, now you wait. I'll wait for you to get your pen and pad. Now you want to write shit down, right? Yeah, I'll give you a second. I gotta write this down. He's talking about indicators now. That's the, that's my shit. That's my jam. Now let's go back and go through the normal process of a normal, well-adjusted ICT student. We're looking at a weekly chart. We come to the conclusion that we expect that weekly chart to resume going up. Okay, it has unfinished business. There's a in, it's an imbalance above price. It could be reaching up into or relative equal highs or a singular high it's gravitating towards. Is that complicated? Because it's going to be one or the other, or in the better condition, it's going to offer both. That means you have a real strong probability that the weekly expansion is going to be up. doesn't mean we're trying to predict the weekly close. It just means that our focus should be primarily focused on a gravitation in price going higher. That means bottom line is we are trying to be a buyer going into the next week. I'm not saying that's the case for you know, this coming week. I'm saying hypothetically from a, a, a rule-based idea. So that way we're setting a foundation for the, the implementation of an overbought, oversold, i.e. stochastic. So this is how I learned to move away from the indicators, but I had first this stage. Once I understood how to read price, 
then I could go back in and say, okay, now I'm in a position where I think the market was going to go higher. Now, I still haven't learned how to short sell yet. That was too scary for me. Like, I didn't understand selling something I couldn't have my hands on. Like when I buy something, I have, I have it. You know, when I bought shares or I bought an option or I bought uh, a commodity uh, futures contract, you know, I, I understood that I have now the right to that. I can take delivery of it if I, if I wait long enough. But selling short something that I don't even have didn't make any sense to me. So putting that aside for, you know, I've talked about it in, in the past, but this example is we're expecting the price to go higher. Okay, wonderful. Now go back to that premise of waiting for the market to open up. I abandoned buying strength because I learned that Larry Williams said that he wanted to understand how people could be a buyer below the opening price on big bullish days. And he was demanding that he see a 20% of the previous day's range be above the opening price for the S&P. And then he would be a buyer. To me, you know, in hindsight, looking back at it, you know, I discovered that I was many times buying on a 10 o'clock high, and then my stop loss that would be retracing down to a silver bullet that you know down today would be a new entry or really a more sound entry if you didn't buy below the opening price. I would get stopped out there, and then what would happen? Think. I, I went long buying strength, then it retraces on me. My stop loss gets hit, or it scares me, and I close the trade. But it goes into what you understand now is the fair value gap, which is a silver bullet. What's price going to do? Take off. I'm not in it. I'm demoralized. I'm angry. I'm upset. So I learned from that. I said, okay, I'm not going to wait for that retracement. I'm going to buy it as it drops underneath the opening. If I think it's going to go up, I want to find out where we open, and I want to see it drop down. So all I would do is use a 15-minute time frame, and whatever the low was that was real close to going left, whatever the first 15-minute low was, I don't care if it was two handles. That was what I needed it to go below. Once it did that, then I started buying it. In the beginning, it did not work well. It was me going in and losing lots of money doing that. I would go in, and I would condition myself to say, okay, I I'm going to figure this out because – he says he wishes he could learn this. I'm going to fucking learn how to do that. I'm going to learn how to do that. I'm not going to lose more money with something I can't replicate with him saying he's willing to do that. That was the biggest milestone in my development by understanding that a mentor, like for all of you, you might have seen me do something. Okay. And there's a lot of my students that are guilty of this. And I understand because I, I, I experienced it myself. When you have a hero that you look up to and you're trying to learn from, it doesn't need to be trading to be anything. And they can do something that you try very hard to emulate and, 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 and try to do as close as you can to what they're able to do and you fail. It, it, it builds a certain measure of animosity. It may not manifest itself vocally or, you know, in a manner where other people can see it, but internally you feel it and you wrestle with it. I was angry at Larry Williams because I felt like he was teaching something incomplete when he really wasn't. His stop loss allowed for a lot of gross retracement that I, as a trader, was unwilling to absorb, and I didn't have the money to absorb it. So I had to create something that was inspired as a challenge. I took it as a challenge. He said he couldn't. Well, shit. At that time, I couldn't make 10000 become $1.2 million a year. I couldn't do that then. I can fucking do it next year, but that time I can't. So what am I going to do? I'm going to try to scratch the itch the best I can and start delving into an area where he said he can't do that. Okay. I'm going to try to do something that he said he can't, and I think he's Mr. Everything in trading. So I'm going to develop my time, devote my time into that. And I lost a lot of money trying to figure out a system of determining, you know, how far will it drop down? How far will it go down? And then I started looking for, you know, more than single swing lows, and I'd start seeing the two relative equal lows. And then I would look at the overnight Globex low, and then there would be this little tiny segment of price action 
where it was one candle by sign of balance, sell sign of efficiency, resting right below relative equal lows. That was my banger. That was the one I wanted. That's the very setup that cracked the code for me. Then I figured out, okay, when that forms, I know that's the day that this fucker is going to make the low right there in that fair value gap, which I didn't call it a fair value gap then. But it traded down into that. That would be my initiation to go in long because what is it doing? It's knocking out stops. It's taking out a support level. And it's going into an inefficiency. So that's where it's going to go. So if I can get my order in to buy as it drops down there in a time when I think the weekly chart is going to go up, what am I doing? I'm buying below the opening price. What opening price, ICT? I know some of you are like, you keep talking about the opening price. What the fuck opening price are you talking about? Well, if I'm going to be up in the morning session trading the 930 opening, or if it was you know the bond where I was trading the bonds you know, prior to equities opening, you know, it's the opening price at the open outcry pit at the time because back when I was trading in the 90s, we didn't have electronic trading. It was open outcry. So there was a whole lot of horse shit of calling the broker, and you heard all that stuff before. And the whole time the market's moving around. So you have to use limit orders. You know, to trade like this, you had to have your limit orders resting in the marketplace because you can't call up and do a market order. <laughs> the shit's already gone, right? So what I discovered was that – when the market would create these buying below the opening conditions, which were highly primed to go up, I was in an area where I felt very, you know, what's the word I'm looking for here? Empowered. Because it was repeating a lot. And I knew I had something, and I wanted to still go back in and ring in the stochastic because – it wasn't on my chart, and I felt like it would make it better if I did this. So I put the 10-period the stochastic on an hourly chart back on my chart and use the same logic. It has to be oversold, and then once it becomes oversold, does that same idea of the opening price see that drop down? And the whole aspect of a Judas goat came to mind. Like, if you've ever raised, uh, you know, animals or whatnot, if it's usually like uh, pigs, you know, goats, uh, sheep, they employ a goat that's called a Judas, and it walks the livestock up to the slaughterhouse, but it takes a small little detour. It takes one little exit that the other ones won't. So it gets to be safe from the slaughterhouse, but it leads all the ones to, to slaughter. That initial drop down when the market's predisposed to go up, that's what I dubbed it as a Judas swing. Now, it, it led me astray many times when I was trying to be a short seller because I was so excited about learning how to do short selling. I even got caught up in many times a Judas swing. So I had to relearn a lot of things and, and get my – Mindset corrected from those things because I was chasing something new, shiny new object syndrome. So I abandoned what I had already learned by what I just told you here. That's how quick and easy it is for you to derail yourself and forget all the progress that you just made. If you see something new, okay, something new, or someone comes out and says, "ICT's un, uh, you know, unpublished or uh, previously never." shown before or unleaked videos, bullshit, all that stuff, that's not going to help you because everything that's going to teach you conceptually is already on the YouTube channel. It's equivalent to you now watching the videos of me taking a trade. It might be entertaining. Like, wow, look at that. I can see him doing it. But could you benefit from it monetarily? No. But you can see me using it. You have enough of that already. You don't need to buy into anything else. There's no reason for it. So it's important that you understand my departure from being on social media shouldn't be an invitation for you to just drop all progress and just say, that's it, I can't do it anymore because I can't be inspired. ICT is not here to encourage me when I am. 
go back and listen to old Twitter spaces. It's the same thing as I'm saying it now. For some of you, you're going to be listening to this you know, months from now. You're going to get the same thing. I, I'm, I, everything I'm saying here is timeless. It's, it's, a, it's an approach to taking something. Like if, you know, many of you probably like that guy, Tony Robbins. You pay a lot of money for his stuff, his, his CDs or read his book or whatnot. Those things are old or stale. But when you read them and they resonate with you, it feels like it's a, it's a right now word for you, right? This is I needed this right now. This is this is refreshing. I needed it. Well, I've already given you all of that. It's already there. You don't need an ongoing thing of me. There's th thousands of hours of content that you can listen to to be inspired by, and other things to maybe laugh about. <laughs> so, I mean, you have everything that you need. But having that stochastic idea, I realized that, you know, it became a matter of confusion where I was watching to see if the stochastic would behave a certain way versus seeing price behave a specific way. So I finally cast it off my chart and said, you know, I'm not going to have any of that anymore. Nothing. And like I said many times before, I, I, the only time I have anything on my chart is because I know that you will be seeing what I'm doing. And I want you to see that I have this in my foresight. It's not something that I'm writing into my chart and annotating after the fact. I see it before it does it. And that is prowess. That's undeniable evidence and proof that it repeats. It's a, it's a real logic. And in, in my private group, uh, I think it was last week. If memory, if memory serves me correct, I think it was last week. Uh, I'm getting older, folks. <laughs> Senior moments kicking in once in a while. But uh, I shared an example with them, and I was showing it by way of my cell phone. And I didn't notice it or not, but um, to me, it was just me just you know doing what I always do anyway, which is execute on what I see in price. But TradingView had asked me to confirm my status, professional or unprofessional, for the data. And if you have a, a subscription package for real-time data, you know what I'm talking about. So because I hadn't uh, responded to their their questionnaire about it, they had disrupted my uh, live, live data. So I was doing an example of, of trading what I thought was real-time price, and I, I had no reason not to think it wasn't because I, I have real-time data through TradingView. <clears throat> and uh, my student was like, hey, you know, can you answer this? Why is that uh, showing delayed data? <laughs> and at first I didn't understand what he was asking me. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? Is this live? What are you talking about? And then I look at the top of the chart of the, the video I'm showing, and it has that little, I guess it was like an amber colored or something, and the little uh, D, I think is what it looks like. And then uh, I was like, wow. Yeah, I'm not sure what's going on. So I later found out that I had to do the questionnaire, or not the questionnaire, but the, to tell them what, you know, what my status was. And once that was done, they reinstated my, my live data. But I... I I felt uncomfortable for a second because I'm thinking to myself, if that would have been on Twitter, you guys would have crucified me and forgot the myriad of examples of me calling it before it happens, trading it, and trading it with a live account where it's not a demo. You would have forgot everything and placed all of your hopes and prayers on that one event where you now can say it's fraud because look at that right there. And I told them in, the, in my private mentorship, I said, I'm so glad. I'm so glad that this happened after you have seen so many examples of me do this in front of you live. So many examples of me being able to explain it before it happens. And it's not during a paid mentorship. Because if that would have been a paid mentorship, that would, that would have went over like gangbusters for people that don't like me. And for some of you, you're thinking to yourself, wow, you know, we never would have known that. But that's the reality sometimes. Sometimes, you know, when I'm looking at price, I'm laying in my bed. I wasn't in my trading room. You know, I didn't have all my monitors in front of me. It was just me laying in the bed with the puppies. And to me, because I'm not, I'm not looking to see if it's delayed data or live data, because I'm assuming that my phone's pulling the live data like it would normally would anyway. I'm just executing on it. I'm just doing it and taking the trade and showing them this is where the, the stop would be. This is, you know, the target, whatnot, over and over and over again. And then when I share the video, you know, to me, it's what I've always done. It's no different than anything else. 
but it would be totally different had it been done here on Twitter. And you never would have known this had I not brought it up here today. But that's how I want to be with all of you. I want to be forthcoming. I want to be able to – where you don't have to worry about – there's no ulterior motive. There's nothing no, – no catch. I really want to see you succeed. And there's been the greatest effort I could make to be able to inspire you to do what it's going to require you to do to learn how to do this. And it's available for people to make a model that's completely unique to yourself. There's enough information on that YouTube channel to take and build yourself something completely unique that no other student of mine is using. And you could have that as your model for the rest of your life and pass it on to your children. Never write a book about it. Never teach it as a mentorship. Never give signals on it and be wildly profitable and, and happy. I would love to see that happen, you know. But some of you are going to try to complicate this when I didn't complicate it myself. And you got to be very careful not to do that. Just because I have lots of things in my toolbox doesn't mean you got to bring every Phillips head and flathead screwdriver to the job that only requires a hammer. Yeah, you have to simply settle down and realize what it is that you're trying to do. Because strip down technical science real, real quick for me, ICT. Make it simple so that way I can you know, grasp it. We're looking for a time, a period of one month, where the likelihood of the market to reach to a group of orders that are resting in the marketplace above the current market price, where would they be resting? Logically, it would be above, be above a singular high or a swing high or above relative equal highs or in close proximity. The one that has the relative equal highs, that's going to take precedence over a singular high because the idea that it inspires resistance. Any inefficiency above price is a likely draw on liquidity. It's further compounded to, to likely if your weekly analysis is suggesting that it's going to try to gravitate up anyway. So now you've, what have you done? You've taken a stage where the market is predisposed by your analysis and you can be wrong. How do I remove that? You don't. You're always embracing uncertainty as a trader. You are a manager of uncertainty. That's what trading is. That's, that's it. You have no control of the outcome. You have no control of the absolute amount of drawdown or profit or the, the success or failure of your next trade. You can't control that outcome. You submit yourself to the likelihood that if it does this, I can profit this much. But if it does this, I stand to lose this, and it's okay. I can still be in the game, and it won't rattle me to the point where I am afraid to take another trade. That is a big balancing act. And so many of you discount that, thinking it's not going to be significant of a, of, of a factor for you. When it is, it is the very underlying factor that's keeping you to be successful. And you know it many times, but you keep pushing it aside, ignoring it, and saying, no, it's, I just need to find a better entry strategy. I need to know when it's a right shift in market structure. Fella, listen. Okay, I see you tweeting to me. You have to spend more time on the higher time frames and understanding how to read the tape. And by doing that and spending more time watching real price action, you won't fall victim to uh, market structure shifts that are either fake or actual. There's no shortcut to it. So it's just a matter of time studying the charts, okay? I see your tweet. I'm not trying to be rude by not responding to you, but I gave you 31 years of my time already. You know, five minutes isn't going to change it because I already said these things in the, in the discussions and the Twitter spaces. Time, experience, that's what, that's what you're asking for, and I can't give that to you. I can only lend you mine, and, and mine is no longer being lent today. It's the day it ends. But Many of you are going to discount the, the very things I've, I've talked more about and say that they're not going to apply to you. And then when you fail, you really know that you failed by not listening to the things I told you to focus primarily on, and you're still going to deny it. 
and to fight that and combat that, you'll just go and you'll join the small rank of little Dick Daniels out there that say ICT concepts don't work. When you have a whole army of people that are coming forward, proving it they do, and they're excited, they're happy because they found something that makes sense to them. And I'm amazed to see how fast it caught fire. And it's spreading like crazy. And to me, it's a little intimidating to have my name tossed around like it is and saying, hey, look, thanks to this and thanks to that. So I can see very easily how if I was allowed to do this when I was 20, that I could have been a totally different person. And I would never be leaving. I would be you know, trying to pump it up and build it even more. And every affiliate offer, I'd be taking it because it was about ego then. It's not about ego. You know, I, I told you I was going to teach you. I told you I was going to do my best to make it easy, not where everyone's going to be successful because that's not practical. But there's a lot of things that you're going to have to grow and go through slowly in that growth. And there's no way to make it easier by trying to speed it up. To try to speed it up makes it actually more complicated and harder for you. So you have to spend time in those. Even when, when you start making money and you find consistency, you start finding profitability, that's going to be an adjustment. Like it, You're going to wake up and you're going to think, I just had a really good week. Me and that felt good. I can't wait until Monday. Why? Why'd you say that? Because you already feel that dopamine wearing off. And you didn't get any more people tapping you on social media saying, you're fucking amazing. Oh, how'd you do that? I want to be like you. Where being content with, I followed my model. It did exactly what I expected it to do. I handled myself appropriately. I was not influenced by greed or fear. I did not feel any anxiety about the trade. I trusted what I had learned in price action. It's going to repeat, and I'm content with waiting for a sound setup the next time it comes, and that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wait soundly. I'm not going to rush to get to the next setup. That's going to be hard because winning feels real good. Sucks when you lose money. It sucks when you feel like you can't figure it out. It's bad. It's really bad. But when you start finding consistency and profitability, then the real challenge kicks in. That's when you're going to have to really learn who you are because <laughs> everybody starts off as a loser. Everybody does. Everybody starts off as clueless, no way of making money, doing all the wrong things, reckless, over leveraging, blowing your account. Screw it. I can afford to do another reset. It's worth it. Let me try to see if I can get a lot of you in. Everybody, everybody in the world right now that has funded accounts are doing that same thing right now. And some of them are doing mentorships. <laughs> so, I mean, to me, you know, you have the greatest lessons in your career as a trader when you start making money. And for the people that never made money, that don't make any sense. That's how you know they don't have any experience. Because when you start making money, your mind, your mind starts doing funny things. Number one, you, you think you're better than you really are. And then you think that you can do any and everything. And then you start thinking outside the parameters of what you're able, able and capable of doing. Say, I, I could do that. I could do this. I could do that. And then what you're doing is, is you're trying to do outside of what your model is calling you to do. So what are you trying to do? You're trying to be an Olympic contender when Olympics has never been a factor. No one, when you sat down to learn from me, you know, your intentions were not, or you shouldn't have been, I'm going to win the Robins Cup. Now, I'm sure some of you, <laughs> since it's become a, a, you know, a hot topic again this year, you're thinking, well, shit, you know, I'm going to learn. I'm going to make ICT proud. If you do join it and place it all, I'm proud of you. I'm proud. If you learn how to trade, whether you ever do a contest or not, I'm proud of you. You don't need to impress me with that. To me, Robbins is a litmus test because I have constantly rubbed it in the noses of everybody out there that says they're a good trader, they make money, they got something that doesn't stink, you know, they're the best this and best that. But they won't ever do that. Nobody's ever really done that. And it's been a, a, a shocking revelation to see how many people avoided it. Because it's audited. 
And if you're going to come out and show the world your account number in the beginning before any singular trade is ever taken, that better fucking match at the end of the year and show every monthly statement so that way no money was added. And there's nobody can argue with that. Nobody can argue with that. No one can say that's faked. No one can say you used multiple accounts on that stuff. But you didn't sit down to have that as your goal when you started to learn how to trade. It might have been, I want to, you know, prove to my girlfriend or my boyfriend that, you know, I'm worth something. And for me, that's how it was when I was a younger man. Because my very young wife and myself being a you know, younger man too. When she left me, I, that just totally wrecked me. Like it, it didn't give me a sense of value. It, it gave me a sense of I'm worthless. And I was doing everything in my power at the time to be a hospice nurse to my grandmother, go to college, work on my degree, and also work what little part-time I could do at the bookstore at the school. So, I mean, I was in class all day long, all year round. I didn't take any semesters off. So I was trying to do everything I could to speed through it. And what was the sacrifice? My, my marriage. But it was the best thing that could ever happen to me. But at the time, it was the worst thing that could have ever happened to me. So when I first sat down and started learning how to trade, it was to try to show her that she made the mistake. You, you picked the wrong guy. You know, like you have no idea what I'm going to become. I'm going to do this. You thought that this guy was going to inherit a grocery store that the neighborhood actually shut down. Which I got to tell you again, because I know some of you already know, but some people don't. My first wife left me for a 40-year-old man who was expecting to inherit a grocery store that was in our neighborhood. And when they found out that my wife left me for him, the whole neighborhood ran a tab up on groceries for two months and never paid the bill, and they, they bankrupt them. Now, unbeknownst to me and my family that they were all in the cahoots to do that, uh, later, once it happened, they all came to our family and said, look, we, we know what they did, and that was wrong. You know, you can say what you want to say about that, but that's respectable shit. That's the way down-home folks do things. And when you come from a small town, that's the kind of shit that, that that's what happened to you. So, you know, you can say what you want about it. I didn't ask for it. I, didn't, I would have never said to do it. But punishment comes, you know, and... God says, you know, don't let anything he brings together be divided. Don't do it. And I've often many times, I've said this in Twitter spaces, my first wife, I would love very much for her to see who I am. And I, I often wonder, you know, does she ever peek in and try to see where I'm at and all? Like, what is she doing today? I have had friends and family members tell me that she's had a really rough life, though. She's been married a couple times, kids from different people, and just, just not doing very well. But not to gloat, but I would very much like one day to sit down with her and tell her, look, when I told you when I was 16 that I was not going to be the average person. I'm not going to be the average person. And I know your dad at the time isn't going to you know, hear that shit. Because if someone came in here and told my daughter and told me, yeah, I'm going to be, I'd be like, <laughs> listen, fucker, unless you start studying my YouTube channel, I don't believe a fucking thing you're fucking saying. <laughs> get out of here with that horse shit. So I get it. As a dad, I could, I could understand that. But, yeah, you know, I meant it. And every time I've said something and then I had intent to really make it happen, I've always done it. It just sometimes took longer than I wanted it to. And for some of you, trading is going to be that very thing. And it took me six years, six years, what my mentorship students basically ex experienced from the 2016, you know, when it closed that year off. Uh, you're, they, they, now they have seen that amount of time. That amount of time. That's how long it took me to get to the point of understanding where I was the problem what I kept doing to cause the problem, what I didn't know, and what I needed to know, and I was finalized in that. I knew exactly everything I needed to know at that time. 
How many of you that are just now starting that feel the ad adversities of learning this? And you've probably been in it for a couple months or maybe this year and you, you haven't found consistency yet. Are you willing to put in another five years with no guarantee of the outcome? I guarantee the majority of you are not willing to do that. Truth be told, if it would have took me 10 years, I still would have worked those 10 years to get it. That's why God gave me obsessive compulsive disorder. It's not a weakness. It's a superpower. I'm not fucking lazy. I'm not someone that's going to tap out. I I'm going to stay with it. I always over deliver. And a perfect example is I should have been out of here an hour and a half ago. <laughs> So, that's how we roll around here. So you're going to have periods where you want to throw in a towel. You're going to say, I can't get this. That means you need a break. That's all it means. Take a week, maybe two. Don't look at anything I've produced. Don't look at the charts. Don't look at the markets. Don't talk to people that trade. Don't go on social media. Leave yourself a distance from it. You know, and, and just allow yourself to decompress. It's how you manage yourself. Even successful winning traders need to do this. It's not bad. It's a good thing. You have to take a little break. You have to schedule a holiday, a trading holiday. And I treat the holiday season as my built-in, hey, this is a perfect time to do it. Why should I be worried about charts when I have my family you know, pining to be with me, spend more time with me? And I'm going to miss those memories as well, too, in addition to everything else? No, it's not worth it. When you work your job, you, know, you, you schedule many times a year in advance. We're going to go, when I get my vacation time in, we're going to save up, put this much money aside, and then we're going to go to whatever that destination is for a week. How much time and effort do you put into planning your typical annual holiday or vacation? Versus how much time have you put into putting in and scheduling a hiatus from trading even during peak trading hours and times? You're not doing it. Why? Because you got to push your edge, baby. Unprofitable people on fucking Twitter says you got to press your edge. Keep pushing your edge. You'll make it dull. How do you stay sharp? You rest your mind. What are you doing on the weekend? It shouldn't be more than an hour, two at most, with anything with the markets. You have to rest. Take your mind away from it. Constantly being engaged with it. It's too much. It's too much. So you have to distance yourself. And some of the greatest lessons you're going to learn is when you start finding out that you're better as a trader, when you have scheduled only three trades a week at maximum. I said week, not day, not session. <laughs> yeah. When you come to the realization that the best fucking setups that you're looking for for the week are only two or three, doesn't mean you can't make money doing all kinds of other shit because you watch me do it and you watch my students do it. I'm saying the cream of the crop best, the choices, the medallion setups. Two or three at most per week. You find them on the four hour. How often are you spending your time on that time frame? Until I started teaching actively around the weekly chart and you never even considered it. You're always looking at those five minute charts. It's one minute charts. Now the flavor is sub one minute. You know this one minute charts ain't gonna do a fucking thing that ain't already determined on that weekly chart, on that daily chart, on that four hour chart, on that one hour chart, that fifteen minute chart, that five, and that one. The storyline with all those time frames, what it should do, at what time it should do it, that's when those second charts are gonna behave like you want them to. Otherwise, you're going to chase things that aren't really there. You'll draw lines on shit that don't have any bearing on what price is going to do. You'll go through things you're scribbling on, and all of a sudden, you'll do something you weren't expecting. 
So you have to have a higher time frame perspective. No matter what, what you're trying to do, you should have that because it'll, it'll teach you and help guide you in trying to trade with less because commissions add up. If you're going to be a high-frequency trader, this is expected. You're going to be spending a lot of money in commission, probably 35 to 40% of what you start trading with will be spent in commission. What? Mm-hmm. Yep. And especially if you're trading with one minute or less and you're doing lots of setups, those commission costs will go through the roof. Sure, 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 sure. You might make a lot of money, but you're going to have a lot of money coming off that bottom line that you may not be aware of. And if it starts bothering you psychologically, you're going to have to make adjustments. Now, for me, the way I look at it is as long as I'm net profitive and I'm consistently profitable, I could do ratchet ass. I don't give shit really what the commission costs are because I can outpace that like I can outpace you know inflation it's not a big deal I don't give a shit if gasoline goes to $20 a gallon I'm still driving my 8 cylinders I'm not doing it I'm not changing it I'm not getting a, a, an economy car that's the whole point of making money to afford things comfortably and not give a shit it look, I don't look at price tags but I did uh, <laughs> I want to bring this up yeah, um, on Twitter, I like to I like to subtly troll. Like sometimes it's a dry humor that it, it's it goes unnoticed. <clears throat> I I posted a tweet with um, a Bugatti and I said dare me because I, I saw somebody with a Bugatti talking shit to me in their profile picture, but they probably drive a, a Toyota Corolla. But the uh, the idea of spending $3 million on any car is a IQ test that I can pass by not even fucking considering it. Okay, but you're an idiot if you do that. If you spend a million dollars on a car, you're a fucking clown. Nobody should spend that much money. Nobody should spend that much money on a car. Okay, Is it beautiful? Absolutely. Is it worth it? Fuck no, it's not worth that. It's a, that's, a, that's an IQ test. Okay, It's like wearing masks in a car by yourself. Okay, You're a fucking idiot. Stop doing it. So if you are... On the fence about doing things you know, at an accelerated pace, lots of trades, I'm going to trade this and this and that, my advice is try to focus on the other end of the spectrum. Try to trade less. And you're going to find a greater balance in your personal life, which is absolutely essential. You have to be able to have that balance in life. Because think about it. How much influence does your life have on your trades right now? A lot. If you're going to be honest, it has a great deal of impact, whether it is positive or negative. If you're easily hurt, if you're in a toxic relationship, or you've, well, like I did when I was younger, before I learned how to trade, you know, I went through a divorce. One that, you know, for a girl that, you know, I was willing to take her back for anything. You know, it was my first love, my first, you know, physical relationship. Like everything. My heart was in every bit of it. And truth be told, I would have took her back. You know, some of you men out there were like, hell no. I would have. I wanted to be with her that much. I wanted to be with her that much. And I guess in a lot of ways, I've always been a hopeless romantic. And I, I, I had hopes to, to spend life with her in a specific manner. You know, being successful as a systems analyst. That's what I was really at the time basing all of my future success on, not trading. And trading happened as a, a response after the divorce was settled, which we backdated just to get it done because you know, I, I wanted to get it finalized. But all of those things in your personal life, they're going to be drivers to make you do things impulsively. And you're going to have to wrestle with that and say, okay, am I following my model right now or am I acting on something that is outside the marketplace that I'm trying to pamper myself with or compensate for? Now, pampering is where you're already doing well. Everything's going good and you just want to you know, fluff yourself up. Uh, I'm not feeling a bad you know, experience in my personal life. Nobody really hates me. Uh, my relationships are golden. Um, my health is good. 
eh, this, you know, I just want to get in here and just do something because I'm good. You, you're going to have to find a way to keep that from happening. The opposite end of the spectrum, which is the majority of the time what you're going to experience, is the adverse things that happen in your life. You know, the people at your job are getting your fucking nerves and somebody else that should have never got a promotion that you should have got, you were overlooked and they got it. Or you're just abused by poor management. Or you had a relationship fall out. Or you discover maybe infidelity. And the uncertainty of whether it's true or not now plagues you. And you're thinking, I can't leave this person because I'm now codependent. See, these are all things that trading books just aren't going to talk about. But that's the reality of it. And I lived all that shit. And I wish that I would have had someone tackle them you know, in discussions where I could start putting things together as a, a, a process or a protocol to respond to them. How will I, how would you act if your if you're life partner, the one that you have set aside the rest of your life to be with, you discovered, not maybe proof, but discovered the likelihood of infidelity. What would that do to your mind? How would you, how would you think about things, not just them and your relationship, but how would you think about yourself? Am I not good enough? Why would they want to do it with any, anybody else? What am I not doing for them? Why aren't they appreciating what I'm doing? You know, did I have did I perhaps offend them to the point where you know I, I've maybe lost my appeal physically? Did I give them a reason to think that I'm doing this? You're going to have all these questions, and what is it going to do? It's going to fester inside of you. And for some of you that don't have the confidence or openness in your relationship, say, hey. Let's talk about something. I need to get this figured out here. You're going to be the ones that have it worse because it's, you're going to keep it to yourself thinking if I mention it and it ain't true, they're going to get angry. And they're going to think, oh, you're thinking that because you're doing it. You, know, you see how all these things can compound? And all these swirling what if thinking that may or may not be true are going to cause you to feel what? Uncomfortable. And that uncomfortable state of mind in a trading account is the devil's playground. Man, you give him a moment to step into that account. During those times, you are getting wrecked. Do you have the composition to say, hey, I'm not thinking clearly right now. I don't care how it looks on that chart. I don't care how long I've been waiting for that setup. If things aren't right in your mind, you don't push that button. Some of you aren't going to have that strength. Because that's what it is. It's strength. You have to sort your personal shit before you get in here and start risking money. Because a, a clouded mind that's wrestling with uncertainties that are outside the chart, when you're about to take on financial risk, Wrestling with financial uncertainty. What have you just done? You've compounded the difficulty to levels that are astronomical. Are you really going to be able to think about it clearly? If you are wrestling with, you know, if, if, the, if he is cheating, if she is cheating, if they do give that promotion to Carl, that motherfucker, all that stuff that you're worrying about, and then now you're in a trade and your trade isn't going for you. Right away, and you're in a little bit of drawdown. That little bit of drawdown, that three ticks or three handles, and your stop loss is 10. And you're thinking, oh, shit, this is going to turn on me. Why would you think that? Because everything else in the world right now is coming down on you like a ton of bricks. You can't trade that way effectively. You can't. And to do it, you're asking yourself to start becoming an Olympic boxer today, and you've never pay, never had a pair of boxing gloves on in your life. That's the equivalence of it. That's like going and saying, "Yeah, let me uh, let me spar Mike Tyson in his fucking prime." Yeah, I feel I feel lucky. <laughs> yeah, sure you. <yeah. laughs> and that's how many times, and this is exactly what I did when I was younger. You think, "Oh, it's going to work out for me." And, you know, I feel lucky today. Yeah, I'm lucky I survived. That's about the extent of it. And you wreck yourself entirely. It's so easy to talk yourself into problematic 
situations. And it's so hard to guard yourself from them. Think about it. You do it every day in your personal life. You invite yourself into conversations you should damn well know you shouldn't be a part of. You're trying to mind everybody else's fucking business but your own. And you want to be good at trading. You're going to hurt yourself. Those, those same characteristics are going to, what many times, prevent you from being successful. I'm telling you, if I would have put all this stuff in a book for trading, it would have been the least purchased book. But for people that have tried to trade and lost money, it would be such a highly reviewed book because they would be able to say, you know what, that's exactly how I fucked up. But you're not going to see it that way. I'm not sure if you heard all that vibration. I just realized my head was against the pillow. I'm on my big ass sectional down in the, the basement. And I got real comfortable here and laid my head back. So I was rubbing the head back and forth. As I'm, I'm talking about my hands, like I said. As I did that, my head's moving around and my Bose headset was rubbing against this pillow. So if you heard all kinds of noise, I apologize for that. But let's see what time it is here. I'll go till 12. That's good enough for the last one, right? But there's so much more to trading than, than just simply finding a good entry uh, strategy or a bias filter. It, it's predominantly around you as the person. And I came into trading with all kinds of baggage. And it just, I was the poster boy for everything to have in your repertoire at your disposal to guarantee failure. When I first started to do this stuff, it was all in my back pocket. It was ready to be taken out at any time. I was a card-carrying member of the loser society, and I was trying to do everything I can to win this woman back. So I can tell from experience, I can preach it from personal experience, that those types of things don't equate to success. I had to find a value in myself outside of her. And in today's society, and it's a shame because social media has really cultivated a lot of this bullshit, it's not a good thing. It's, it's meant to divide us. It's meant to cause us to be toxic to one another, invent hateful, spiteful things because the person that's saying it is just a vile creature that's not happy with themselves right now. People that are successful, you know what the number one characteristic is? They want to help other people, and they have very little to say bad about anyone else. Think about it. You know it's true. If they have all this time and energy to talk negative about other people, they couldn't possibly be happy. They couldn't possibly be content with where they're at in life. They couldn't be. I don't have time to spend on tearing down somebody else. I might throw a ribbing joke about you know someone using an indicator or whatnot, but I'm not going to spend my lifetime you know, trying to tear somebody down. I got too much positivity going on. I'm too mu I'm too much of a positive person to live that way. And some of you are going to discover that you aren't prepared for success, even though you might reach it faster than you expected. And you're going to start doing things toxically, outwardly on social media, to other people, and you're going to try to do your dick measuring. And that's a number one reason why women are better traders. Better traders. I didn't say that the men can't make more money on par because the only reason why that happens is because they over leverage and gamble. Women generally don't gamble. They do gamble. They're, they're capable of gambling. But women are better risk managers. Men are greater and better risk takers. Now, I'm not impressed when someone over leverages something and says, look at this. I made this much money. OK, what is your strike rate? How much drawdown do you incur and how often do you trade? Because my interest is, is in excellence. You see what I do. That's fucking poetry. OK, that is so pretty to watch. And I don't give a shit with it. where you came from, how you like to trade. Ask anybody when they watch my execution. It's too good to be fucking true. And that's not arrogance. That's not me puffing myself up. I've worked very, very hard 
to get to this degree. Okay, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes a great deal of prayer. It takes a great deal of trusting and waiting on the Lord to give me the ability to do it. That's where it comes from. It didn't happen real quick for me. I wasn't able at year six to trade like I can trade right now. I had fixed only the physical things in me, the mental barriers. That's how long it took me to get out of my own way, six years. And then I had to get comfortable with what I understood what I should be focusing on. Three and a half years after that. That's when I was locked and loaded. But as a person, figuring myself out, it took me six years. It was painful. Nobody was telling me to, you know, hey, look, buddy, come over here to my chat room and I'll encourage you today. <laughs> that wasn't happening. That wasn't happening, man. It's hard. And you have so many advantages today. None of you have the right to claim depression. None of you have the right to claim unfairness. None of you have the right to say it's not fair that bull fucking shit. That's bullshit. You have a PhD level library, a compendium of stuff out there that people now are making real doctor fucking salaries with. It's at your fingertips. And some of you are wrestling and arguing with me. Can you make it shorter? Oh, really? You want to go into medical school? You want to get your PhD? Ask them if they can condense that fucking shit into an associate's degree for you time-wise. What, what kind of response are you going to get? Get the fuck out of here. Get your ass out of here, you fucking lazy ass. Because that's what that is. You can't be lazy in this industry. You cannot because it will take your ass out like the trash. It will get rid of you. It will discard you. Goodbye. It's unsettling when you discover. That's how it is. But you need to be told that coming in, and I tell you this. And you don't like me because I'm being honest with you, but I'm sorry. You need to understand that. You need to know those things. That's exactly how I tell my sons. The world owes you nothing. It owes you fuck all. You are going to get what you earn. And even when you earn it, it will probably be stolen from you. And you'll have to work harder to fucking replace it. This world is a bunch of shit. Think about it. Think about this for a second. You pay taxes on money that you earn. Then you're taxed on the money that you're taxed for earning when you buy shit. The money you have left over pays for a fucking property that you own. You have a deed to. But they tax you on the property that you fucking own that you paid taxes when you fucking bought it and you received the deed on income that you were taxed. And you don't think there's a fucking scam in that? You have to know how to outpace these motherfuckers. Your college degree ain't it. That's not the fucking solution. That in itself is an IQ test. Either you're going to be your own boss or you're going to be a good fucking slave. And some of you good slaves can be paid very, very well, but you're still a fucking slave. And you're willing to submit to whatever fucking costs and lifetime mortgages, the equivalent of, for student debt on a college degree, on a career that you might not even like doing once you get there. How certain are you that you're going to invest all that time, all that energy, all that fucking money that you're going to have to pay back? And you can't write that off with a uh, bankruptcy. Student debt. You're fucking stuck with it. And Biden just told you, fuck off. I'm not paying off nothing. They do that shit to get your vote, man. You're manipulated constantly. All the time. All the time. In this world, you have to be shrewd. You have to be diligent. You have to bust your ass. But there's a way to work hard 
and there's a, wor a way to work hard and smart. When you work hard, you're going to work hard the rest of your fucking life. But if you work hard and smart, you only have to work hard and smart in the beginning. And once you figure out what it is that you're supposed to be doing for yourself, being your own entrepreneur, and trading is the last bastion for that. And you can start with next to nothing. Reading people going off about, oh, you're only going to give a trading system to the rich people. Are you out of your fucking mind? Why would I give a trading platform a setup like that? To someone that hasn't even done the work of being a profitable demo trader. Am I a good steward of what I've been given as money? If I just give it to somebody? What, what was you expecting? Pick a number and if you're right, you fucking win like it's a lottery? No. The whole time I've been here, I've been trying to actively teach people. And if you know how to do this, I'll give you a perfect example. Top step. They do a, a $50,000, $49 um, fee for it, okay? And if my memory serves me correct, I think K, uh, Cameron was paying like 150 bucks to um, once he passed his combine. Or, or I don't know if it's is, – is it combine? Or is combine with, when you get it when you're funded? One, one of the two. You, it's $49 to try to get to a point where you're funded. And then before you can get the funded part – you had to pay the, the – the, what is it? It's like a startup fee. It's, like, it, it's another way for them to make money. It's what the fuck it is. But long and short is it's just a $200 investment. So if you're saying that you can't afford to take this contest that I presented to get a $4,000 setup delivered to your fucking house on my dime, this company isn't doing it for free. I have no affiliate. This has come out of my fucking money. It's my reward to somebody that does the work and gives me a memory of saying, okay, this was my student. Well done. Not only are you going to make your own fucking money, but I'm going to reward you for your effort in showing me in the community that you did well with it. But it has to be done in a manner where it's one trade, one specific setup, not milly-milly shit, okay? Not over-leveraging, not a lot of drawdown. So that means you've got to go into it with a mindset. It takes effort to do this. That's what real professional traders do anyway. They're not here fucking gambling. So if you're saying that I can't afford a $200 funded account, you can't afford to fucking trade. And if nobody's told you that, let me be that first guy to do it. You can't afford to trade. Your high, your, 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 your high and lofty ideas that you think that you're going to get there somehow, like it's going to magically fall in your lap, that's not going to happen. You're going to have to earn it. And that's the problem with fucking social media because there's so many entitlement motherfuckers running around thinking everything's owed to them. You need to give it to me because you have it. You better give it to me or you're an asshole. You're a piece of shit because you didn't give it to me. Whoever earns this, whoever wins it, watch. There's going to be people that are going to shit on them because they're fucking spiteful. And social media cultivated that. It gives them the, real, the ability to talk shit that they would never say to their fucking face on the street. Have their fucking head slapped the fuck off their shoulders. You can't win on social media. You can give them your fucking last penny. Give them the winning lottery numbers for fucking two years in a row, and they're still going to find fault with you. <laughs> they're miserable pieces of shit. So how are you gonna, why are you going to waste more time with them? Don't. But all of this compounds into a, a very complex thing that you have to balance as a trader. Are you going to be somebody that's constant, constantly worrying about staying in, in model, staying inside the parameters that you've allowed for, for risk, keeping a proper mindset, not worrying about minding somebody else's business, trying to keep up with the Joneses, you know, trying to keep up with everybody else that's out there trying to pretend, and you don't even know if the results they're pretending that is real, is even real. You know, my FX books and MT4 and MT5 screenshots are absolute fucking bullshit for proof. It's bullshit. If they're going to have the initiative to take all that time to show you screenshots of profits, okay, 
and they have not been interviewed and paid out by other companies where you can see they are getting paid real money. If all you ever see is a screenshot of bullshit supposed profits, even if there is a fucking withdrawal, you don't know if that's fucking real. Show a fucking history of trades where you get in, you manage the trades, and there it is. If you see that, and if you're one of these people that are listening to me, you know, I still want to pay for somebody to teach me or pay for somebody to do me signals or whatever. If you're willing to give somebody any money and they've never shown you that, you're a fucking idiot. You are an idiot. You deserve. You deserve to be fleeced. You're a sheep. Because if nothing you've not learned in the last two years with me is that you have to see it be done, it outlined beforehand. And you know what? My students that can do that. They're the first ones in fucking line raising their hand. Let me be the one to beat your fucking ass. Come at me, motherfucker. Let me be the one to show my trades against yours. And they all shut the fuck up, don't they? Isn't that funny? That's why they don't like our fucking community, because we're a bunch of fucking savages. We'll kick your fucking shit in, okay? That's the way it is around here. And if you're not there at that stage yet, you fucking will be. Just keep showing up and doing the work. Once you understand what you're doing, ain't a fucking person going to take away what you know how to do. It's confidence. It's fucking confidence. That is not arrogance. That's not arrogance. Learn the fucking definitions. Confidence is saying, I don't give a shit what anybody fucking thinks or says. I know I'm getting mine. I know how I'm getting it. And I know what the fuck time I'm getting it, too. That's a level of confidence that's not known before. You're all part of that shit now. You live it. That should be fucking celebrated. Who the fuck's got a problem with that? Seriously. Little Dick Daniels. That's who fucking has a problem with it. They can't do it themselves, so they're going to try to shit on you. And guess what? It doesn't even work. It doesn't even fucking work. You're bulletproof. You're fucking Teflon coated. These motherfuckers can't stick no shit on you. You've already been here. You've already seen it. You're doing it in your own hands. How the fuck is anybody going to convince you that what you're doing right now ain't it? This is it. This is what everybody, everybody wants to be able to feel this way when they get into trading. They want to feel the confidence knowing that, yep, this is a time for me not to trade right now. I don't give a shit what it does. I'm confident that I'm doing the right thing by not doing something. And when it's time to do something, I'm going to stomp a mud hole in its ass and walk it dry. And I ain't got no worries about it. I don't give a shit how many people learn what I'm doing. When the market's going down, there's people short and there's people buying it. There's stops always going to be above an old high. There's going to be stops below an old low. Always. It doesn't fucking matter if the fucking people in 10 bucks fucking two know my name or not. This fucking shit's going to be the same way. Why are you worried about shit that ain't going to fucking be an impediment? You're looking for an excuse to not do it. That's all this is. That's all this is. If you are worried about this algorithm being changed, if you're worried about that, you are literally manifesting your internal fears of wasting time, a little bit of your time, because you don't have the wherewithal to stick with it. That's the truth. That's exactly what it is. How do I know that? Because I've had students before I started doing it with paid mentorship for years that had that same characteristic. And the ones that were honest, they came out and said, you know what, I'm not going to be able to stick with this because I, I, I won't be able to stick with it. Well, well done. That takes a great deal of honesty, and I'm, I'm proud that you have the, the, the conviction to come forward and say, you know what, this isn't for you. That takes, that takes inventory on a person. You've got to be honest. You've got to be comfortable in your own skin. So you know what, this is above my capabilities, and I'm not willing to – to, to invest any time because I know I'm not going to stay with it. That's why most people don't want, they don't join a gym. They don't join a gym. That's why they don't have a home gym. They don't have these things that are going to help them be healthy. Why? Because they know themselves. They're not going to fucking join that program because they're going to waste their time and money because they know they're not going to stick with it. That's exactly what goes on when people come here and they try it for a fucking week and they say, this doesn't work, it's a scam. But 
How do you explain this to people over here? And how do you explain this? And how do you explain the fact that I called this shit and it turns on a fucking dime to the tick? And it goes exactly where the fuck I said it was going to go. Against everybody else on YouTube's expectations. Proven. Uh, well, I don't have any comment there. We're not going to say anything about that. But you're a scammer. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. That's some good stuff. <laughs> oh, man. That's good. That's good. I love it. I love it. I'm still sipping this uh, 68 degree cocoa. How do you know it's 68 degrees, ICT? Because I keep my house at 68 degrees. So, anyway, I'm not sure if you can hear it in my voice, <laughs> but I am in the holiday spirit. Like, I am so happy to know that when I'm done this evening, I have done everything I said I was going to do. I have shared what I said I was going to share. I have created profitable students. I have created profitable, respectful students that conduct themselves like gentlemen that actually care about their audience members, not just going out there flaunting that they can make a lot of money. And I'm proud of all of you. Omar, Kyle, Paladin, just the thing, the top three comes to mind. And there's so many more. And if I don't name your name, don't be offended because I could literally be fucking here forever. The fact that you care enough for your communities like you do and for the people that spend the time listening to you. Uh, that That's something that I was really concerned about because, as I mentioned earlier in this Twitter space, the way I made myself marketable is I had to be polarizing. I had to create a faction, a split, a division, knowing that it would create ripples. And those ripples would be, okay, you're either Team ICT or not Team ICT. And the ones that don't like me are going to sell me more than anybody else will. Because you all want to come here and watch me do something wrong. And I've enjoyed denying you that. <laughs> and you're just still waiting. Still waiting. But even despite seeing me market myself like that, being very polarizing, you as my students have learned the right lessons and you didn't have to pattern yourself on the, some of the things I use in the early stages of me getting a community because I use the train wreck analogy or car wreck. Okay. Uh, if I can, if I could create some kind of a stir with someone that had a bigger audience member, you know, base, the larger audience subscriber base, and I could stand right in front of them and say this, that, and either one of two things are going to happen. And this is usually what happened. I got banned, you know, blocked or whatever. And they would never look at what I'm saying, but it didn't change the fact that I would still talk about them. And, and all people were like, you know, he does have a point. Why don't you do this? Why don't we ever see your trades? And then it just became where they would just, you know, clam up about everything. So what I wanted to see was a real one, a real McCoy step forward and say, yeah, I got a problem to this. I can show you this. And that's that's what this industry needs. Like this, this industry needs not somebody going out there and fucking saying, I got $10,000, you so-and-sos. Um, I don't think there's a fucking edge. But look at all these glass fucking trophies that mean fuck all. Okay? <laughs> it doesn't mean shit to me. It doesn't mean shit to anybody else. It doesn't mean fucking nothing. It means nothing. It means absolutely nothing. Going into a chart that's live, explaining what it's going to do before it does it, Point to exactly what the fuck it's going to do before it fucking does it and push the fucking button and manage a stop loss and take it down. That, that demands respect. Whether you're trading with fucking horseshoe crab fucking patterns, whether you're trading moving averages, whether you're trading harmonic, whatever the fuck you're using, it doesn't matter. If someone does that, I have respect for that person. It doesn't matter what school of thought they use. I have respect. For that person, because that person's walking that talk. They're doing it. 
They're not talking from the anonymity of, well, trust me, bro. The fuck is trust me, bro? The fuck's that mean? How am I going to do that? I ain't seen anything to trust. I have created this mindset in my students that they know that everybody that came to me, not, was, not one of you came to me because of an ad. Not one of my, made, my paid mentorship students came to me by advertisement. They watched me do what you've been watching me do, execute over and over and over again. And you see the same things repeating. And you wanted to know, how did I do that? And you learned. I showed you exactly what I do, how I do it, when it, when it happens. That's how you all found me, word of mouth. And now you can tell who my students are. They're the ones out there fucking smashing it. They're out there the ones that are going to show you their executions. They don't have a problem starting a trade, showing it to you. They want to. They want to shove it up your fucking ass, twist it sideways, okay? They ain't worried about it. They know that what they're going to do is going to work. They're not afraid of it. Now, compass, com, uh, compare and contrast that with what everybody else has been trying to avoid doing on Twitter, on Facebook, and on Instagram. They want to give you just enough to let you think that they're profitable. But they can't prove that they can execute under live data. I, again, I said this before. And I'm going to say it again. It doesn't matter to me. I've been doing this a very, very long time. If it's demo or if it's live, I don't give a shit because it still has to be done with live data. You have to know what it's going to do before it happens. You, you can't escape that. So if anybody is willing to do that for you and you can see that they're consistently able to employ what it is they're teaching or supposedly teaching as a conceptual idea – then that person has earned, number one, the respect from me because that's something that 99% of these fuckers out there that are trying to sell something won't ever do for you. They'll only show you the after. Here's, here's what I did, bro. Trust me, bro. I made this. Oh, I, I, would, I would eat you both. <laughs> Bring your shit, man. Bring it. All that stuff means nothing means nothing until you can do. The doing is what matters. Talking about what you did, nobody can believe that anymore. Look at AI. They can make somebody sound and, and, and look like they're doing whatever the fuck they want them to do. You can't trust that. But guess what you can trust? You have somebody come out there before the fact, say, the market's going to go here. And then you watch them with live data, execute. With a live fucking account, all of a sudden, you have a problem now, don't you? How the fuck could someone time travel, point to it beforehand, a week, a week before it happens? Not just one minute. See, I, I've slapped these guys around for two years. Oh, yeah, he's, he's got a delay. You know, that's why he's using a one minute chart because he can do this and watch. I can, I can call this and I can call that. You, know, you can't. You can't replicate what I'm doing. And I've, I've, I've openly challenged it. Like, come on. I want to see it. I, I would love to see it. I would love to see it. Even if you got marginally close, one half of it, I still I love watching people trade. Not for the sake of watching them wreck themselves. I'm talking about people that know how to trade. I, I wish there was more of it. I love it. To me, that's much more entertaining than watching some fuckers running around in some pajamas chasing some pigskin. That did not make no fucking sense to me. That don't make any sense to me. Football. NFL. Fucking stupid. You're making people rich watching people injure, injure themselves. That's dumb. But trading to me, that's like really watching mental chess on a battlefield where – you have everything to lose. Pride, ego. You, you lose face in, in the front of your, your subscriber base. And you have everything to earn. Respect, glory, pride. Not that pride's a good thing, but you get to be able to say, I told you so. And do you really know what you're doing? Because if you really know what you're doing, you're actively trying to prove it. You're actively trying to prove it. By contrast, 
Now, there's somebody going to say, no, that's not true because I know what I'm doing and I don't ever feel that. Okay, got it. I got you, man. I got you. There's a lot of you out there that are going to be like that. But I'm talking about the ones that constantly make an excuse why they, I don't have time to do it right now. Or when they do try it, they fail miserably in the witness of you publicly. So we have, with the spearheading of my own, we have raised the bar up in the industry. You cannot accept MT4 screenshots. You cannot accept, uh, accept an MT5 screenshot. You cannot accept a MyFX book because those fucking things can be rigged. But you know what you can't rig? Getting fucking paid. <laughs> Getting a fucking withdrawal. Paid. Interviewed by a fucking firm that paid you out and they are saying, what the hell are you doing that you're so good? Hello? Hello? That's our boys. That's our girls. That's our, that's our team. That's us. We are fucking here. And just because I'm parking my old ass and retiring doesn't mean you get to sit on yours. I'm watching all of you. I'm watching all of you. And the next king is coming up out of our community, not anywhere else. So hopefully you're inspired. Hopefully you're encouraged. And I've given you something to hang your hopes and sights on going into the new year next year. There's a lot of shit going on in the world. I hope you're making your house ready. One of the best things you can do is inform yourself. Prepare yourself. Because things are going to get real, real uncomfortable here soon. And what you think is a constant, which is a weekly paycheck or bi-weekly paycheck, that might not be enough for you. And you're going to have to have a skill set that you can lean on. And trading doesn't have to be an everyday work day. You don't need to do that every day. Try to keep your costs low, your commission costs low, your trade frequency low, and try to trade with the highest quality setup. Let that be your primary focus when you're taking trades, not quantity. Quantity, that's not important. Quality is. You're going to be far less stressed when things start ramping up here soon. What am I talking about? Well, if you watch and listen to my Twitter spaces last year, I told you some real drama is coming. And my students have been with me a long time. I told you in 2020, war is coming. It's coming, and it's coming to our soil. They've invited it. It's going to come here, and it's going to affect everybody, and it's going to affect the marketplaces, not any one particular, but all of them. And when it gets like that, you need to be patient and sit still. It's going to be periods where you're not going to be able to trade and try to just wait and relax. These people are greedy. Their casino, they won't leave it closed forever. But they're going to disrupt it for a little bit. You've been told this years in advance. Don't be scared when it happens. But don't try to live above your means. Living above your means, spending money you can't afford to spend. That's not what you should be doing right now. You shouldn't be out there buying cars. You shouldn't be out there buying horse shit. You should be making your house ready. You have food. You have food for two years, non-perishable food. I talked about it last year. I'm telling you, if you don't have it, 2024, when we, as we roll into 2024, and it could happen sooner, but as we go into 2024, that 18-month time limit I gave you last summer, we're in that right now. All kinds of shit is a break, break loose. And guess what that means? Commodity markets are going to go through the roof. See, 2024 ain't going to be just an S&P win for me. I have all kinds of shit that can be used. I don't need S&P. They could keep S&P in a locked, narrow range for months. I don't need that. I can trade a silver bullet in copper and cotton. Live cattle. 
See, once you know what you're doing, if it trades, it can be traded with the same thing. You have a cookie cutter. You can go out there and just simply stamp your cookie cutter into whatever dough is out there and take it home. And don't try to take more than that cookie cutter is designed to do. That's peace of mind. That's you not trying to make it an Olympic effect or event, rather. And for some of you, when things start really kicking off and violence is everywhere, because it will be violent, you're going to want to feel good and comforted, and you're going to look to the markets to do that for you. I'm telling you and reminding you, don't. Don't. Don't take exorbitant risks. Don't risk what you don't have to, to lose. If you, every bit of money you have right now, you have to be very good stewards with. If you're going to the clubs on the weekends, you're a fucking idiot. If you're buying recreational vehicles or additional vehicles, you're a fucking idiot. You're trying to get the, the latest, latest bling. You're a fucking idiot. Believe me, you're all going to know just how accurate Chicken Little's been. Because when this fucking shit starts falling down on all of us, my money isn't going to protect me. It's not going to protect me. Yours ain't going to protect you. In a moment, they can turn your access off to your money. What about the money you have over at that uh, funded account company that uh, just got tapped by the CFTC? Did you, did you get your payout? Still waiting for it? Think you'll ever get it? Are you assured that you ever will? What happens if you never get it? Does your life get impacted by that? Or is it your mind scrambled over it and now you're all messed up? See, that's what the intended purposes are when they start disrupting things. And central bank digital currencies become a real thing here. They're saying cash is always going to be available, digital and real. That's a lie. Because as soon as it all goes to the central bank digital currency, cash will be made illegal. And then they own all of us. Your money has an expiration date. If you don't spend it, you lose it. If you don't listen to them, you do things on social media they don't like. It's like in China, they say you can't spend anything or they limit what you can spend. You can't buy that. It's only good for this. That sounds like welfare, doesn't it? Doesn't it sound like welfare? It's worse. Control somebody's ability to get food and feed their family, and you own them. You own them. And you're out here trying to get physical things. Cars, boats, overpriced bullshit Rolex watches. Rolex is shit. It's trash. Get up attack. Then you're talking about a real watch. <sighs> I so want to talk about other things. I'm going to do this. I've said everything I said today about the trading. So if you're not interested in anything beyond that, just know that I have greatly appreciated your interest in my life's work. I have appreciated your continued engagement as part of our community, and I wish you nothing but success. I wish you all the blessings that the Lord could lay on you with the information he's given me. I hope that it helps you and your family. I hope it keeps you and helps provide for you. I, it's been my intent to help all of you to do that, and I want all of you, even the ones that don't like me, I want all of you to succeed. I want you all to be spared from all the things that are coming 
But I want to transition to a, a, a topic that some of you aren't going to like, okay? But it, I, I feel like I have to talk about it because I have to. But if you're not interested in anything outside of trading, this is the time when you can turn off the, the Twitter space and bid me farewell and or tell me go fuck off. <laughs> Whatever. You, anything, you can say anything you want on your last day, right? But uh, – The last time we, we, we sat down and I, I kind of like went over some things about what I believe, we talked for like six hours. And it didn't feel like six hours for me. And I, I wish I would have kind of like kept, kept going. But I, I know it's kind of hard to watch or listen to something like that because it's so long. And it was about topics I'm sure you were hoping that I would break away from and go back into to trading. But I'm not going to talk about trading anymore in this Twitter space. So you're welcome to you know, depart from it. I don't even care how many leave or, or whatever. But if I got one person listening to me, it's fine. And, you know, that's who I'm talking to. But the we went through a, a, a series of things that I believe that are, are proven historically, not just in the Bible, but the, the idea of, you know, Timing things. God's a date setter. Okay, I'm not sure if you know it or not, but um, just like these markets, are, they're all ran on time. Everything's ran on time. You know, your life is ran on time. You know, you know, if you have wisdom, you know, you'll count the number of your days, you know, realizing that we're just like a vapor here, one minute and gone the next. But when you're young, like I was when I was 20, you, know, you feel like you're going to live forever. You don't. You don't understand or identify your immortality. You just think, you know, I have plenty of time left. And there was a period of time when I was afraid of dying. I was afraid of, was death going to hurt? Would it be a long, terrible experience? Or would I be spared that? Or would I just go in a, I thought I would go in a car accident, to be honest with you. I had lots of car accidents. They were my fault, mostly, uh, except for one where I was sitting in the, a red light with my wife. They came right from the other direction and <laughs> didn't even turn the wheel. This, instead of turning left, they came right in and, and smashed into me and they switched seats and they didn't have car insurance. So they totaled my car and their car and it was all out of palco for me. So the, the idea of time, well, time is a physical property. And when you understand that, um, a lot of things come to light as well. And I, I shared with you one of the, my mentors as a, as a Bible teacher, which is uh, the, the late Chuck Missler, Dr. Chuck Missler. Um, but I also mentioned that I don't subscribe to everything that he, he subscribes to. But what I loved most about his, his teachings were that he treated the Bible as it, um, and that the Bible was an integrated message system. Outside our time domain, that's like kind of like his uh, his slogan, and uh, that really resonated with me. And I've always been interested in prophecy. I've always been in, in interested in eschatology, end time events, and things. And there's lots of commentaries that were written a long a long time ago that you may have read if you're someone of this persuasion where you like to you know, read stuff. Chances are, majority of you listening probably aren't even interested about what I'm about to say. And if you are still staying on, you're going to start falling off <laughs> and turning off the Twitter space. And I get it. I understand. But um, we walked through a couple things scripturally where I kind of like made a challenge for those that are my students that are Jews. You know, you, you as a culture, you believe in. Yahweh, you knew the, you knew the God of the Old Testament. And you believe in Moses and you believe in the prophets. And uh, your God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And so is mine. But your departure from our agreement and who we believe in is divided by Christ. Because you expected to see a conquering Messiah, which he's coming. <laughs> He's coming, but you omitted and didn't recognize Isaiah chapter 53, 
where it describes he's coming as a suffering servant first. In history itself records that there was only one person that was ever crucified, and that was Jesus. And he's the only one that died and resurrected himself. Buddha didn't do it. Didn't, it didn't happen. Okay. Um, and when I walked everyone that was willing to listen, I didn't get any emails that I could see. And I get lots of emails, but uh, usually some of the email titles are very inflaming. I got a lot of them from uh, a lot of Muslim listeners. And you didn't understand when I was asking. I was asking for your participation in the conversation because I was trying to have an open dialogue with because there's some things I want to learn and I, I can't learn any better than the, pre, the people that actually live and practice Islam. So I was asking you know, for a participation and, and some of them are upset. I mean, for instance, that girl Mona, you know, she's out there. From my understanding, I think she's a lesbian. And if I'm incorrect by saying I apologize, but my understanding is doesn't Islam frown on lesbianism? Like, how is she going to defend Islam and, and talk about me? When I was asking the community at, at large that were Muslim, do they see this? Because I, I was looking at it and studying it, and I can't, I can't read Arabic. Like, I don't know what it, you know, what it means when it, when it has that stuff written out. But uh, I caught a lot of flack for that. So on the same coin, but just the opposite side, I was looking to see if there was any Jewish listeners that had a response for what we went through in Genesis chapter 5, where it literally goes from Adam to Noah. And you look at their names and the meaning of their names, it talks about, you know, man is a man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God. Now think about it, the blessed God shall come down, teaching his death shall bring. How can God die? God's the eternal spirit. So he has to come and place himself in the form of flesh, which is the only thing about God that can die. That's what makes the son of God. It's not God the son. It's the son of God, the humanity of Christ. So I didn't get any – that I could tell. You know, I, I'm, I'm ready to be corrected by someone re-forwarding an email. Maybe they reached out to me because I was actively really interested in, in to see the response in that. But um, – to me, I think it's astonishing. Like, how can you not see Christ in that as a Jew? How can you not see that? I mean, I can understand because when Palm Sunday occurred, you know, Christ basically was holding them accountable, but they didn't recognize that day because they he, they should have known the very day he was riding in, proclaiming to be the Messiah. And how do, how does that happen? Well, before I get into that. Here's Jesus wrote, you know, riding on a donkey saying, hey, look, you know, there's so many times that I, you know, I wanted to shelter you and preserve you and, and give you peace. But because you have not recognized the day of your visitation, what's he talking about? He was holding them personally as a nation accountable that they didn't know. That was the very day he was showing up as the Messiah. He held them accountable to that, so much so that he spiritually blinded them. And you wonder why a Jew can't see Jesus as their Messiah. That's a miracle right there. That's proving that Christ is who he said he was. Because if you take a Jew to Isaiah 53, it's astonishing how they don't see Jesus in that. And how can you, uh, how can you wrestle with Genesis chapter 5 in the genealogy from Adam to Noah – their, name, their names literally spell out the gospel of Christ. And for the Muslims to say Jesus wasn't God, that right there tells you. Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God. Not God's, not one of three. The blessed God, the Father himself, was going to come down teaching his death. His what? Jesus didn't die? Yeah, he did. His death shall bring the despairing comfort or rest is what that means. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I mean, it, it tells you that's, that's exactly what that is. I told my memberships in my private mentorship in uh, 2020 when that whole COVID crap started. I said that uh, you need to start watching Israel. 
and we're about to see Ezekiel 38, 39 come to pass. And I told them, I said, Russia and Turkey and Iran are going to make a move. And they are the very nations in those chapters of Ezekiel that are never in history ever been allies before, but they are right now. What's the, what's the probabilities of that? With everything else that's going on in the world, you know, one could argue, say, well, you know, <laughs> nations can, can fortify you know, a union together. It's, it's, what's the big deal about that? And most people, most people, if they're being honest, not publicly, most people have a, uh, a, a, a distaste for Israel being there too. Now, I'm going to share my opinion, okay? And my opinion is based on what I believe that the Bible teaches. And because I place my faith in that, if you want to call me, you know, whatever you want to call me, I'm okay with it, okay? I'm not trying to convince anybody here. I'm just sharing, and you have been invited to leave the conversation if it's something you're not interested in. So if you stay here, you have listened to this because you wanted to. But I'm going to compare and contrast Islam, Judaism, and Christianity. And I have something that's going to offend all three of them, I'm certain. It's not my intent to offend. It's my intent to try to cause you to think about it. And while I may not be in social media active today, I will be reading tweets to me. And if you can share what you think or what you believe, whether you're in agreement or disagreement, and you can do it respectfully, I will read your tweet. I actively want to read it. I'm not trying to say a one-sided conversation and then say, here it is, and there's nothing else. I'm just admitting to you up front that you're not going to sway me. And I am aware that everything I'm sharing as my own testimony or my belief is in no way whatsoever going to convert you. I'm not going to convert you. Okay? I'm not going to convert you from Islam. I'm not going to convert you from Judaism. Okay? But know this, that there is no God outside of Christ. That's him. He came in the flesh. So because I'm telling you that no matter what response you give me, whether it be disrespectful or respectful, I prefer it to be respectful because I like to I like to see cordial conversation. Okay? That's the problem with religion. Religion turns the ability to have a civilized conversation into war. And I can have an opinion that's different from all of you. And we can still have a conversation, knowing that this was your side, which I'm interested in. I want to hear the perspective. Like when you see, as if you're a Jew, what do you what do you think about that with Isaiah 53? How do you not see Christ on the cross there? How do you how do you not see him on the cross like that? Because when he comes back at his second coming, that is your Messiah that you were expecting as a nation of Israel. You're expecting that Messiah, but you've omitted or um, ignored, for lack of a better word, the suffering servant Messiah aspect that he had to come first to, to die for sin. What do you think about Genesis chapter 5? You know, Can you shoot holes in that? Because you're going to know um, Hebrew better than I am, right? So if those names don't really mean that, or if they do, what do you do with that as a Jew? And as a Muslim, what do you do with that that says that God himself is coming down to die for sin? Which wrecks the whole argument that many Islam believers try to say that Christ really didn't die. He didn't really die on the cross. When that's the whole basis of believing in Christianity. I mean, if you take away the crucifixion and the resurrection, there's no hope for any of us. None of us can escape our sin then. We'll all die in our sin if we don't have faith in that because there's no answer for sin. No other religion has an answer for it. How are Jews right now? How are they making uh, atonement for their sin? There's no temple. What's going on? You know, they're in a jackpot. <laughs> Something wrong, right? But so my point is this. Is I, I, I was talking to my, my best friend, Sean, who is a Christian. Um, he, he was going to churches you know, longer and earlier than I did. And, I did. and we, we get into conversations you know, from, from time to time about eschatology, which is the study of end time events. And 
doctrine, um, theology, and uh, the Godhead, because he wrestled with the Trinity. He started as a Trinitarian and discovered that th there isn't a Trinity, but there is a Godhead. Okay, And a Godhead is not three people. It's three roles, just like I am a father to Cameron. I'm a mentor to you if you're a, a trading student. And I am a husband to my wife. How many Michaels does it take to do that? It's just me. So whenever you look for three in the Bible, okay, um, this is how I side with Judaism, and this is how I side with Islam, that there is only one God. There's one. There's not three. It's not three persons in, in, in the Trinity. It's one God that came down and created a body, born of a woman under the law that was allowing him to be tempted just like all of us. He was tempted just like we are every single day. But he didn't sin. Why? Because the Father in him, that, that Holy Spirit, because that's what he is, God's an invisible spirit, that the angels finally saw the face of, that's why they rejoiced in the, in the fields when Mary gave birth. They rejoiced and sang. Why? Because they saw the face of God. No angel ever saw the face of God. He inhabited the light, but he, they couldn't approach him. Who's the closest angel to God that, that would get close to God? Lucifer. That's why he was prideful, because he was the anointed cherub that covered all other angels. He had the highest authority next to God. There wouldn't be anything else except for whatever he said. So when God said, okay, look, it's time. Draw them, draw them to me. Let's go. When Lucifer called them, they all came. And because they saw him and he had the authority over them, he was prideful. So I go back and forth with, while I believe that even Lucifer didn't see God's face, I believe if any angel would have seen it, it would have been him because he was allowed to be the closest to God. That's what makes him the tree, as we talked about in the last time we were talking about the, the scripture. That's what makes Lucifer the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Because how could he know good? What's good? He was the closest to God and yet still rebelled against him. Because every other angel that did the will of God, wouldn't they be considered good too? And we understood by the, the types and the models that's being shown, shown in, the, in the symbols of Ezekiel and Isaiah in the chapters where Ezekiel, uh, I'm sorry, Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel chapter 28. That's the, the rise and fall of Lucifer. And we understand that those trees are symbols of angels, ranks of angels, and eventually there's one that's specifically Lucifer. So when we go back to the Garden of Eden, when God said, don't eat of any of those, uh, like you eat of any tree, okay? But that one here, specifically in the middle, don't even touch it. Whoa. So there's something different there, right? You can eat freely of all these trees, but this one here, don't even touch it. And we went through the whole detail about what the real sin of Adam and Eve were and what, how was Eve wholly and solely deceived. And that was a sexual event. And then we understood that Cain wasn't biologically Adam's, and we can understand that is, it's taught specifically in our Old Testament too and then confirmed in the New Testament. And then you have a problem with why did God say in the Old Testament? Because I had this problem too. When I started reading the Bible where God says, destroy every one of these individuals, man, woman, and child. Well, I can see an atheist argument in that before I was really versed in the understanding of who these individuals were. They're descendants of crossbreeding of angels. So their whole purpose when these angels descend, they were trying to pollute the, the gene pool that all of us have. We're SIN positive. All of us, after the flood, that bloodline still found a way. Angels still sinned, okay? And 
this whole idea doesn't find its way in churches today because Augustine adopted Julianus, uh, Julian uh, Africanus's idea of it's the Sethites, which actually makes no sense. Everybody in Jesus' day, when the scriptures were understood, they understood it was angels that sinned. They took wives, and they had offspring that were not normal. You, know, you don't get nine feet tall you know, men you know, just because a believer versus a non-believer has a relationship. So we went through a long, drawn-out discussion about that, but I, I want to talk about how when Jesus held them accountable to know the very day, would it be fair for him to say, you should have known this when they had no ability to know what day it was? Of course not. It wouldn't have been fair. But he held them to a standard so high that they didn't know the very day he was coming that he spiritually blinded them as a nation. Which is the very reason why we understand that the Bible teaches there's going to be seven years of tribulation. And Jeremiah calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. And I have friends and I have people I like listening to on YouTube that have various different beliefs about eschatology and what they believe in terms of whether there is a harpazo, which is a rapture, which is you know, science fiction to some, that it can't happen. The same people that believe that Jesus ascended into a cloud when he ascended after his resurrection and spent time with the, the apostles, they watched him go up into the clouds. They watched him do that. They watched him ascend. Okay, uh, they, they believe that happened. They, they believe that Elijah got caught up in a fiery serpent, a fiery serpent, fiery chariot, and they believe that Enoch was taken off the place, the face of the earth, because he walked with God and God took him. They believe in those events. But when it comes to Thessalonians, when Paul says, behold, I show you a mystery. But that word, I show you a mystery, okay, if you understand it, what he's saying is, is I'm showing you something that wasn't completely uh, new. It was previously revealed, but in a manner that would require more understanding. That means in the Old Testament. The rapture, where God comes, because there's two events that's going to come here soon. One of them is the harpasa, the, 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 the snatching up, the, the, the taking out of the way, of harm's way, of the body of Christ. Not every believer will go. Why do I say that? Because we'll look at it this way. If you were going to get married, okay, and you asked the, your, your bride to be, hey, will you marry me? And they said, yes, I want to marry you, but let's wait until I get this stuff done over here because I really want to go and, and, and spend time with my friends first. You know, I, I have some things to take care of. Let's, let's put it off another year or two. As a groom-to-be or a husband-to-be, how would that make you feel about your spouse-to-be? Would you think that that person is genuinely excited about being married to you? Or they're like, yes, let's do it right now. Which bride would you want? You would want the one that says, I cannot believe you're asking me. Yes, the sooner the better. We, I love you, and I want to I secure our relationship together and, and solidify it with uh, you know, a marriage. That's what God wants. And when God had chosen Israel, and before some of you start thinking this, I'm not going to comment and try to encourage the idea of repra replacement theology because I don't believe in that. But there is a distinction between the church and Israel. There's two different destinations there, okay? And that's the problem. And both sides are guilty of vilifying the other. Judaism, they appreciate the love that, that Christians give towards them and their nation, but they have a disdain for the fact that we believe in Christ. And they think that, you know, we're, we're fools because of that. Christians see the distinction between the church and Israel, 
And some of them have taken an extreme view and said, well, the church has replaced entirely Israel, and they haven't. Their destinations are different. How God will treat them is different. Even though the Gentile bride of Christ, which is the church, was grafted in, as the Bible says, we have totally different destinations. And because Israel called uh, God's wife first, okay, what happened when they disobeyed God? He basically divorced them, right? And he says, well, look, you know, you're, you're going after strange gods and idol worship, and you, you just didn't want to listen to me. So now I'm going to use the Gentiles to make you jealous because I'm a jealous God. I'm going to make you jealous with the Gentiles, and I will call a, a people that are not of you but are the Gentiles. Well, what does that sound like? That sounds like the Christian doctrine of Christ, right? And when Jesus first came, he came, what, preaching to the Jews. And then he switches up and says, what? i got to start dealing with the Gentiles, too. And then he gave that ministry to Paul. Saul, who became uh, Paul, was the apostle to the Gentiles. And he was given a revelation that really didn't need to be given, because if you study the Old Testament, there are models. Remember, I was teaching similitudes. Okay, the, model, the models that are taught in the Old Testament, they pattern the very specific events that's going to happen in the future, or very many times the very events and actions of Christ in his ministry on the earth and when he comes back. Just like the feasts of the Lord. The seven feasts of the Lord, they're prophetic in nature too, but they're also something that they are supposed to be participated in on a yearly basis. The idea that Christ held the nation of Israel accountable for not knowing the very day that he was riding in on a donkey proclaiming to be the Messiah, you find that in Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, 26, and 27, which is always referred to as Gabriel's prophecy or Daniel's 70 weeks. And I'm going to spare you a very long and very technical discussion, but if you want to learn more about this, um, there's a book called The Coming Prince. Um, that book is, it might be a little bit challenging for some of you to read, but there have been some very good scholarly presentations that have been done inside of 15, 20 minutes on YouTube. If you do a, a search on Daniel 70 weeks prophecy, if you want to have like a little bit of a, um, a supplemental review of what I'm, I'm talking about here and, and, and a glossing over, which doesn't really do it any justice. But if you understand those three verses, what Gabriel basically said was, here's the very day that when the decree is given to rebuild the, the city of Jerusalem, uh, not, this, not the, the decree to rebuild uh, the temple, but there's, there was only one decree to rebuild the uh, city of Jerusalem. And it took three parts. Three kings actually had a, a say in the matter. But um, it finally was rebuilt. And Daniel's prophecy, uh, I'm sorry, Gabriel's prophecy of telling Daniel in chapter 9, verse 25, 26, and 27, um, it gives you a very specific number of days. And if you count that out, and we have the help of the Royal Observatory in, in, in Greenwich of England. They have they helped with the calculation of the aspects of the Julian versus the Babylonian calendar. Um, prophecies usually uh, marked with 360 days a year, and um, something happened, you know, where I, I believe because I've read other books because I've always been a, a student of astrology. Uh, I believe Mars had an influence on our planets, and every calendar changed from a 360-day year to 365, and something happened, and um, there are some scholarly works that are done outside of Bible-based views, just, just scientifically uh, represented, where Mars had an interference with our orbital um, rotation. 
And somehow we picked up an extra five days or so, a little bit over five days uh, per year. So while every calendar around the world that kept calendars, they all had a 360-day calendar. And they all, for some reason, changed all around the same short period of time. And a lot of scientists have some pretty convincing arguments that, and I believe it too, that Mars had an influence on our, our calendar, which caused us to move to a 365-day calendar. Well, prophecy still rolls on a 360-day calendar year. And if you have that in mind and you use the calculation and all the time aspects of calculating that was verified by the Royal Observatory in England. Um, and you can, you can check all this stuff. You can do all the math yourself. It's a, it's a long-winded calculation, but all of the details are in that book, The Coming Prince. And you probably won't read it and feel like it's an easy read, but it's, it, it's all there. I mean, it's, it's definitely all there. You can do the calculations. It comes to April 6th, 32 AD, which is the very day that Jesus rode in on the donkey and proclaimed himself as the Messiah. And then that same week, April 10th, which was a Thursday because Good Friday is a myth. Um, you can't get three days and three nights in the belly of the earth like Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, which is Jesus' um, proclaim response to the, uh, the Pharisees, it said, you know, show us a sign. You know, a wicked generation seeketh out their sign. There's no sign given unto it, but the sign of Jonah. As three days and three nights Jonah was in the belly of the fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the belly of the earth. So that was his only response. So how can you get three days and three nights if Jesus died on the cross on a Friday? You can't. If he's resurrecting and coming back to life before sunrise on Sunday, you can, the math isn't math, right? So it's Thursday. And I actually have a, a study where if you look at the creation week, you know, the passion week where he rode in on a donkey on Palm Sunday, all the way to the, the day of resurrection, all of those days pattern the very days of creation. So he created all things new, just like he did in, in, the, in the beginning. Day one, day two, day three, and so forth. So... But anyway, the crucifixion was on the 10th of April, 32 AD. So if Gabriel gave Daniel that prophecy, and the Jews read this, they understood it. They should have, they should have understood it, right? They should have known the very day that Jesus was coming as the Messiah. So whoever rides in on a donkey on that day should be the Messiah. What other supporting evidence? Well, he was bringing people back from the dead. He was healing the blind, healing the sick. He was feeding people with a, basically a snack lunch and had leftovers like Thanksgiving, baskets of it. He walked on water. He knew their hearts and minds. He read their minds. He never was tricked up. He knew about the body. A 12-year-old Jesus had more understanding about the body of, of a human being and he confounded the doctors in the temple at 12 years old. So he fit everything. There were 300 prophecies. This one figure in history met every single one of them. And the level of probabilities just to get 10 of them is astronomical, let alone 300 of them. So if he fulfilled over 300 of the first ones, there's thousands of them he's got that he's going to fulfill in his second coming. So when we have this discussion about, and like I talked about with my friend Sean, um, he thinks that there is like this period of tribulation. It's seven years, okay? And in Christendom, there is there's two camps, okay? One camp gets subdivided into three other subgroups, but the main view is there is a rapture where the body of Christ is taken out of the way. That means it's treated just like Enoch was. God took him off the face of the earth. He didn't die. Elijah was taken off the earth. He did not die. So that's a rapture. That's a rapture. So for people that say, oh, this rapture is not real. It was created by, no, wrong. Nope. Go back to Genesis, the book of beginnings. Everything is in the book of Genesis. 
the crucifixion, the resurrection, the rapture, the tribulation, the end times. Who's going to be in the end times fighting against Jesus like they have a chance? <laughs> so everything, everything is found in that one book. You don't even need the other 65 books. Just Genesis will teach you everything. Just look at Genesis chapter 5 and the genealogy. It's crazy, right? And then we took it one step further, and I said, okay, look at Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 11. And I walked you through the number of years they were alive before they gave their uh, firstborn. And you add those years up, and it came to 1,948. That's an interesting number, isn't it? Very interesting. Well, that same thing happens when you go over to Ezekiel. God tells Ezekiel, lay on your side for this many days. And this, this is going to represent one day for one year for Israel's sins. And once you do that, turn over, lay on your right side for a number of days. And again, they represent one year for one day. And if you do the calculation of that prophecy, and I'm, just going, to, I'm going to spare you that, okay? But there, again, you can find a lot of really good short presentations that, t that do a very scholarly work of explaining it but it gives you the very day of May 14th, 1948, when Israel became a nation again. The same 1,948 days that the genealogy from Genesis chapter 5 and 11, which is Adam to Abram, the father of nations. Now, you're going to tell me that God's not a date setter, because he is, and he's precise. What was the margin for error for these prophecies? Zero. Because if it didn't happen on those days, none of it was real, right? But yet it is. Now, let's roll back the time in Michael's life. I'm 14 years old. My friend Sean, we're laying on the picnic table of his dad in the backyard, staring up at this space, looking at clouds and stars and the moon. And I remember telling him, I said, Sean, you know what, man? Jesus said, when, when the signs start showing up, that generation will not pass away until all of them happen. That means we're going to see the rapture. We're going to see the, the second coming of Christ. We're going to see that in our lifetime. Do you have any idea how exciting that is? He's like, yeah, it's, it's kind of neat. But I could tell he wasn't, really, he wasn't really subscribing to it. And later on as an adult, you know, he was like, and he still holds this view. He doesn't want Jesus to come back yet. And that's what separates who goes in the rapture and who doesn't. And why do I say that? If you look at the parable of the ten virgins, five of them make themselves ready. They keep them, their, their lantern wick trimmed, their lantern full of oil. That's the Holy Spirit prayed up. And they're constantly ready to go. I am very happy. I'm happy with my family. I'm happy with the life that God's blessed me with. I'm happy with everything. I am ready to go. <laughs> I, I would rather be with God than here. And that doesn't sound like suicide because I would never kill myself because that's self-murder. But I would rather I, – I want this event to happen. Like I'm actively praying for it every single day. I want it to happen. I pray for my family. I pray for myself. I pray for all of you to be counted worthy to escape these things that are coming upon the earth. But there is a – faction of Christendom that don't believe there's a rapture. They believe it was a made-up thing. It's, a, it's an escapism. When that's a really poor choice of words because the whole idea of what the Old Testament teaches, God is an escape artist for the people that love him. Like He gets them out of harm's way. You don't believe it? Go through those stories. Yeah, sure, there's people that die. There's people that have hardships and things that happen to them. Absolutely. But the flesh profits nothing. The flesh isn't going to heaven. That's why when people say, oh, well, if God was a God that loves everybody, he wouldn't let sin happen to these little children. He wouldn't let these people in the world get raped and murdered and abused. Well, guess what? That's a consequence of sin. He promised that those things were going to happen as a result of the fall of man, of Adam and Eve. He's keeping his promise. But you know what he also promised? That if you love him and you trust him and you believe his gospel and you obey his gospel, that's Acts 2.38, by the way, then 
you will be spared that hour of temptation and trial that the whole world will experience. How can someone get that kind of special treatment? Well, we'll, t- we'll talk about it. But there's this idea that some church believers and Bible believers and de- believe in Jesus. They say that there is no rapture. And it's a lot of the Southern folks. You know, um, I love uh, – there's a channel. I, I didn't want to name any specific channels here, but uh, I'm not going to do it. Actually, I'm not going to do it because I know some of you that don't like me would love nothing more to go there and, and start more trouble. But there is a Southern lady that I absolutely love. She reminds me of a young version of my grandmother. Um, I love her uploads, and she, she's like a, um, a homesteader. And she doesn't believe in a rapture, and you know, it, it's unfortunate. But she believes that, like my friend Sean, they believe that we have to endure seven years of tribulation, which makes absolutely no sense. Okay. Um, <laughs> The rapture wasn't invented by Darby, okay? Uh, the rapture is Old Testament, which preceded Darby, <laughs> okay? It's in the New Testament, which precedes Darby, okay? I'm sorry. That's just, that's just the facts, okay? And when you really understand the scripture and you understand what's really being said, okay, um, there is a harpazza. There's a, there's a, the word rapture isn't in our Bible, okay? But in, in the original language, there is a term that means what we collectively refer to as a rapture. The, the event is to snatch out of the way of danger. That's what Paul's saying. Okay, in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, we shall be transformed and changed, called up to meet him in the air in the clouds. Okay? Now, for some people that are Christian, they believe in Jesus, they think that ain't going to happen. That's, that's fancy talk. What do you think was going on when Jesus ascended into heaven? He was teaching them that this is how you're going to see me again. How do you know that? Because the angels said, hey, why are you looking in here, looking up at Jesus like this? This same Jesus is going to return unto you the same way, in like manner. Now, that's where people get it confused because you think, oh, that's the second coming of Jesus. Nope, that's not what that is. That's not what that is because it says you will meet him in the clouds. Just like this, you're going to meet him there. And his second coming, nobody's meeting him in the clouds. He's coming back with them. Anybody that's died or raptured in heaven, he's bringing them with him. And then he puts his foot on the planet Earth, whereas in the rapture, he's not putting his foot on the planet. Only the people that are going in the rapture will see him then. Every eye will see him at the second coming. And every knee will bow. And every tongue will profess that Jesus Christ is Lord, the only God deserving of worship. But there is a group that do believe in a rapture, and they wrestle with one one another. (laughs) So here you have the seven-year tribulation, okay? At the beginning of this uh, tribulation, there's a group, and I'm part of this group. I am a pre-tribulation believer, meaning that I believe that the body of Christ that is actively seeking Christ's return, that wants him to return, that wants that more than anything else, they are the ones that are counted worthy to escape it. Because again, that's like I mentioned earlier, if you were getting ready to get married, would you feel good if the spouse that you asked to marry you said, let's postpone it. Let's put it off a little while. I really love you, but let's, let's, let's not do it yet. Let's put a little bit of time in between our decision. I'm not marrying that person. I'm sorry. If, if my wife would have told me, yeah, let's just wait. That would have been it. Done. It's over. That's just my thoughts on it. And it may be a little harsh for some of you. You may not see it that way. But you got to remember, we're talking about God. He's chose a people. And that first people was Israel. And they backslid. They, they worshipped idols. They, they disobeyed God. And he punished them. That's what Ezekiel's prophecy says. they got to be punished for a, a, a large number of years. And if you do the math on it, it takes you to the very day in 1948, the same calculation you get from what? Genesis chapter 5, Genesis chapter 11, add up all the number of years of the firstborn. And it's the genealogy from Adam to Abram. Ooh, what's that? Father of nations. And what's the nation that God put his name on? Israel. 
1948. You can't escape it that God sets these things in advance. God knows the end from the beginning. Only God does. No other book, no other book proves itself like the Bible does. And history proves that man was crucified. He divided time. No other person divided time but Christ. But this seven-year tribulation has been a source of contention for even believers. Before the tribulation, before that seven years of terrible things, there's a pre-tribulation where the Bible says then that which hinders remove, is removed, then shall that man of sin be revealed. The man of sin is the Antichrist. Okay? I believe he's alive and well right now. Um, I believe that you are going to see the Bible in your lifetime come to reality, and you're going to see it right in front of you, real time, 4K resolution. It's going to be – you're going to see it. I absolutely believe that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about to kick off. Now, I don't know. This is what I have been – I've been flip-flopping back and forth with, and it's not, and it's not just recently, but – for the number of years I've been studying it. I don't know if Ezekiel 38 and 39's war, where Iran, which is Persia in those chapters, Turkey, and Russia, they are a an axis of, well, they're, they're allies, let's say it that way. Okay, And I'm not going to tell you anything more. I want you to read those two chapters. If you're inclined and you listen this long, read those two chapters, okay? And you're going to discover there's some language being used in that where imagine if you were at that time before nuclear bombs were ever even created. Imagine if a nuclear bomb was used in Israel. How would you describe in that present day in terms that would be understand would be understood rather at that time, but we can look back and say, I can see how that would be applicable to nuclear fallout. I'll just leave that with you, and you read it, and you tell me if that's not what you see. Okay? But I told my, my uh, students in 2019 that something really bad was coming. And when I started talking, it wasn't pre-planned. It wasn't even like it is right now. Like, I want to talk about this. I didn't want to talk about it then. It just started coming out of my mouth. And I said, you know, we're going to have something worse than 9-11. And then I told my students in March of 2020, I said, if we go past two weeks of this stuff, it needs to stop after a month. If not, we're in the last days. And I had students leave because you know, they, they thought I was a, a nut job. It, they, you know, some of them were other religions and some of them were atheists. And they said, I didn't join for this. But I've had so many people reach back and say, you know what, I was a fool because look what's going on everywhere. And everything you said was nailed down, just like I said. Now, I'm not taking credit for this because I believe what I was saying was given to me because it wasn't premeditated. Whereas I'm talking to you right now, I'm trying to be very careful about what I'm saying because I'm, I, have a, I have a destination in the conversation. Whereas at the time... I was just talking, and I had no idea where I was going. I just felt I had to say it, and all of it happened. All of it happened. I said, they're going to talk about UFOs, and we saw them on TV, and they're talking about how they got alien bodies. <laughs> I don't believe none of that stuff, but guess what? That's what gives the rapture a perfect excuse where everybody goes, a mass abduction. I don't believe that. But that's a perfect excuse, right? So there are three types of believers that are Christians that do believe a rapture. Okay, So putting aside the folks that don't believe there is a rapture, they're going to be through the tribulation. Just because they believe in Christ does not exonerate them. They are absolutely going to be left behind. That's why you hear Jesus say, there are some say, Lord, Lord, you know, I did this in your name. I did that in your name. He's going he's gonna to depart from me, child of iniquity. I never knew you. The same way you would treat your spouse to be if she said, I want to marry you, but just not right now. Get out of here. I don't know you. You were not intimate with me. Okay, You, you were not trying to be close to me. I want to be with Christ more than I want to be with my own family members. 
I raised my children that had that same love and adoration for Christ, that put him above me, their mother, and everyone else. Because that's what God wants. That's what God seeks. That's the first commandment. That's the only one of the commandments that I know I'm hitting on. <laughs> because I failed every single one of those other ones. And any one of those puts me in hell. And I needed a redeemer, just like you. And Christ is that redeemer. Thank God he came in the flesh and died for my sins and yours. Whether you choose to believe him or not, it doesn't take away what he's did. And the power of it. But before the tribulation, that seven years of terrible, dreadful things, to be here for any of that. You think this whole coronavirus stuff was a hard thing to get through. Man, you don't want to be here for what's coming. Before the tribulation begins, the Bible says, when that which hinders is removed, then that son of uh, sin shall be revealed. That man of sin will be revealed. That's the Antichrist. Okay. What is the thing that's hindering the body of Christ? The believers that want Christ to come back. Not, um, I love Jesus. I want him to come back, but just not yet. And they use the excuse because I want more people saved. I used to think that. When I was younger, I used to think that. But guess what? God knows who that last believer is going to be. Remember, he knows the answer from the beginning. He, he told Daniel through Gabriel's message and visitation the very day that he was going to ride in on a donkey and present himself as the Messiah. And he held the entire nation of Israel accountable for not recognizing that day. So now what's the purpose of the seven years? It's the time of Jacob's trouble. He's going to demand that Israel does a national repentance. The nation itself is going to repent and call upon the name of the Lord and then and only then does Jesus come back. The rapture is not the second coming. They're two distinct events. And my friend Sean wrestles with this because he believes that at one point he was mid-trib, which means the three and a half years midpoint of that seven-year time of trouble where the whole world is under a, a, a craziness, he believes that the rapture happens then. I don't believe that because it doesn't fit the model of everything else that the Bible teaches. You got to look at every thing in the Bible, not just take things and say, well, that makes sense for me here, but I'm going to ignore all these other scriptures that says this. For the people that don't believe in a rapture, what do you call what happened to Elijah? What happened to Enoch? See, in the, in the flood, look at it like this, the flood, which is global, you may not want to believe in the Bible, but guess what? There's other cultures that prove in their historical records, even in paintings on caves, <laughs> there was a global flood. You can go up on mountains and find fish fossils that should have never been at that height. Aquatic animals, what do you think, a bear, climbed up miles of a mountain, then decided to eat it up there. It kept it in its mouth the entire time up there. Come on. They're too big for an eagle to carry up there. You're denying it because you want to deny it. There was a global flood. It wasn't a localized flood. It was global. But in that flood, there was a lot of people that perished, just like the Bible says the tribulation is going to happen. In the you know, time of the Old Testament, one-third of the Jews, and you know, we were transitioning from Old to New Testament, one-third of the Jewish population was destroyed. In the time of Jacob's trouble, two-thirds of the Jews will be destroyed. That's the Bible. That's horrible. Not just Jews. Anyone else that's left here. You don't want to be part of that. If we look at the model of the Old Testament, where it talks about the flood, look at the flood as the model of the tribulation. Okay? There was a small remnant of people that were preserved during the flood. That's what? Noah and his family, his sons and their wives. So there's eight people. Okay. So there was two types of people. You know, those that survived that tribulation of the flood, 
And I'm sure if you were asking them while it was happening, that would be considered a great tribulation because they had never seen rain like that. It rained for 40 days and 40 nights. And the springs of the earth opened up, and also the atmosphere was different then. So it, it was a, a deluge. It was so much water, it's so fast. When they started beating on the ark, trying to get in, Noah couldn't have let them in if he wanted to because God closed the door, the Bible says. Once this starts, once the rapture happens and the believers are gone, Satan's allowed to do whatever he wants. That's what the Bible says. He will be allowed to do whatever he wants. What is the hindering thing? The bride of Christ. How do we know that? Well, I'll come back to them in a second. But there's a third group. They believe it's a post-trib rapture, where they believe that the church has to go through every painful thing that the Jews have to go through of tribulation. And then God will call them up into the clouds, give them their glorified body, and then it will return, do a U-turn, go right back down to the earth, and then he sets up his 1,000-year uh, reign on the earth, which is the millennial reign. That absolutely makes no sense either, because the Bible teaches that the rapture is imminent. Paul had to teach them in the New Testament because they thought they missed it. Like they were, they were afraid. Like We missed it because there was a lie going around saying the rapture took place. And Paul said, listen, listen, <laughs> settle down. Listen, you didn't miss anything. Things have to happen, okay? And these things didn't happen yet. So he, he reassured them, okay? One of the things about eminency, something that has an eminent event that you can't really tell when it's going to happen, can it be an eminent event if you can time the day that Jesus is going to come back? Because I'm going to tell you the day he's going to come back. <gasps> Wait a minute. This guy's a blasphemer because he's saying right now he knows the day and the hour. No, I didn't. I said the day. For the folks that aren't believers in Christ and that are alive, that are listening to this, the day that this person that's going to step forward and offer a seven-year peace agreement, when that happens, you can count 1,260 days until the day he's going to set up himself and say, stop worshiping, stop worshiping everything that you call God. And he's going to make himself like God. And right then and there, Satan himself is going to indwell that person the same person that orchestrates a seven-year peace agreement. And then 1,260 days at that moment, Christ is coming back. How do I know that? Because there's all through scriptures where it goes down to the very day that this is all timed out. And I don't want you to take what I just said and say, okay, well, you know, I have a lot of respect for you, ICT, so you probably know this better than I do. I'm just going to take your word for it. Do not take my word for it. The whole purpose of the prophecies are for you to go in there and see it for yourself. So if he was nailing it down the very day that April 6th of 32 AD that Jesus was going to come in as the Messiah, and then the very day of May 14th, 1948, when Israel was going to become a nation again, that's why Daniel's prophecy says those very specific elements – God does it in so many ways of breaking it down. He shows it to you in years. He shows it to you in months. And then he breaks it down to the very number of days. So if you understand that God is a date setter, no man knows the day or the hour right now because when that rapture happens, it's imminent. You don't know when it's going to happen. It can happen at any time. That's what the parable of the ten virgins teaches. Ten, ten, ten virgins – Five of them are not ready. Five of them are. The five that are ready, they go out and they meet the groom, and they go in. And the five that aren't, they try to get in. They say, no, you, you haven't made your garments ready, and you have no oil in your lantern. Go and try to buy it. But you're not going to be able to do it. That's what's going to happen when the rapture happens. The believers that are left here that said, I don't want Jesus to come back yet. They're not going. They're going through the tribulation. The people that say there is no rapture, they're going through the tribulation. And some of them expect it, so they're not going to be surprised by it. But when that rapture happens, they're going to be really surprised that they had it wrong. Why wouldn't you believe the Bible when it makes it very clear that it is one? 
And if you look at the book of Ruth, look at Boaz. He's a kinsman redeemer. That's the whole idea of it. Naomi is the type of Israel. Ruth is a Gentile bride. That's the church. Through Naomi, who guides what? The Gentile bride to do what? See Boaz as the husband. Does Boaz beat his wife Ruth ever in that story? No. He's tender to her. In fact, when he when she catches his eye, he's smitten by her. And Naomi knows it. And when she comes back with more food, because Boaz owned that field. What's the field? Remember the part of the parable? The world. See, all these blessings are coming to Israel as a nation, yes. But the gifts of the Spirit, which are way better than the land, that's going to the church. Say, Naomi, she sees Ruth come back home with all this bounty. Like, man, you are blessed. Whose field were you in today? Well, it was Boaz's field. Oh, you have no idea how blessed you are. And to restore herself, she goes and tells Naomi. Oh, well, Naomi tells Ruth, look, this is what I want you to do. You go, and you go to him at night. What? Night? That's exactly what the whole idea of a Christian marriage is. Remember, I was teaching on the idea of the way Christ is going to come for his church. It's modeled after a Jewish marriage ceremony. And many times, not always, but many times, the Jewish marriage procession would come at night because it would be viewed as romantic. That you don't know when he's going to come, and you always have to make yourself ready. And then when he, you hear the, the shofar blown to the horn, you go out and you meet him in the darkness. And he steals you away as his bride, which is romantic. That's why Jesus says, behold, I come like a thief in a night. But see, you can't say that about the second coming, because if you're living in an age where when the Antichrist makes himself the, the role model for orchestrating a seven-year peace agreement, you can start the clock right then and there. 1,260 days, that same person is going to stand and say, stop all worship. And he's going to break that agreement. And all hell is going to break loose on this planet. Because Satan indwells him at that moment. And he is allowed to do whatever and everything he wants to do. No stopping it. No limitation. God's taken his hand away entirely. And that's why it's called the time of Jacob's trouble. The great tribulation is the last three and a half years. And unless Jesus comes back, no one survives it. But why did he number those days? Because if you're alive and you're here, you're going to have the Bible somehow, shape, or form shown to you. There's going to be more believers and conversions to Christ during the tribulation than any time in history. Because they're all going to know this stuff was foretold and we're in it. But you don't have to be in it. You don't have to be in that. It's such a simple thing. You pray and you ask for forgiveness and you obey the gospel, Acts 2.38. You find someone that has been born and baptized in Jesus' name, and they baptize you. And then you believe what the scriptures say, and you look for his coming, and you look at all these bad things and the news is trying to scare everybody with. I find joy in that, not because it's suffering, because that's exactly what Christ said that was going to happen. And if he was that accurate in his first coming and he demanded Israel to know the very day, how else would he expect you if you're stuck here in the tribulation and you know that this Antichrist comes forward and he's, he orchestrates a seven-year peace agreement? What does that mean, a peace agreement? There has to be what? Turmoil. Well, look at the television on any channel right now and what's going on. Exactly what I told everybody in my mentorship in March of 2020. Because it's about to kick off. What? Ezekiel 38 and 39. I don't know if believers in the rapture are going to be here during that war or after or before. I don't, that part I don't know. But I'm not making myself up to worry about it. Like, I'm, I'm ready to go now. Like, you think I'm not going to be able <laughs> to be away from social media for the trading? Like, I'm pouring myself into the word of God. I'm pouring myself into that. 
I want to be closer to God because I know where we're at. The Lord's given me so much confirmation by the things I said that I wasn't trying to talk about, and it's happened. Even my students, when I told them the other day, I said, go back and find me the, the, the dates of those videos where I've commented. And I, I said, you know, turn your attention to this and that. Again, I'm not, this is not pride. This is not me trying to say it because I know it's the Lord. But some of the responses were like, wow, that was nailed down perfectly. Like it, it happened exactly like that. And it, it gives me goosebumps thinking about it because I'm a sinner. Like I'm a sinner. You heard me in the first part of this discussion, foul mouthing. You heard it. You're not hearing it now, are you? Someone else is here. <laughs> okay. So when he's here, he bridles the tongue. And I want you to have this peace knowing that there's no other person that embodies God outside of Christ. No one else has been able to set the dates beforehand, and they happen perfectly. Perfectly. That's precision. So when you hear somebody say, oh, you know, no man knows the day or the hour. You're setting dates and stuff. You, you know, I get it. That's that's true about rapture. But when that rapture happens and tribulation starts, everything is on a schedule. It's on a schedule. It's timed. Go look at the book of Revelation. See, teachers and, and preachers of, of the Bible, they avoid that book because they really don't know their scripture. They don't know their Bible. They wouldn't even recognize Jesus if he walked into their church, let alone try to teach his word. They're expecting some, you know, sandy, blonde, blue-eyed Caucasian man with long hair. He would have never had long hair. He ain't going to have white skin. <laughs> I mean, the way they have portrayed Christ is so away from what he really would have been. He would have had olive-colored skin, probably you know, what every person really would like to have as a white person. Not, not tan, but like an olive complexion, something like that from the Mediterranean area would have. He wouldn't have blonde hair, long down past his shoulders. That makes him effeminate. He would have never had an effeminate appearance, and he wouldn't have been skinny like that. He was a carpenter's son. He would have been a a burly man, somebody that would have had some size to him. He wouldn't have been a weakling. But the Bible says he had no form of commonness that we should desire him. So he wouldn't have been pretty like they started to make him look out to be like this handsome, trimmed beard, long hair, like he's something on a romance novel. That's offensive to me when I see that. That's why we're not supposed to have any graven image. We're not supposed to have those types of things. Why? Because if you keep looking at that stuff, you identify that as Jesus. And you have crosses with the body of Christ still on the cross. That You shouldn't have that. He's not on the cross no more. He put himself there. He allowed himself to be up there. There's three nails that didn't keep him there. His love for us did. That's, that's what kept him up on that cross. He walked on water. He brought the dead back to life. He healed the blind. He fed people miraculously. And you think three nails kept him up there? Three. Three spikes like he said to them, he said, listen, <laughs> you're telling me to come down from this cross if I'm the son of God. Don't you understand? I could call them 10,000 legions of angels and lay waste just like this if I wanted it to happen. All of it was scheduled. He was the master of ceremonies. He was the one controlling everything because it was on a schedule. When I was 14, I told my friend Sean, and I believe it was the Lord talking to me and through me then too. And I get it, folks. I am a sinner. But guess what? God used sinners in the Old Testament too. He made Paul, the apostle to the Gentiles, the chief persecutor and murderer of the church. He picked a murderer of an Egyptian, Moses, to go down there and tell off the Pharaoh, the president of the known world then, 
The fact that he even did that should have killed him. But God, guess what? God said, you can't. Pharaoh at the time was a type of what? The Antichrist. Haman. Study him in the Old Testament. He's a form of what? The Antichrist. So, if you look at Boaz in the book of Ruth, Naomi, who was a Jewish woman, she's a widowed woman. She doesn't have a husband anymore. But she recognizes that Boaz can redeem her. But Ruth's a Gentile. So she says to Ruth, go to him at night. And basically take, take part of your clothing and lay it across his feet while he's sleeping. And that is a very confusing thing for some people, but it's, a, it's a, a way for her to proposition him, saying, listen, I, I, I will be yours if you would have me, basically. And he knew exactly what she was doing. And when he married her, does the story say that he put her through any harm? No. He treated her special. He told the, the, the field, okay? Listen to this, folks. Listen, okay? Because if you can't see Christ and Christianity and everything around the whole gospel in this short little four-chapter book, it's crazy when you start seeing it with, through the lens of Jesus. Okay, and I'm going to help you with it right here. Naomi is Israel. Ruth is a Gentile bride. That's the church. Boaz is a kinsman redeemer. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. So Boaz is a model of Jesus. He owns the field. Remember the parable of the, the wheat and tares? And Jesus tells you what the wheat is, it's the world. I'm sorry, what the, uh, what the field is, it's the world. So use that same knowledge, and a, a symbol, right there in the book of Ruth. Who owns the, the field? Boaz. What is the field? It's the world. In the world, God sees two people, Jew and Gentile. If you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. But Jesus takes a Gentile bride. That's his bride. That's his bride. Okay. The believers in Christ are always referred to as the body of Christ or the bride of Christ. She's a Gentile. We're not Jewish. But we're grafted in. Grafted into what? The salvation plan. When Jesus sees this Gentile woman, by model, okay, he gives her special treatment. You see that? Boaz sees Ruth and gives her special preferential treatment. He tells the workers of the field, the angels, remember the ones that he says, go for you know, with a sickle when it's time and, and bring the harvest in. That's the angels. He tells the workers of the field, what are they doing in the, in the, in the world? They're harvesting the believers out of the field. In what shape? What do you mean by shape, ICT? What are you, what are you talking about? Well, if you understand the, the laws of gleaning, and you learn about that in the Old Testament, get yourself a concordance. Gleaning. That's why I that's where I got the term gleaning. When you're, I'm the I'm the dean of glean. You know, when you're learning my lessons about price action, you want to glean. That comes from understanding the Old Testament. That is impressed upon me by studying the Old Testament from the book of Ruth. Ruth is in the field. Gathering food, the welfare system back then, you, if you had a field, you would leave the corners. You would, not, you would not harvest in the corners. Okay. Now imagine, imagine if this field was a, was a rectangle okay, in your mind's eye. And God said, if you owned a field, you are supposed to leave the corners alone. So what's a corner? You have upper left, upper right, a lower left, and a lower right. And if you glean everywhere else, what are you left with? Well, you're harvesting through the work of the cross. 
You didn't see that there before, did you? It's neat, isn't it? I got goosebumps thinking about it all over again. It's all in it. It's designed. It's designed. But he told the workers, if you see her in the field, leave extra for her. Who? Ruth. Who's that? The church. The Gentile bride of Jesus. Give them extra special treatment. You wonder why believers in Christ get the miracles? How they're spared a lot of the troubles of the world? How their paychecks go a little bit further than they should have? When they get those doctor reports that should have been this, but they come out with something else? Michael, this baby's going to come out breach birth. We're going to have to have C-section because the placenta is covering the cervix. That's a lie from hell. Because God promised me my son, Caden. And he ain't going to put my wife through that. I'm just telling I'm just telling you, woman. You might have a degree in medicine. You might see that screen, but I'm telling you, that's a lie. And my son came out natural. You get treated special when you believe in Christ. You're not spared of everything because God said you will have trials and tribulations in this world. That means you're going to go through some stuff. But guess what he promised the, uh, the, the Church of Philadelphia? I will spare you what I'm going to give to the rest of the world. What does that mean? You won't know that until you understand which, that, which hinders when it's removed. Then that man of sin shall be revealed. What is that? That's the Gentile bride. That's the believers in Christ that want to see him come back. Not the ones that say, don't come back yet, Jesus. We need more people saved. I'm not saying I don't want more people saved. I'm just saying there's a time when the fullness of the Gentiles come in. That means that God knows that last believer, the person that's going to come to him in repentance, that's it. It's over. That's when the rapture takes place. And when that is removed, because God doesn't punish the bride. He's going to punish the nation of Israel with that seven-year tribulation. The whole purpose of it is to beat them into submission nationally and have repentance nationally. The nation of Israel will turn to the Lord and say, please come back. Why will they do that? Because they're going to understand that our New Testament said exactly what they're going through. But two-thirds of them are going to die through war and persecution and murder. And everyone else here that doesn't listen to this person that's going to be indwelt with the very spirit of Satan himself, who God says is allowed to do whatever he wants. Those last three and a half years, he can do whatever he wants. That's frightening. That's scary when you think about that. The only way Satan can hurt God is by taking more of his creation, humans, to hell with him. Because he knows he's lost. And he's got rage. And the only way he can hurt him is to take more of us with him. He ain't taking me. And he ain't got my children. And he ain't got my wife. Sorry. But not sorry. When you study the Bible and understand the flood is a type of the tribulation, there's a small remnant, 144,000. Well, that's a type of the eight members of Noah and his family who are preserved during the flood. Who, who are the people outside the, the, of the ark? Everybody in the world. What happened to them? They died. But there was a group of people, one specifically, that didn't have to go through it. That was Enoch. He walked with God. At 65 years of age, he started walking with God, and he lived 300 years after that. And then all of a sudden, when the world at that time, started to proclaim 
the name of the Lord. Well, that's a mistranslation. It means, they, in Hebrew it says, they profaned the name of the Lord. When that started happening, right before that happened, Enoch got raptured. Where's God in the church today? He's not there. Money is. You can't serve God and mammon. Churches are ran like businesses. Celebrity status pre uh, preachers. That's why I don't go to organized religion, because it's going to take you to hell. Which church? Look at the book of Acts. That's church. Small groups in your homes. And believe me, we're all going to be doing that. If, you're, if, if I'm wrong, and I don't believe I am, and I'm hoping and praying I'm not, and the church has to go through tribulation. Anybody that's here, when they come together with other believers, they're going to be doing it secretly in homes. And they're not going to be telling many people about it. Because it's going to be outlawed. All forms of religion is going to be. But before there has to be a, a seven-year tribulation and a seven-year peace agreement, there has to be turmoil. There has to be this upheaval, right? Where? In Israel. What's the deal with Israel? Zechariah says it. I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all those who burden themselves with it. God placed his name over there. That's the problem. Okay. There's these two factions. Okay. Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, Jacob. It's the same storyline from Genesis. That's what's going on right now, folks. There is no answer. No one president, no one leader, no one collection of people in the United Nations, no, nobody is fixing that problem over there. The Jews are not leaving, and the Arabs do not want them at all there, and that is something that can't be agreed upon. But for seven years, this one person is going to broker an agreement where even the Jews and the Arabs will agree to it for seven years, but then he will break it at three and a half years. That means there's time that you can count it. 1,260 days. When that, when that peace agreement starts, you can count literally 1,260 days, and then there's going to be a total disruption of everything. And then count 1,260 days after that. You can tell the day that Jesus is coming back, that day, from that moment on, but until that man of sin is revealed and that seven-year peace agreement is orchestrated, you can't count anything. So if there are people that believe in a post-tribulation, well, guess what that means? You can know the day and the hour because it's 1,260 days from the peace ag agreement, and then the Antichrist will say, okay, I'm basically like God now. And then 1,260 days after that, Jesus is coming back. So if you believe in a post-tribulation, that means there's no eminence. There was no necessity for Paul to teach and correct those people that thought they missed the rapture in the New Testament. You should be vibrating and buzzing right now if you're a believer because your hope should be increasing right now. If you had an idea about the rapture or, or confused, there's no reason to be confused about it because it can't be mid-tribulation and it can't be post-tribulation because post-tribulation means you know the day and the hour when it's going to happen. Well, maybe not so much the hour, but you know the very day it's going to happen. And there's no evidence then, right? Because you can count it, new when it's going to happen. If that means you, you can tell, sit back on your laurels and say, well, I can live vicariously and just do whatever I want to do. Sin loose, just do whatever I want to do because it's, all i got to do is wait for this Antichrist, and then i got to wait for the Antichrist to you know, set up his, his uh, whole thing and say, you know, he's like God. And then 1,260 days. i got 1,260 days to live like a sinner, and then I'll ask for forgiveness on 1,259 days. Because I know that Jesus is going to have a second coming the day after that. That's exactly what that means. That means that, that – why would God allow that? He wouldn't. It goes against his whole character of eminence. <laughs> Come on. You don't know your scripture. So it only fits with pre-tribulation. Absolutely. It fits the model that we are not appointed unto wrath. That's scriptural. Jesus himself said, pray that you're counted worthy to escape these things coming upon the earth. For the people that say rapture is escapism, what is going on in that passage where Jesus himself says, hey, pray always that you're counted worthy to escape these things coming upon the earth. That means and supposes that God in the flesh would never waste his time saying something that wasn't worth knowing. 
He's teaching. Every word he's ever spoke was an instruction. Every response, look at everything he says. It's an instruction. Everything. He didn't waste any word. Any word at all was never wasted when Jesus spoke. And he says, very plainly, you can't make it out to be something other than this. Always pray to be counted worthy to escape these things, what, that are coming upon the earth. What is he talking about? Tribulation. Not just the, not, not the, the average thing, because he promised us in the garden that we will have trials and tribulation. He promised it was going to be like that. We're sinful creatures. And until we're redeemed, we're in this world, and it's sinful. It's fallen. Yes, God knows that there's children being harmed. Yes, he knows that you had things done to you, ill-willed. He knows that people steal from you. He knows that you've been mistreated. He knows all that stuff. That's, that's the price of sin. Just because you believe in him doesn't give you the ability to walk through the world and not have no problems. It just means that he's never going to give you more than you can't bear. But great tribulation is appointed for Jacob. What is Jacob? Israel. Remember Jacob's name? It was changed to what? Israel. So when Jeremiah says it's the time of Jacob's trouble, oh, now we understand why there's a tribulation. And the Antichrist won't have rule and reign over every aspect or place of the world either. There are some places that are just not going to listen to him. But over in the Middle East, <laughs> you've got some problems. And it's going to have a spillover. What would cause the whole world to turn against Israel? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of anti-Semitism in the world, even Christians. You know, if you really pin them down in the privacy of some time where they can answer you know, a friend or a family member, they'll many times, sometimes, come right out and say they don't like the Jews. And that's a problem. There's a TikTok there, my, my uh, wife likes to listen to. He's all tatted up on, on TikTok. He's like a Christian guy. He likes to preach and stuff. And she showed me uh, the most recent one where he says uh, – you know, you're not supposed to um, just blindly follow Israel and uh, if they're doing evil. Well, I'm going to be honest with you folks. Both sides are being evil. War is evil. And it's not them. We wrestle not with flesh and bone, you know, flesh and blood. We're, these are evil spirits and fallen angels that are pushing all these agendas right now. That's what's going on. That's why you're not going to vote your way out of all this stuff, folks. That's why these elections that this had were rigged again, <laughs> right in front of you. They don't care. They're doing it right in front of you because why? They only have a little bit of time left. Look at the sense of urgency for them to get all these things done. They're telling you all these things have to be done by when? 2030. What's going on? What's going on that they have to have all this stuff across the world changed? By 2030. That's an interesting number, isn't it? Real interesting number. When people said, no man knows the day or the hour, and the end times, and they were talking about Bible studies, and, and they were doing uh, writing books and commentaries about the end times, and they were written before Israel became a nation, you might just chalk that up as, you know, you can't trust it. Because Jesus said, when you see the fig tree shoot forth its branch, you know that summer is near. Well, what is the fig tree? You have to study the Old Testament. The, the te Old Testament teaches that Israel is like the good figs. Where, fig, where does a fig grow? On a fig tree. So if you have not studied the Bible, old and new, and looked at everything and, and, and weighted against one another and you discover that these symbols that even Revelation talks about Revelation is decoded with understanding the entirety of the Bible and then when you study the book of Revelation it will take you into every book of the Bible but it's not it's not veiled to a degree where you can't not understand it but it's there so that way even the people that think they might know something Unless they really chew on it and go through and study it actively and really get down to the root of what it's saying, you won't really see it. What, what I mean, what's an example of that? Well, if you look at Matthew 24, and I, I, I may say things 
that may not be the exact. So if I say something, kind of like go around the, the, the general theme and look it up, Google it, okay? Because I, I don't have anything written down, so I'm just kind of like spouting off here. But Matthew 24, where it, it talks about when the, the apostles were saying, hey, look, or the disciples, rather, um, what's the time of uh, the uh, end of the world, or the end of the age, rather, and uh, the sign of your coming? And they gave him one more question off the top of my head. I don't recall exactly what it is, so I'm kind of like running off of the mouth. But uh, he answered those three questions. And when he said, there will be wars and rumors of wars. And then he goes on and says, and nations shall rise against nations. Well, guess what that means? That's a world war. So everything up into that moment, they're not signs. You hear teachers and preachers and churches say, all these are signs. No. The sign he said that's the end of the age is there will be nation rising against nation. That, that means what? A world war. World war only happened in World War I, and then you had World War II, which is basically a continuation of World War I. And now what are we left with? What's brewing right now? What's, what's on the lips of everybody on the news right now? World War III. Remember when Clinton was telling Trump, oh, yeah, if we get Trump in office, we'll be in World War III with Russia. <laughs> um, it was going to happen regardless who's in the office because it's written. These people are all puppets. God puts up kingdoms and puts down kingdoms. He raises kings and puts down kings. All of these people, as godless as they are, they're going to do God's will whether they like it or not. That's just the way it is. And you're watching it unfold. And there's two perspectives to have. You can look at all this and view it as doom and gloom and we're all going to have to go through something horrible. Or you can say, you know what? God said all this is going to happen and I'm right with God. I live with God as my Savior. I believe Jesus. I believe what he said. And I'm praying that I'm counted worthy and my family's worthy to be counted to, uh, worthy to escape these things coming upon the earth. That's the best thing you can do. It's the only thing you can do. And you live by faith. And if, if something happens to you, oh, well, it is what it is. If you die, wonderful. Just like Jesus said. Well, it doesn't say specifically Jesus, but it is Jesus in the Old Testament. Where it says, the death of his saints are precious in the sight of the Lord. Because you get to be with him forever in a protected new body that doesn't decay, doesn't get sick, doesn't have any pain, and you get to do things differently. Whereas right now we're stuck in these fleshly prisons. You know, you ever live with pain? I live with chronic pain every day. I can't wait to get out of this body. I can't wait. I can't stand this world and where it's going and the direction it's in. Do you honestly have faith that we're going to somehow be able to vote our way out of all this stuff? It ain't happening, folks. It's not just an American thing. It's everywhere. And the things that they're trying to push on us. They're going to be doing a, a digital ID. That's the very last stage before you're getting something on you. And until you have that, you cannot buy or sell. That's why I, I, was, I was kind of hinting at it when I didn't want to talk about scriptural things. When I said, you know, we're, we're probably going to get to a time where you know, trading will be unaccessible to some of us. That's the mark of the beast. That's it. And unless you have that mark, you cannot buy or sell. Well, what are we doing as traders? We're buying and selling. It's not limited to brick and mortar stores and going to shopping and groceries. It, it will encompass that too. But these digital IDs, they're setting it up right now. Don't take my word for it, folks. Listen to me. Take my word for enough to go and research it and see if what I'm saying is you know, a bunch of bunk or not. But the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, the World Economic Forum, and the United Nations – they're very, very hard at work right now while everybody's paying attention to everything that's going on, all the things that we're constantly being distracted by. They're fastly working to get these digital IDs in place. And without that digital ID, you will not be able to log into the Internet. They're very quickly trying to police the Internet. Why? Because that's the way we can share information like I'm doing right now. 
I, I, if I was here during the tribulation, I would not be able to say this. They would already be knocking on the door. <laughs> it, it was, I, I don't, let me let me tell me to check. Let me see if I still. Can you guys hear me? Can you guys hear me? I've been going on for a while. I'm not sure if there's anybody even listening to me. I'm checking Twitter right now, by the way. Yeah, Zach, five by five. Zach's the only one listening. <laughs> Okay, Victoria, Francisco, and Paul, thank you so much. i got a couple people listening. That's enough. I'm going to keep going. If you guys want to keep listening, I'll keep going. But uh, the World Academic Forum and um, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and uh, the United Nations are quickly really, really working hard to get these digital IDs that all of us will be expected to have, retinal scans, all that business, and they're going to set it up where – no internet provider will be allowed to let you have an internet access until you log in with those credentials. So that way you won't be able to sock puppet all you trolls that are out there sock puppeting and having multiple accounts. You're not going to be able to do that, buddy. There's going to be one account and everything you say and do online will be tracked. And if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you're going to have the uh, social credit score like China where you're allowed to spend only so much money. You can't leave your house. You can't do this and they can find you. That'll come directly out of your bank account. That's why there's going to be a central, potential, uh, central digital bank currency because they're going to punish you in a manner where you can't just take your money out and protect it. You don't see it coming, but that's what's coming. That's why I told you last year, get ready. Get the things that you need right now that you will not be able to buy. What does that mean? Firearms, ammunition, plain and simple as that because they're coming for the guns. They're coming for the ammunition. They're getting ready to do background checks on ammunition. You can't buy ammunition unless you clear a background check, and you're going to be able to limit how much you're going to get. Okay, they can't take away the guns right away. Well, we'll take away the ability to get ammunition. Why would they want to do that? Because there's going to be an uprising when they start cracking down, which is what the World Economic Forum said was going to happen. They said the, the world's going to have a great deal of anger towards what we're doing. We've got to make ourselves ready for it. Man, they're telling you. They're telling you what's coming. But keep watching TikTok and your cat videos. It's okay. You're all lost in this um, materialistic chase of, well, fast cars and expensive watches and clothes and bling, and you want to be worshipped by other people. Don't get caught up in that because the real thing that's going on is what I'm talking about right now. Because I'm going to be honest with you, if all this stuff wasn't going on, I would have never made my mentorship for free. I would have never done it. But I know what's coming. And I, have a, I want to have a clear conscience knowing that I did whatever I could to give you a means of preparing your household the only way I, I know how to. And I'm thankful that a lot of you are able to do it. But don't lose sight. Because we are in some really perilous times. And if you're not right with God, whether you choose to believe him or not, you're, you're going to find out real soon that there is one. And for a lot of you, you're going to be shocked at who he is. And to sit and think about how I heard, I heard things that are now happening. That's really astonishing. And when you have all these things coming at one time, even people that don't believe in God, they just know there's something not right right now. Like there, there's a lot of things going on right now in the world that clearly – have never happened before. But that verse in Matthew 24 where Jesus says, and nations shall rise against nation. There's a distinction there. There's a separation. Everything prior to that, that's not a sign. You hear preachers and pastors and stuff, oh yeah, these are all signs. No, they're not. They're just things that, yeah, that's normal. But when you see nation rise against nation, that's the beginning of the end 
of the age. That's when you're in the season to start looking for the sign. What is the sign? He goes on to say, when you see the fig tree shoot forth its branch, you know that summer is near. Likewise, all these things rely on your understanding of what he taught in the Old Testament with these, these types and models, these similitudes. He's saying that when Israel becomes a nation, when World War I happened, has Israel become a nation yet? Nope. Some of you, you don't even know when World War I happened because you didn't learn history. You were in a classroom being taught to be stupid, not knowing what history is, not knowing what a man and a woman is, not understanding how to live your life in a manner that's wholesome and not have low self-esteem and you question your own existence. And you have to put things in you to, to cope with everyday life. Where's God in, in, the, in the schools? He's not allowed. He's not allowed. God's not allowed to be on TV anymore. Watch these athletes that get out there and they, they, they do something extraordinary. And they want to give praise to God. It's, it, it, they're talking about God's one thing. But as soon as they say Jesus, oh, we lost the connection. Oh. That's sorry. But it only happens when that name comes up. You can mention anybody else's name, but when you mention Jesus, all of a sudden they want to kill the, 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 the feed. Because why? Acts chapter 4, verse 12. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. All authority is in that name because he's the only God. He's the only redeemer. He's the only kinsman redeemer. He's the only avenger of blood. He's the final say. When the doctor gives you something, that ain't it. It's what does Jesus say about it. And if you don't know him, he don't know you. And if he doesn't know you, he doesn't owe you nothing. Because he's already done more than any of us deserve. Matthew 24, he says, when those nations rise against nations, that's a world war. We've never had that until World War I. And then all of a sudden, oh, all of a sudden, something miraculous happened. When you see nation rise against nation, when you see a world war, that's the beginning of the end of the age. But the end is not yet. But when you see the fig tree, when Israel becomes a nation again, well, guess what that means, fellas? World War starts, and then Israel becomes a nation. You think God's a date setter? <laughs> I think he is. I think history proves it, too. May 14th, 1948. Ezekiel gave us the very year when Israel becomes a nation again. Genesis chapter 5 and Genesis chapter 11 add up all the days or the years that they were alive before they gave birth to their firstborn. What's the firstborn nation? Think, folks. Think. You can be anti-Semitic all you want. But God's used that people, that nation, to show the world who he is. But he divorced Israel for a period, and he's going to put them through the ringer. The wine press of the tribulation is for the Jews. It's for Israel. He's going to put them through something that's going to cause them as a nation to identify that Jesus absolutely was the Messiah, the only Messiah. He fulfilled everything, and until they call upon his name, he ain't coming back. And that's scripture. Don't take my word for it. Go in and see it for yourself. Jesus ain't coming back until Jews, by a nation, call him back. But the rapture is not that.
There's two women in the Bible. A man fancies one of them. He wants a bride that you know, he's, he's proud of, he's, he's drawn to. But he has to get one first that he doesn't really want. Leah, Rebecca. Think about that story, how that fits. God first chooses Israel and then divorces her because she's unfaithful. She, she starts idol worshiping, backslides, and doesn't believe. So he divorces her spiritually and then says, I'm going to make you jealous with a Gentile. Oh. <laughs> Never saw that either, did you? See, there's a lot of things that learning from Chuck Misler, and Chuck Misler didn't teach that part, by the way, um, it gave me a perspective on the scriptures that allowed me to see things as parallels that lean on how there are a lot of things that Jesus did that parallels to, to, to Israel. There's a lot of things that we see in the Old Testament that don't really make sense. When you put Jesus in the middle of it, suddenly it's like, oh, wow, see that. See, he's the lens. OK, and that's a that's a metaphor that Chuck Missler talked about that made perfect sense to me, where. If the Bible. Is, is viewed in the form of like a hologram, okay? If you, uh, if you take a little bit of, of the image that creates that hologramic, holographic uh, projection, you can take a little bit off of it. And as long as you have the laser that, that created it, it, it shines through it, you'll lose a little resolution, but you'll still see it, okay? It's the same thing with our Bible. There's 66 books. It, you pick any book, any one of them, and I can teach you from that one book, the gospel of Jesus Christ and the whole salvation plan. It's there. I can teach you the end times. I can teach you the life and death ministry of Jesus Christ, all from any one of those individual books. Find another book that can do that. Find another book that tells you the very day that certain things are going to happen. Look at Daniel chapter 4 when those nations rise up out. The, uh, the world. They're the, they're the kingdom nations that have, you know, they're, they're heavy hitters, right, in, in history. The fact that in there, the people say the United States is not in the Bible. You honestly think that God of the heavens and the earth, the creator of all things, like he don't know that, that America is going to be a, a, a formidable uh, player on the, on the grand scheme of history? We're in everybody's business, okay? We're trying to be the police of the world. And God just doesn't know that there's going to be a America. To hear these preachers, these pastors say, you, you know, America's not in the Bible. You're foolish. You are fools. How could he not know? <laughs> Come on. He told you it's birth. All of these nations come rising up. Okay. And out of the back of this lion, which is England, eagle's wings sprout up, and they're plucked off. That's the 1776 Fourth of July independence. But see, you got to look at it from the perspective. How else could, at that time, Daniel be, would be told to record what he's seeing? He's not going to see... You know, the 50 states and the, the Mayflower coming over and the pilgrimage. and all that. that's, not, that's not necessary. God's cutting right to the, the, the brass tacks. Just like he said when Daniel said, look, God, what does all this mean? It's not for you to know, Daniel. Shut up the book. The end time generation will know. And that's why it's easy for us to look back and see it now. But anything prior to 19, uh, 1948, May 14th, Everyone was looking through a glass darkly. They could not see anything as it really is. So the only signs that really mattered was there's going to be a world war. That's when you know you can start looking for a sign. What's the only sign that matters that starts the end times? Because Israel is the timepiece of all end time prophecy. If you don't know that, if you don't know Daniel 70 weeks, if you don't know that, you don't know anything about eschatology. You have no idea what's going on in prophecy, and you're believing conjectures and private interpretations, and the Bible says you can't do that. But when you do it rightly 
and correctly, everything is perfectly precise. And there's nothing to worry about in terms of, uh, let me second guess that. No, don't take what I'm saying as just enough. Look at it yourself. You have to get into the root languages. You're not going to fully appreciate the fact that you know, people say, oh, yeah, wars and rumors are wars. There's always been wars. That's not a sign. They're doing war all through the Old Testament. Jesus is coming. <laughs> he hadn't even been crucified yet. Come on. You think they, were, you think they would have saw uh, uh, the temple being destroyed? In the diaspora, all that stuff. You think you think that would have been viewed as a war, or rumors of war? Of course they would have. All that stuff would have happened. But that doesn't fit what Christ said. You're going to see all that stuff. Yeah, sure, yeah, sure. But the the end of the age is when nations shall rise against nation. That's a world war. We only had one and two of them. And guess what? There's a third one coming. And now we have weapons that are described in Ezekiel, uh, yeah, Ezekiel 38 and 39 that, by all definitions, meet and fit the criteria of a nuclear fallout. How can, how can Ezekiel describe a thermonuclear blast of an intercontinental ballistic missile in languages that were used at that time? Tell me. He can't. It's not there. So using the, the vernacular, the, 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 the lengths and, and reach of whatever language that was available to them at the time, God allowed him to see just enough. So we as the end time generation can recognize, oh, yeah, that's definitely fallout from a nuclear bomb. What do you think Iran meant when they said, unless Israel stops the occupation and destruction of Gaza, we will send it a great earthquake? See, they, they don't want to come out and say – they already have a nuclear bomb. They had a nuclear bomb for a long time. <laughs> They've had it for a long time. But they know as soon as they drop that, we're in it. And we're going to start sending things over there. And because of all that, it's going to be more exchanges. And that's why they're going to have animosity towards Israel. Now, I don't see this as scripture. I just see that this is the perfect excuse why everybody, every nation is going to turn against Israel. Because they're going to be the institution – or instigation, rather, of the, the, the third world war. I mean, they're, they're going to be like, you caused this. You caused this. Because the Bible says all nations are going to turn against Israel. And most of them right now already are. The fact that they're saying we're not going to do a ceasefire and we're going to occupy Gaza just like the West Bank. You think that's going to go well? Hezbollah? They're just chomping at the bit to get involved. I mean, they could, I didn't even watch the news or look at anything today. They could be in there doing stuff right now. I don't know. Like, there's no answer to what's already started right now. And it's not going to get smoothed out. Too much has happened. Elections in the United States are not going to get smoothed out. You're not voting your way out of any of this stuff. The only thing that's fixing this is Christ. And it ain't going to get better anytime soon. It's going to get a whole lot worse. And you're going to have two perspectives here. One, Oh, man, this is worthless. Why bother? Let me just crawl under a rock and die. Or you say, you know what? This is exciting because the Bible said all these things are going to happen. But he also said those who pray and look for my coming, you're out of here. That's escapism. What do you think Israel was going to be viewed viewing when uh, Moses was told, raise your staff and as long as your arms are raised up? The Red Sea will be parted, and they ran across dry ground. But when Pharaoh and his soldiers came in there, Moses dropped his arms, and they were drowned. Would you think that they would view that as escapism? Because I, I like to think they would. Do you think that uh, Enoch, if he was asked, hey, do you think you escaped the, the flood? <laughs> yeah, I think he would say he escaped it. So what do you think Jesus was talking about when he said, pray always that you're counted worthy to escape these things coming upon the earth? What things? Look at Revelation where it says, Jesus himself says, because you have done these things and you kept your faith and all those requirements that he places on us as a believer, I'm going to spare you 
that hour of the temptation and trial that's going to come upon the entire world. See, you, you won't appreciate it unless you look at everything, all, all, all these different references. The people that say, oh, like the lady I said on uh, YouTube that I like watching, that she's a homesteader. And I, I absolutely adore her. She's a little spunky, but uh, her voice and her youthful face right now, not that she's young, because she's, 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 well, she's just a little bit younger than me, but uh, her voice sounds exactly like my grandmother, and I find a great deal of comfort listening to her. She could talk about anything, and I would listen to her, because she makes me go back in time to, to feel like I was when I was a child, because my grandparents raised me, and I, I, I miss my grandparents. And she makes a comment sometimes. Oh, well, you know, some of you Christians out there think, you know, we're just going to fly away. No. Some of us are. <laughs> some of us are going to go up just like uh, Christ descended. Yes, I absolutely believe that. And for some of you that have a high regard for me and you think, wow, you know, this guy's really smart about the markets. I absolutely believe that my body will leave in an instant like that and be transformed and have an immortal body. I absolutely believe that. And if you have a problem with that, have a problem with it. I don't care. That's what I believe. I'm not trying to convince you. But when I'm talking to somebody that's listening to me now, that you're a believer, maybe you had the arguments uh, placed in, in front of you that there is a rapture, there isn't a rapture. It's post-trib, pre-trib, mid-trib. You can rest assured that it's pre-trib because nothing else fits it. And you're listening to people that barely even know any scripture at all they don't know how to take anything you know, from the original languages. Like the idea of, whole, of the, um, the nations rising against nation. That's the beginning of the end of the era or the end of the age. The, everything prior to that statement, that's not a sign. But when you go and you listen to Bible preachers and teachers, they say, oh, what's the signs? Wars and rumors are wars. Okay. That's always been a thing. But when was there a world war? Oh. When did Israel become a nation? Oh, and now when you see that happen, the signs that he talks about, pestilence, disease, sexual immorality, ooh, they will go rampant. What else? Earthquakes. Oh, wow. We've always had earthquakes, but have they been increasing in intensity and frequency after Israel became a nation? Don't take my word for it. Google it. Venereal disease, all manner of disease, rampant, straight up, vertical. That's an equity curve you want to have, but not for that type of thing. Earthquakes, same thing. Sexual immorality, divorces, through the roof. Prior to that, nope. What changed? Israel became a nation. That's God's timepiece. So, Jesus made it very plain. You're going to know if the Bible's real or not. Because now Israel's a nation. Anyone that claimed that Jesus is coming back real soon, real soon, prior to 1948, they had to wait. The sign hasn't happened yet. The fig tree is Israel. And when May 14th, 1948, which was prophesied by Ezekiel to the very day in the very year that's prophesied in multiple places in the Old Testament. That's defying all logic. You can't escape it. It's absolutely precise. It's precision beyond all measure. The margin for error was zero. Imagine if Gabriel told Daniel, listen, from the decree that was given by Artaxerxes, to rebuild the city of Jerusalem. When that was given, count out this number of days. And I don't want you to just listen to me. I, I want you to be inspired enough to listen to the very short scholarly approaches to explaining Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, 26, and 27. And then Ezekiel, where he, he lays on one side and he lays on the other side. Okay, um, I, 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 For the life of me, I can't remember the... The, ver, uh, the, the chapter. I want to say Ezekiel 25, and then some, sometimes I want to say 26, and sometimes I want to say 27, and it's because I think I'm getting the, the ninth chapter of 
Daniel in the verses 25, 26, and 27, which I know is absolutely the 70 weeks of um, Daniel prophecy. I, I get that inner mixed up sometimes. And like I said, I don't have the notes in front of me, and I'm probably not doing the, the best way of doing it by talking like this. But since this is my last Twitter space, i got to get it off my chest. I have to get it off my chest. Otherwise, your blood's on my hand, and I don't want that. So because you're listening to me, you have no excuse now. I warned you. <laughs> I warned you before I started talking, so now you have no excuse. So when you understand that that sign of Israel becoming a nation, that begins God's timepiece. It's like a stopwatch. He clicks it. So now we, we're underneath that time, meaning what? Well, Jesus said, when you see this sign, what sign? When Israel becomes a nation, whoever in that generation sees it, that generation, not everybody that's alive, that generation will see all things come to pass. What does that mean? Everything. You're going to see the rapture. You're going to see the tribulation, and you're going to see my second coming. That's what he said. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. Now, the question is, when that generation is alive and existing at that time and sees Israel become a nation again, it shall not pass away until all things be fulfilled. Well, how long is a generation? When I was 14, I was telling my friend Sean, I said, you know, you have no idea how many times I've been asking myself if I really should ask my friend Sean just to, to sit with me and, and, and describe some of the things that we did as a kid and some of the things I was talking about and how it's amazing how it's happening. Like it's crazy. Like it's literally crazy. But I said to him, I said, you know, if Jesus said that, let's just say this generation is uh, 70, maybe 80 years, okay? That means as early as 2018 to 2020-ish something, you know, we're going to see the world go upside down. At 14 years old, I told my friend Sean that, based on the prophecies, based on what, what Jesus said about Israel becoming a nation, that's the, that's, the, that's the real sign. That's the sign that starts the clock. Okay. Prior to that, all Bible prophecy is a guess. But now we're in it. We're in the end of the era of, of the age of human rule, and we're seeing this fast deterioration. Okay, and in Revelation it says when you start seeing these signs, and the when Jesus says this, it's, the the Greek term is like where we get the original word for tachometer. Okay, when you see them happen, yes, but when they start to rev up real quick in frequency and intensity, that's where we get the the Greek word like where we get odometer. Um, do you feel like things are increasing in intensity since the middle of uh, Trump's term in office? And uh, let me remind you, I have never voted ever for any election. I did not vote for Trump. I would not vote for Trump right now. I would not have voted for Trump back then. I'm not a Trumper. I believe it's all bullshit. It's corrupt. Okay, I want you to understand that. I understand what I just said, and I mean it wholeheartedly. It's trash. It's fecal matter. Okay. None of this stuff that we're seeing in leadership should be allowed. But yet it is. I am not a voter. I don't vote. I don't care what you're going to vote because it ain't going to matter. Okay. It's not going to matter. But do you see an intensity in things occurring in, for, in, in a a frequency of intensity that is not improving. Do you see things improving quickly or do you see things getting worse quicker? Intensity, I see it. And I'm an optimistic person generally. I don't see things improving quickly. I see a fast paced revving up like an odometer. Things are just quickly going off the rails and nothing is improving. Elections are in question. We have all the wrong leaders. There's no answer. We'll send 40, 50, 60 battleships or the equivalent to go over there and guard Israel's border. And I'm not knocking Israel, okay? I'm just saying, think about this. What's the logic behind that? 
you tell the vice president to go down there and handle the southern border. She ain't never went down there. But we're going to guard somebody else's border. We're going to go over there and send billions of your taxpayer and my taxpayer's money to give to this Ukrainian weirdo dancing around, buying Lamborghinis for his wife with our money, protecting his border. But we're letting whatever and whoever in our own country here. Where's the where's the logic and outcry in that? Did we just sit back and say, well, yes, that makes sense to go over there and, and I side with Ukraine. I side with Israel. I side with Gaza. It's all a mess. And right here at home in America, we're deteriorating quick, real fast. Real fast. And they're constantly polarizing us. Your team Israel. Your team Gaza. You're black. You're white. You're a racist. You're a Trumper. Everything's about division. You don't see that? <laughs> God is not the author of confusion. But the God of this world is. And he knows his time is short. They're rushing really, really fast to get to 2030. Everything needs to be in place by 2030. Why? Why seven years from now? Why seven years from now they have to have everything in place? That's an urgency that's never been noticed before. And look how fast all these countries and these world leaders are working together to get it done. They can send billions of dollars over there to make sure businesses in Ukraine stay running, but they shut our businesses down in America. So those companies that they shut down, all that coronavirus crap, are they going to get restitution? No. And you don't see a problem in that? Folks, you watch that box on your television and you believe everything that comes out of it. And it tells you what to think and how to think, who to believe and what not to believe. And they give you the WWE version of elections where you have the face and the heel. And they're both on the payroll of Vince McMahon. They're doing what he says they're going to do. The outcome is predetermined. And the whole time, they're getting to see who believes what. Did you recently move to Texas or to Florida? Because I was contemplating it. And I changed my mind. Because I honestly believe when they let bombs drop in America, those are the two states that are going to hit heaviest. Why? Because they let everybody show their cards. Who is going to be on board with what we're doing? Well, you know Texas, right? <laughs> they do things differently in Texas, right? Well, Florida is something of a different breed as well. But they both have the same view. They're not going to try to subscribe to what they want to do. But they're moving people from California and New York down there, too. And the whole idea is they want to turn those states blue. Because they're red states right now. But they also learned in 2020, hmm, they can color on whatever color they want, and no one's going to do anything about it because they do what they want to do. They make the numbers up as they go. 80 million people voted for a guy that couldn't get anybody to show up to any one of his rallies. Really? <laughs> Obama's been running this whole show, and you guys have no idea. They've literally caught several people mentioning how they were conferring with President Obama, I mean Biden, after he won the election, if you want to believe that. <laughs> Who were they rallying around in the reception? Obama. Biden's walking around in the corner, had no idea. Nobody was talking to him. He's a puppet. <laughs> Other world nations, uh, they know it too. And you, you think, oh, they're just jerks. They're being mean to our president. No. They see it for what it is. But you've been lied to for so long. You believe it. You drank the Kool-Aid. You, you see it, and you think this is the way it is. It's, it's, it's got to be true because it was on TV. 
Obama himself said he wouldn't mind running the presidency if somebody else is up there and he had a, a microphone in their ear and, okay, do this, do that. And it's just recently been revealed that he, for the last five or six months, have been, what, counseling Biden on what to do with this and that. They're slowly leaking it out there. That's the way God works. He has to, all things done in secret must be revealed. That's the way it works. That's why they have to tell you before they do it. Why? Because it's written. It's foretold. That way you know he's running the show. Who's he? The Lord. Remember, he sets up kings and puts down kings. He makes nations rise and he puts down kingdoms. He's in control. He's in control of everything. Until the church is removed, which is that which hinders. See, the bride of Christ can't be in the tribulation because it's going to be abused. It's going to be beaten. If you were going to marry your spouse, okay, tell me the, tell me the logic in this. Here we're, we're told to make ourselves presentable, keep our garments clean, and always be ready. Okay, wonderful. I, I got that. Now, that's our obligation. The groom, Christ, his obligation is to protect and take us to be where he is. And where, we, where he is, no one can touch us. Okay. So what type of model does it meet for if Jesus is the bridegroom, and then the church is the bride, and God says, I love you, I want to marry you, but I'm going to let the devil beat the living daylights out of you for seven years, and then you're worthy to be married. Would you want that of your spouse? No. It doesn't fit the model. But there's teachers and preachers and churches that say the church is going to go through the tribulation. No. Part the backslidden, the ones that are lukewarm. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth, the Lord says in Revelation. Really? That's offensive. He wants somebody that's on fire for him. doesn't care who looks down and, oh, you, you believe what about Jesus? You think he's the son of God? You believe he's God in the flesh? You believe he died on the cross and he resurrected himself? Absolutely. And I believe he is the father in the flesh. The father didn't send someone else. He came himself. He did. He created a body, Hebrew says. The body, it was created, born of a woman, under the law. That body was created, just like he created what? Adam's body. And then what did he do? He breathed his own spirit into him through his nostrils. And he became a living soul. He's teaching you right there the incarnation of his own Godhead. And you never saw it, but it's right there. He fashioned and formed out of what? The dirt. The dirt. What are we made of? Every composition and element it's in, in dirt is in our flesh. And when we die, from dust to dust, we'll return. Well, he made a, he made a body. And Christ is referred to what? The second Adam. He's trying to take your attention back to the creation of Adam. He created that body out of what? Dirt. Same thing he did with Mary's womb. He himself, God Almighty. <laughs> Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. placed himself in that body. He didn't send his little boy up in heaven. He himself came. And when you realize that, when you understand really the Godhead, there is no trinity. Okay, There is no three persons up there. There's one throne in heaven and one person sitting on it right now. Guess what his name is? Jesus Christ. There's no... One big throne for daddy and a little throne for Jesus. Nope. One throne. 
It's always been one throne. And Isaiah, I love it. He literally makes a waste of anybody that thinks of as a plurality in God. I'm looking around. I'm looking around for another God to swear by, and there ain't none of them up here. And there's none higher than me. So I guess I'll swear by my own name. That's God doing a wrestling shoot promo about himself. Bragging on himself. The only one that has the right to brag on himself. The only God. The only God. There is no other God. He is the Alpha and the Omega. The beginning and the end. There is none else but him. Christ Jesus. That's it. And unless your faith is in him, you're going to hell. Not because I'm saying it, because he said it. Don't take it out with me. Don't shoot the messenger, Jack. It's his rules. He said it. And it's so easy to avoid that. It's so easy to avoid it. But a fool says in his heart, there is no God. And a greater fool says Jesus wasn't him. What other book out there told you exactly to the day these events would happen? That Israel, think about it. Think, of, think, folks. Think. Israel doesn't even, I, doesn't even recognize Jesus. They don't recognize him as the Messiah. So why, why would they let these scriptures in their Old Testament be preserved all through this time and still they can't see him because he spiritually blinded them? The day he rode on the donkey. Read it. Read it, folks. It's right there. He spiritually blinded them. That's why it's a miracle for a Jew to see Jesus as their Messiah. It's beautiful to see them weep. It's beautiful that they finally come to the, the understanding of who Christ is. The great I am. The voice from the burning bush that spoke to Moses. It sends chills down me. How can anybody wrestle with this and see that he's not God Almighty? He calls the end from the beginning. Every one of these. Israel denied Christ. They can't see him. And yet they're doing the very things he said they're going to be doing. <laughs> Who's in control? The very nations around Israel. They think they're doing whatever they want to do. They're doing exactly what Christ said they're going to do. He's the master of ceremonies. He's in control. You can live your life through this whole mess and say, well, you know, this is terrible. It's scary. And now as a younger man before I found Christ, right now I would be terrified, gripped with fear. I would be gripped with fear right now. I'm excited because I know in whom I believe. And I know that he has all this stuff locked up. And if he's been this precise about everything else, what do I got to worry about? Really, what do I have to worry about? If something happens to me and I die, so what? Instant death, instant glory. I got exactly what I wanted. I don't want to be with him. Whatever amount of pain I have in this world is nothing compared to eternity with him. That's peace of mind. By all intents and purposes, I technically died March 9th, 2009. I was here one minute, and next I wasn't. 50 mile an hour over the handlebars of a motorcycle. Whew. How I went through steel cable, supporting two, uh, two sides of a telephone pole, a 5x7 steel plate. Sign saying Eastern Avenue exit. Flew 80 feet in the air, landed directly on my head. Crushed my spine. My chin hit my sternum. Crushed every one of my molars in my mouth. Broke two ribs. Tore me all up. I could have been cut in half, decapitated with the steel wires, but I found my way through them. 
I could have hit the steel plate and been instantly killed. I could have hit the telephone pole, instantly killed. And yet I still flew 80 feet in the air like Superman, piked on my head, instantly motionless. And people saw this. And from their perspective, they thought I was dead. And here I am talking to you. My back's a mess, folks. It is a mess. And I believe God keeps it that way because every year in spring, I want to buy another motorcycle. After promising, I wouldn't do it. But I see, I miss doing it. But the sin in me, the sinner, wants to do that which I know I shouldn't do. And he keeps that pain in me so I don't do it because he knows I will if I didn't. And I might not be spared the next time if I was allowing for it. Even after my son had that happen, I look at motorcycles sometimes and I think to myself, I miss those days and I shouldn't feel that way. And I'm, I shouldn't be surprised that my back has the worst episodes of spasms and pain and compression injury, you know, pain going through me right after I start thinking about it. That's him reminding me, don't be stupid. Because I got the money and the time to go down to the Holly Davidson store, buy one just like that. Cruising around until something else happens. So we don't learn our lessons from the good times. For you atheists or people that have a problem with God, why does God allow suffering? We don't understand how to listen to him otherwise. I'm bragging on him right here, and I'm telling you, I'm a sinner. And I promised him I was never going to get on a motorcycle. But every spring and every time I see a really nice one ride by, I miss being on one. And I entertain it in my head, doing it. And then all of a sudden, my back has really bad episodes. You don't see there's a correlation there? <laughs> I see it. But I'm being honest. I'm telling you, this is, this is what I wrestle with. Like Paul, you, you know, I do things I know I shouldn't do, but yet I do them. I die daily. He crucifies his flesh every day. And that's an apostle. Just because you believe in Christ doesn't make you holier than thou. What do you think Paul was doing when he says, I die daily. I do the things I know I shouldn't do. You think he might have slipped up sometimes and said a bad word? I think, I think so. I think so. It could be other things. I mean, he was the chief persecutor of the church. He was watching Christians be murdered, martyred. And God gave him the authority and responsibility to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He had special revelation given to him about something that was in the Old Testament that you can see. There's a passage where it talks about, and I meant to say earlier, I got off topic. Um, one of the ladies I like listening to, she's a Christian, but she believes that they're going to have to, we, we as Christians, she believes, I don't believe this, but she believes that we have to go through tribulation. And uh, she goes, oh, you, you believe that you're just going to fly away. Well, the scripture talks about how, you know, we will fly away. <laughs> so, I mean, the, the very terms that they try to make a ridicule of the rapture, God uses those terms. It's almost like he knew they were going to talk about that kind of stuff. You know, there will be mockers in those days. You know, what's the sign of this coming? Oh, even our father said that you know, the, the return of God was going to happen, blah, 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 blah. Right. But until Israel becomes a nation, it doesn't matter. Because the, the stopwatch doesn't start until that happens. And that happens May 14th, 1948, which was given by Daniel to the very day perfectly with a margin of error of zero, and it happened. And I showed you a very supernatural proof that the genealogy from the first man to Abram, the father of the nations, 1948. That's not random. Genesis chapter 5 tells you the gospel in the names of the first 10 human beings in existence. Come on. No other book does that. I'm sorry, folks. I'm sorry. But there ain't one book in the world that can call the future like that, to that degree of precision. And there's other subtle things where, you know, these flat earthers out there, 
<laughs> there, listen, no. <laughs> we are on a globe, a sphere, okay? And I know I'm going to get a lot of people mad right now, but I don't care. We are on a sphere, okay? And if you know anything about math, you know, <laughs> when you learned higher math, what, what did you encounter? Measurements of curvatures, right? And when you, when you really look at flat earthers and you, and you really take a step back and say, okay, they must have missed math. <laughs> they, they stopped at rudimentary math. We are on a sphere, okay? And uh, so many things about – well, uh, George Washington, he died. You know how he died? He had a cold. And they were doing leeching and, and, and bloodletting, which means they would cut the, the body to, to bleed out because they believed that if they bleed out enough blood, the bad infections would be escaping the body. Okay. Well, the Bible says life is in the blood. And if they would have believed what they said they believed then, they would have never done that, and he would have died. Life is in the blood. When I was a big meat eater, um, I had to have my steak cooked well done. I, it couldn't have any red to it. couldn't be mooing still. And I watched my daughter and my best friend's wife literally eat what some very well-schooled veterinarians could get back in the field eating grass in a short order. A steak that's that well, not well, but uh, so rare. I, I can't, I can't imagine eating something like that. But our Bible teaches us so many things about science that science confirms later on. But doesn't like to say that yeah, it's confirmed in the Bible. It used to be science was used to confirm the Word of God, but then it slowly transformed into we're going to try to see if science can refute the Bible, and it, it fails. Every single time it's ever tried, it's failed. And I want you to think about where we are right now. Take, a, take inventory. I'm going to say this and close it because I'm very, very hungry now. And it's 3 o'clock, so I think I've given you enough, right? Six hours. <laughs> the, uh, I'm not even tired. I'm just hungry. If, if I had... Uh, Something more than five drinks of this cold uh, cocoa that used to be hot at nine o'clock, I probably would be going further. But um, I want you to take a look at the state of the world right now, okay? And a year ago, during the, the Twitter spaces, I, I, I told the Muslims that were listening, I said, you're going to have problems too. Like, it's, it's coming. And do you think that's happening? Because the, the third war, okay, um, is scripted, both biblical and these globalists. Albert Pike, which is a 33-degree mason, had uh, three letters. And there's some people that say, oh, well, it's, it's fake. It's, you know, it's not real. Okay, they're going to tell you that because they don't want you to see it. But it's real. Um, I want you to – you can probably still Google it, and if you can't find it on Google, do uh, use DuckDuckGo as your, as your browser, and you'll be able to find a lot of things that, that Google won't let you find. But um, Albert Pike has these three letters that outline the First World War and the participants and the purpose, and the Second World War, the participants and the purpose, and the third one, which will be Jew and Muslim and Christian. Basically, all, all like a war of faiths. Okay, well, if you understand the Book of Revelation, um, that's essentially what it's saying. It's saying the same thing, and Genesis tells you that that's where we're going to be doing it there too. It's the story between Isaac and Ishmael, Jacob and Esau. It's the same thing that happened in Genesis. It's the same thing that's going on right now. They're arguing and fighting over their birthright. That's what this is all about, and no world leader is fixing it. One will step up when this intensifies even more, and it's going to get worse. It's not going to smooth out. 
Israel's doing exactly what they're supposed to do, which is stay in Gaza, just like they did in the West Bank. And that's going to infuriate all the other surrounding Arab nations. Hezbollah's going to come in and start doing more. Iran's going to do what they say they're going to do in 38 and 39. That great earthquake, which clearly, clearly, what's a great earthquake, folks? Come on, you know what that means. They're going to send a bomb, right? Okay, well, <laughs> it's reasonable to expect that because Israel's sending in, what, bombs into Gaza. And Hamas is sending, what, bombs into Israel. So they're exchanging. So when Iran speaks up and says, unless Israel stops the occupation in Gaza, we are going to send Israel a great earthquake. Not just a, we're, we're not going to shake the earth. We're going to send it a great earthquake. Well, that sounds like a really big bomb to me. And then when you read Ezekiel 38 and 39, that's what's being communicated there. And I'm not the only one that sees that. It's, it's long been considered that that's what it's describing, the equivalent of, of a modern-day tactical nuke. And I think that... Um, we're setting the stage for so many potential false flags in America and so many people and so many nations to blame as the reasons for having it happen to us that the stage is set, folks. Like, you're not voting your way out of this. It's, we're not going to avoid it. It's going to happen. They need it to happen. Because everybody knows that the corona stuff was garbage. It was fake. Okay, It was instituted. It started and created for a very express purpose. And here it is. It's the unraveling. They call it the Great Reset. But everything was fine. Everything was fine. You may not have liked who was in office, but our economy was going well. Our relationships with other countries was, was fine. But what happened? They have to tear it down to bring in what they want to do by 2030. And these people you don't want to be friends with. You don't want to be part of their club because if you don't listen to them, they make up stuff about you. They say you did things you didn't do. They say you're a terrorist. They say you are um, ungodly things. And with AI, they can make it look like you did any of it. And the people that are shown to be doing things that are not savory things, they go unpunished. Wrong is called right. And right is called wrong. Everything is upside down. You can't see that. You can't see it. Take party out of it, okay? It's not Democrat. It's not Republican. It's not left. It's not right. Do you not see turmoil everywhere? Because that's exactly what I see. I see people rising up against each other. I see hate. I see division. No one cares about anybody else anymore. It's all about money. They love themselves. And it's just, it's ugly here now. Not just in America, on this planet, it's ugly. And it's going to get a whole lot worse. And when I told you last year to get your house ready, I meant it, I mean it even more now. Trading, that was just a way to get your attention. This is what I wanted to get you ready for. You have to know what's coming. You have to know that there's an escape. You don't have to be here for all this. But if you believe what your fathers believed, your mothers believed, whether it's a belief in something or not, a belief of anything. What do you have to lose if you do place your faith in him? You don't have to broadcast it to everyone. You ain't got to say, oh, yeah, I did this. You don't, you don't need to do that. You quietly, just like they did in the book of Acts, 
They believed in Jesus. They also knew that people didn't like them, believe in them, and they hid themselves. Do you, did you hear Jesus ever tell them, why are you hiding? You should be out there broadcasting me. He knew it was important for them to survive. All these people that teach the Bible, that shouldn't be teaching the Bible, they've led so many people astray. Made it about image. Made it about being part of a, a mega church. Like that's something to be proud of. That's not even biblical. Look at that guy, Joel Osteen. T.D. Jakes. I'm trying to think of the other dude's name. Kenneth Copeland. Um, Jesse DePlantis. Ugh, that's much one for you. You ever seen him? That... That right there, that's a person that is never getting to heaven. Brags about how much money he has, what he what he spent, and what he how many suits he has, what he paid for this and that. Brags about how his lady paid for his private jets. He has the biggest house in Georgia. That's every box that you're supposed to never check off if you're going to be a pastor. It's just, it's ungodly. And being on social media brings out the ungodliness of me because I am a sinner like every one of you listening to me. And I don't want to be around it anymore. It's toxic. I don't feel edified by being, you know, on it. Uh, me sharing things, I enjoy doing that. And it was, in, it was my intent to, and my purpose for drawing your attention to something so that way you can feel confident about what you learned, that it can be forecasted. But to, you know, social media is toxic, and it's going to get even worse. No matter what side you're on, you're going to constantly be, well, abused, trolled, not in this, this, the simple terms of trolling, but like, for your jugular type trolling. That's an ungodly person. That's an ungodly person that wants to do things like that. I'm not going to give time or room in my life for that. There's too many things going on right now to know that I know where we're at. And I have things to be, I need to be found working. I need to be found working. When he comes, I want to be seen as someone that didn't hide away my faith, was open and told you what really should be seen in all this stuff scripturally. I magnified him. I lifted his name up. And I'm not ashamed of it. I don't, I don't care how many of you that may be Muslim, Buddhist, atheist, have an issue with me because I believe in Christ. And I absolutely believe that there's no other God but him. That's not for me and you to wrestle out. You're in a position where you believe whatever you believe or don't believe whatever that you see as a religion. I'm not religious. I don't go to any church. I obviously believe in God. I obviously read the Bible. And I obviously have a genuine, sincere concern for you. Because I'm not making any money off of this. And I was only supposed to talk to you for an hour. I, truth be told, I, I kind of figured I'd probably go like 90 minutes. But it's been on my heart. Like I, I, all night long, I was thinking to myself, do I or don't I? Do I or don't I? But everything that you see in this world is a lie. They lie to you constantly. It's, I mean, you're being manipulated. You're, you're, you're taxed. So heavily, and they want more taxes. Like, <laughs> how can you fight the tax if you're on a central bank because of currency and they just take it from you? You can't. Canada, you know, well, we're, you know, we're going to help other people transition to the other world because you know, if they want to die, we're going to help them. What? 
you know, it used to be if you wanted to commit suicide, we want to commit you and try to help you nurse you through the situation that's caused your depression. Canada, mm-mm, it's just, well, we're going to help you. Why? Because they want a depopulation agenda fulfilled. There's too many of us. And if too many of us exist and we're not willing to listen to them, they don't like that. They don't like it when there are folks that say, no, I'm going to be a breaker. I'm going to be the person that says, not this far, not today. And they're doing things so openly, so brash, just unapologetically, just, you know, whatever. What are you going to do about it? Literally, what are you going to do about it? They literally threatened United States citizens. Well, what are you going to do? How are you going to fight against you know, uh, military jets? Uh, <laughs> I seem to remember over there in Afghanistan, um, the other side didn't have all that stuff, and you never beat them. But you left everything on the, on the playing field for them. That was what Obama's doing, by the way. And that's the weapons that are being used right now against us, eventually, and Israel. But you don't see it. Because the TV didn't tell you that. When you see it for really what it is, it makes perfect sense. When you don't have a party affiliation, when you're not either a Democrat or a Republican, because they're both the same thing. They're both the same thing. They're paid to pretend to represent you. And what changes have any of them brought that made it better for you and I? Nothing. But they got rich doing it. And why is it no one else can win the elections? These same people for the last 25, 30 years. <sighs> really? This is all these smart people that come up. Okay? When. For instance, you see these folks like uh, Mark Zuckerberg and the folks that were part of the, the beginning and the inception of Facebook. You know, I was marveling at them you know, years ago, and I told everybody when uh, Facebook was at twenty dollars, I said, "Buy it, don't let go of it." Why don't we ever see somebody like that? Now, obviously, I'm, I'm not trying to defend Zuckerberg because I think he's a snake. I, 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 <laughs> I know. Um, but you see these folks that come up like Elon Musk. Same thing. You know, these are very, very influential people. These are people that are movers and shakers, that thing, things get done with them. Why isn't that they never really run for president? Think about it. All these movers and shakers that really get things done, they're independent, they have their own businesses, their own empires, enterprises. They don't ever want to run for president. They're all from the same family, they're all from the same bloodline. You can't be a billionaire unless you're part of that bloodline. And if you find yourself real close to it, Somehow, your airplane doesn't arrive on time. Somehow, you just have a misplaced foot and you slip and you're no more. It's a big club, but you're not in it. See, when you're that rich, you can resist. And when you do a study on the Titanic, you'll see the reason why it really, really went down. Because there was somebody on there that didn't want to go along with the agenda 2030 of that day. See, you're told there was an iceberg. There was an iceberg that did this. Really? A whole lot more I could talk about. I don't want to bore you. But you got to take a step back and look at everything around you right now. Things are not improving. 
They're not going to be voted out. And they are telling you what they're going to do. These unelected globalists, I don't call them elitists because they're not elites. They're globalists, yes. They are absolutely Luciferian. They believe in a God, and they believe Lucifer's heat. And he allows them, he affords them authority, power, position. Because once they're in those positions, then these fallen angels and evil spirits take them over. That's what it means when we wrestle not with flesh and blood, but things that are outside our earthly domain that we can't like how are you going to wrestle an angel Jacob tried and he got his hip thrown out and that was merciful because one angel killed 187,000 of the Syrian army in one night how are you going to wrestle with that <laughs> you're not so we're in a spiritual war and it's wicked and we have to trust the word of God and he's already said he wins. And he's been right about everything else. So there's no reason not to, to, to believe him. There's no reason to doubt him. All the more reason to trust him. And that doesn't mean that you're going to have a perfect week next week or today or tomorrow. It just means that whatever happens... doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. An unanswered prayer doesn't mean God doesn't love you or doesn't exist. He's God. It's his prerogative to answer your prayer. And if he doesn't answer it, who are you to say he's wrong to do it or not do it? The person you're praying for? Right now, my, my mother-in-law is not doing well at all. And to be honest with you, she probably isn't going to be here much longer. She doesn't eat. She refuses to eat, and she's lost a lot of weight. And my wife is really wrestling with this. And the pain that she's feeling is too much for her. And she's told my wife, she's, that's it, I'm done. I mean, basically meaning that she's just, she's just, going through the process of letting go. I mean, if you stop eating, like that's pretty much it. Your body can only do that so much before it just turns off. And she hasn't eaten for a while. She can't really put down any fluids. Everything she puts down, she throws up. And she's in con you know, constant pain. She refuses to go to the hospital. She refuses to go to the doctors. And there we are. Now, Years ago, my wife would be angry at God right now. Why won't God heal her? Why won't God heal her? But she walked my life with me, with my oldest son, Cody, where I prayed every single day that he would heal him. And there for a long time, it didn't look like God was healing him at all because he had to have surgeries multiple times a year because his throat would close up. And one night, if we went and had his first surgery done, he would have died in his sleep. And they would have attributed to probably sudden infant death syndrome or something to that effect. But he had a uh, birth defect where his throat would, it closes up. And close, you know, it, it, it grows closed. And they had to constantly keep going down there, shaving it and taking parts of his throat and esophagus away. And the crying up right at the opening of his lungs, eventually because of all the cuttings, it caused the growth to form there too. And that was the one that was troubling me. And I prayed, you know, all the time. And I went around asking other churches and people that believed in God to pray with me and pray for my son. And if I was honest, I was thinking to myself, you know, maybe it's the fact that my son was born of an adulterous relationship. You know, I, I kind of felt like David at that time where, you know, the baby was sick and he prayed and prayed and prayed. And I was just like that. That was my moment of living that, that thing in the, in the Bible. Now, that's why I think God allowed all these things in the Bible. 
Why is there all these storylines? Why couldn't God just do one thing, say it, and this is the way it's going to be? Because in this, in this life, we're going to have times where we're going to have moments like David, like I had, where I prayed for my, my child to be healed. And at one point, I came to the conclusion, I was like, you know what, Lord, if it's because he's of an adulterous relationship, whatever you do, it's, it's your God. And I stopped praying to have it only my way. And I said, if you want to take him home, he's yours anyway. That year was his last surgery. What changed? I was holding on to something I thought was mine that's his. He's a lot stronger than me. But he was patient with me. And when I finally saw it as I should have seen it, then he healed him. But all of us are gods. Not all of us are gods, that we are gods. All of us belong to God. Because he allowed us to be created. He formed and fashioned us in our mother's wombs. Every, every hair on our head's numbered, and he knows every single one of them. When one falls out, he knows which one it was. My wife saw how God dealt with me and my son. He, and she understands that my mother-in-law believes in God. And my wife is at peace with the idea that should she go, then it's God calling her home. And she has no right to be upset about that. She's upset that my mother-in-law is giving up, basically. But if a person says they no longer want to fight, there's nothing you can do. It's their life. And if they want to allow it to end, who are we to say so? We can't make her eat. So I'm thankful to God that my wife has a different perspective about things because I can very, very easily see how this could have caused a lot of contention in our marriage because if her, if her mother does pass away, she's going to be upset. But if she didn't have the understanding about God now that she has, we probably would be in a lot of trouble, maritally speaking, because she, she would lash out. Like I watched her when she was younger with her aunt and when we lost our child in miscarriage. Like she was angry at God, and she said things that I can't repeat here. But she doesn't think that way anymore. So the point is, is there, I know one of my students tweeted to me yesterday saying to pray for his mother, Lucy. And I have, and I ask all of you to pray for him as well. Pray for her, rather. Because they, he and a lot of you prayed for Cody. And I believe that because all of you lifted up my son's name in prayer to God, he, he, he honored that. And he healed him. Is he 100%? I think that he's a little bit more healing to go. But if he doesn't come past where he's at now, God's done more than that either of us deserve. You know, he shouldn't have been here at all. He should have passed away. But God placed a doctor, Dr. Kashina at the time. He was the highest rated uh, surgeon for pediatrics at John Hopkins at the time. Just so happened to be the father of my son Cody's mother's best friend. And she was visiting with him on a night that I usually would have had him. And he said, he doesn't sound right when he cries. Take, bring him into my office. And then we, we found out that his throat was like literally next to being closed. And then when you have, you know, something like that and a whole bunch of other things, you just know that God's finding a way to intervene. And for some of you listening that you know, maybe you have a lot of bad things happening in your life. 
and you hear things like this that other people like myself here are saying and maybe hear other people give testimony about how God graced and blessed them. And you can be you know, spiteful towards God and be hateful. You know, what, did, what did you get to have all that for? And i got to go through this and have lack. How about you step out in faith in that moment because that's exactly what people like myself, when I thought I was going to lose my son, you think that that was pleasurable? That wasn't a, a moment of high uh, faith for me. Like I, I, in my mind, I was thinking, if he lets him go, like I'm done. I don't want. I, I don't think I want to ever hear about God. He he knows your heart. But if you're not actively trying to seek him, why should he make himself a manifest to you? The Bible promises that, by the way. If you're if you earnestly seek him. Jesus said, I and my Father will manifest ourselves to you. Well, guess what that means? That's exactly what I leaned on when I asked God to show me. That you hear me. Not answer all my prayers. Just prove right now that you hear me. And you heard the story. That's supernatural. Whether you want to believe it or not, I don't care. If he never would have did anything else beyond that, and he has done many things. That would have been more than enough. For any of you, if it would have had that happen, nobody would be able to tell you that God isn't real and Christ is not him. He is absolutely God. I didn't pray to anybody else but Christ. And I got the answers. So... I got a lot of things shared you know, in recent months with y'all that were very personal. And I wanted to bring them you know, towards the end of my time with all of you. I, I knew some of them would have been sensitive topics, and I saw it. That's why I put some time between this one and the last one. If I have ever offended any of you that are listening, I ask for forgiveness. If I have ever made you feel in any way, shape, or form not appreciated, because I appreciate every single one of you, even the folks that come to me and, and don't believe me, the demand constantly, do this, do this, do this. I appreciate your skepticism. You were many times the, the sounding boards for me to provide more content. And some of you got wise to it and said, well, if I act like this, he'll teach more. <laughs> I saw it. But I want you to know that there's a lot of things that I did that were all performance to garner the attention of a crowd. And once I had the crowd, you got to see what I could do. And now you get to see what God has blessed me with. He's blessing my students with. So you can wrestle with whether there's a God or not and who is God. I'm going to tell you right now, Jesus Christ is the one that blesses me, and he's the one that's behind your success. So if you want to run around and say there ain't no God and you're not going to find success in your trading, there's your answer why. Because you're being cursed. How are you going to curse the person that gives the opportunity to be blessed and say, no, it doesn't come from him, when I'm telling you that's where it comes from? Like you got to see things that, well, even outside of trading, like how many times has somebody got to be right before you realize that I'm not special? I'm not, I'm not highly into, I'm not a mental giant. I'm the average common man come from a very, very modest upbringing. But God uses me in a manner that is undeserving. I didn't earn it. But I have to remind you who it is. And 
And I don't want any of you to lose sight of that. Because I'm sure in the future people are going to be writing books and stuff and things about what it is that I shared and did or will be doing. And I don't want anybody to lose sight of how I'm able to do it. Because that's important. It's important to me. And I would like to think if I know a little bit about God, I think it's important to him too, because he's a jealous God. If I sat out here and said, I did this all on my own and God didn't do this, <laughs> I wouldn't be able to tell you anything that worked out. That's absolutely what would happen. It would, I would fall on, on my face miserably. But you got to see something. And I prayed, I asked God, please let me be able to show this and have it transfer to other students. Not for my sake, because it's not for me. I'm reminding you as I close this, this is not about me. Because if it was about me, I would be right now maximizing all of your attention. All of the attention and the influence I have over all of you right now, I would be monetizing it to, to death. I want you to ask yourself, why am I not doing it right now? At the peak of my popularity, why am I not doing it? Because it's not, never been my motivation. It's never been my motivation. I don't want to be making videos for YouTube. I don't want to be, I'm not doing Twitter spaces, okay? I'm not, I'm not doing them. I'm not going to do them next year. I'm not going to do them any time after this one. This is the last one. And I'm trying to make sure I'm, I'm scratching every itch <laughs> before I close this one. Because I know once I do it, I'm done. I have contemplated uh, talking to you on SoundCloud. I, I don't want to do anything trade-related, to be honest with you. Like, I, I, I miss being able to talk to you. But I really love these conversations I'm having right now. And I don't care if the popularity is so small. I don't care if the viewership is so small and nobody really wants to you know, listen. If I have just one person listening, I would still talk like this. Because I'm honoring God. I'm, I'm, I'm bragging on the Lord. His word and how awesome he is. And how undeserving I am for him to even know me. Trading has taken up all of my adult life. And I'm very thankful for God having used it not only as a means to bless my own personal life, my family members, friends, people that I don't know that I've helped, and all of you as students. But I don't want the latter part of my life to be that. And I don't know how much time I have. And I feel things in my body that I've never felt before. And mortality is something that I think about now. I don't fear it. But I look at where I'm at in age and I think to myself, you know, I, I probably don't have 51 more years on the other side of where I'm at right now. So the likelihood of me having a whole lot more than what I have behind me in years you know, it's, it changes your perspective. And I want to do things that bring memories to my family that, that are wholesome. Uh, I want to be able to do things away from these markets that are vampires. And I've said this before. You know, if you, if you let them take it from you, time, energy, your attention, it will do it. And I was a miserable man making lots of money. I want you to know that. When am I happiest? When I'm teaching you. And I'm reminding you not to make the mistakes I made.
don't put your family second. And don't lie to yourself saying you're doing it for them because you're doing it for yourself, just like I was doing it for myself, but lying to myself and them saying it's for their benefit. I needed it. I was hurt. I came into this world by two people that did not want me. That leaves a big chip on your shoulder. My mother knows I'm a multimillionaire and I have been for a long, long time. And I've never heard her say, I'm proud of you. And I've never wept about my mother since I was 13. When I share with all of you and you show your appreciation, you have no idea how it feels. And that's what I'm going to miss. Not arrogance, not pride, not clout. It's the fact that I didn't get that from the people I love most. And you, by all intents and purposes, they were strangers to me, have given me more than my own parents did. And I want to thank you. I want to thank you for trusting me to listen to me long enough to learn how to do this. In an industry that's full of fraud, liars that say they can but can't. You could have just scrolled on by. You could have listened to the lies and said, no, I'm not going to bother. But you didn't. I appreciate that. For the folks that send me comments, there's a lot of them. I, I haven't tried to read all of them because they're very moving. And even though I haven't uh, liked them, doesn't mean I won't lead her. For some of you, you like to look at me as a father figure. I've tried to be your brother, your friend, your teacher. And I hope that what I've shared has helped you. I hope that you use it, that you're blessed by it. And you don't waste it. Don't make it about image. Not about pomp. Even though I'm not going to be here, I'm going to be praying for you every day. I pray for you guys when I go to sleep. I pray for you when I wake up. And I'm proud of all of you. I think I've said everything I wanted to say. It's been my honor and my privilege to be called your mentor. I'll talk to you next time. Be safe.